Chapter 19 Daniel Cooper was already aware of what the meeting in J.J. Reynolds' office that morning was about, for all the company's investigators had been sent a memo the day before regarding the Louise Bellamy burglary that had taken place a week earlier. Daniel Cooper loathed conferences. He was too impatient to sit around listening to stupid chatter. He arrived in J.J. Reynolds' office 45 minutes late, while Reynolds was in the middle of a speech. "'Nice of you to drop by,' J.J. Reynolds said sarcastically. There was no response. "'It's a waste of time,' Reynolds decided. Cooper did not understand sarcasm or anything else, as far as Reynolds was concerned. Except how to catch criminals. There, he had to admit, the man was a goddamn genius. Seated in the office were three of the agency's top investigators— David Swift, Robert Schiffer, and Jerry Davis. "'You've all read the report on the Bellamy burglary,' Reynolds said. "'But something new has been added. "'It turns out that Luis Bellamy is a cousin of the police commissioners. "'He's raising holy hell!' "'What are the police doing?' Davis asked. "'Hiding from the press. Can't blame them. "'The investigating officers acted like the Keystone Cops.' They actually talked to the burglar they caught in the house and let her get away. Then they should have a good description of her, Swift suggested. They have a good description of her nightgown, Reynolds retorted witheringly. They were so goddamn impressed with her figure that their brains melted. They didn't even know the call of her hair. She wore some kind of curler cap, and her face was covered with a mud pack. Their description is of a woman... Somewhere in her middle twenties, with a fantastic ass and tits. There's not one single clue. We have no information to go on. Nothing. Daniel Cooper spoke for the first time. Yes, we have. They all turned to look at him, with varying degrees of dislike. What are you talking about? Reynolds asked. I know who she is. When Cooper had read the memo the morning before... He had decided to take a look at the Bellamy house as a logical first step. To Daniel Cooper, logic was the orderliness of God's mind, the basic solution to every problem, and to apply logic, one always started at the beginning. Cooper drove out to the Bellamy estate in Long Island, took one look at it, and without getting out of his car, turned around and drove back to Manhattan. He had learned all he needed to know. The house was isolated, and there was no public transportation nearby, which meant that, the burglar could have reached the house only by car. He was explaining his reasoning to the men assembled in Reynolds' office. Since she probably would have been reluctant to use her own car, which could have been traced? The vehicle either had to be stolen or rented. I decided to try the rental agencies first. I assumed that she would have rented the car in Manhattan, where it would be easier for her to cover her trail. Jerry Davis was not impressed. You've got to be kidding, Cooper. There must be thousands of cars a day rented in Manhattan. Cooper ignored the interruption. All car rental operations are computerized. Relatively few cars are rented by women. I checked them all out. The lady in question went to budget rent a car at Pier 61 on West 23rd Street, rented a Chevy Caprice at 8 p.m., the night of the burglary, and returned it to the office at 2 a.m., "'How do you know it was a getaway car?' Reynolds asked skeptically. Cooper was getting bored with his stupid questions. I checked the elapsed mileage. It's 32 miles to Luis Bellamy's estate, and another 32 miles back. That checks exactly with the odometer on the Caprice. The car was rented in the name of Ellen Branch. A phony, David Swift surmised. Right. Her real name is Tracy Whitney. They were all staring at him. How the hell do you know that, Schiffer demanded. She gave a false name and address, but she had to sign a rental agreement. I took the original down to one police plaza and had them run it through for fingerprints. They matched the prints of Tracy Whitney. She served time at Southern Louisiana Penitentiary for Women, if you remember. I talked to her about a year ago about a stolen Renoir. I remember, Reynolds nodded. You said then that she was innocent. She was then. She's not innocent anymore. She pulled the Bellamy job. The little bastard had done it again, and he had made it seem so simple. Reynolds tried not to sound grudging. That's, uh, that's fine work, Cooper. Really fine work. Let's nail her. 
We'll have the police pick her up and... On what charge? Cooper asked mildly. Renting a car? The police can't identify her, and there's not a shred of evidence against her. What are we supposed to do? Schiffer asked. Let her walk away scot-free? This time, yes, Cooper said. But I know who she is now. She'll try something again, and when she does, I'll catch her. The meeting was finally over. Cooper desperately wanted a shower. He took out a little black book and wrote in it very carefully. Tracy Whitney. Chapter 20 It's time to begin my new life, Tracy decided. But what kind of life? I've gone from an innocent, naive victim to a... what? A thief, that's what. She thought of Joe Romano and Anthony Ersati and Perry Pope and Judge Lawrence. No, an avenger. That's what I've become. And an adventurous, perhaps. She had outwitted the police, two professional con artists, and a double-crossing jeweler. She thought of Ernestine and Amy and felt a pang. On an impulse, Tracy went to F.A.O. Schwartz and bought a puppet theater, complete with half a dozen characters, and had it mailed to Amy. The card read, Some new friends for you. Miss you. Love, Tracy. Next, she visited a furrier on Madison Avenue and bought a blue fox boa for Ernestine and mailed it with a money order for $200. The card simply read, Thanks, Ernie. Tracy. All my debts are paid now, Tracy thought. It was a good feeling. She was free to go anywhere she liked, do anything she pleased. She celebrated her independence by checking into a tower suite in the Helmsley Palace Hotel. From her 47th floor living room, she could look down at St. Patrick's Cathedral and see the George Washington Bridge in the distance. Only a few miles in another direction was the dreary place she had recently lived in. Never again, Tracy swore. She opened the bottle of champagne that the management had sent up and sat sipping it, watching the sunset over the skyscrapers of Manhattan. By the time the moon had risen, Tracy had made up her mind. She was going to London. She was ready for all the wonderful things life had to offer. I've paid my dues, Tracy thought. I deserve some happiness. She lay in bed and turned on the late television news. Two men were being interviewed. Boris Melnikov was a short, stocky Russian, dressed in an ill-fitting brown suit, and Pietra Negalesko was his opposite, tall and thin and elegant-looking. Tracy wondered what the two men could possibly have in common. "'Where is the chess match going to be held?' the news anchorman asked. "'At Sochi, on the beautiful Black Sea,' Melnikov replied." You are both international grandmasters, and this match has created quite a stir, gentlemen. In your previous matches, you have taken the title from each other, and your last one was a draw. Mr. Nikolesko, Mr. Melnikov, currently holds the title. Do you think you will be able to take it away from him again? Absolutely, the Romanian replied. He has no chance, the Russian retorted. Tracy knew nothing about chess but there was an arrogance about both men that she found distasteful. She pressed the remote control button and turned off the television set and went to sleep. Early the following morning, Tracy stopped at a travel agency and reserved a suite on the signal deck of the Queen Elizabeth II. She was so excited as a child about her first trip abroad and spent the next three days buying clothes and luggage. On the morning of the sailing, Tracy hired a limousine to drive her to the pier. When she arrived at Pier 90... Berth 3, at West 55th and 12th Avenue, where the QE2 was docked. It was crowded with photographers and television reporters, and for a moment, Tracy was panic-stricken. Then she realized they were interviewing the two men posturing at the foot of the gangplank, Melnikov and Negalesko, the international grandmasters. Tracy brushed past them, showed her passport to the ship's officer at the gangplank, and walked up onto the ship. On deck, a steward looked at Tracy's ticket and directed her to her stateroom. It was a lovely suite, with a private terrace. It had been ridiculously expensive, but Tracy decided it was going to be worth it. She unpacked and then wandered along the corridor. In almost every cabin, there were farewell parties going on, with laughter and champagne and conversation. She felt a sudden ache of loneliness. There was no one to see her off, no one for her to care about, no one who cared about her. That's not true, Tracy told herself. Big Bertha wants me. And she laughed aloud. She made her way up to the boat deck 
and had no idea of the admiring glances of the men and the envious stares of the women cast her way. Tracy heard the sound of a deep-throated boat whistle and calls of, All ashore who's going ashore! And she was filled with a sudden excitement. She was sailing into a completely unknown future. She felt the huge ship shudder as the tug started to pull it out of the harbor, and she stood among the passengers on the boat deck, watching the Statue of Liberty slide out of sight, and then she went exploring. The QE2 was a city, more than 900 feet long and 13 stories high. It had four restaurants, six bars, two ballrooms, two nightclubs, and a golden door spa at sea. There were scores of shops, four swimming pools, a gymnasium, a golf driving range, a jogging track. I may never want to leave this ship, Tracy marveled. She had reserved a table upstairs in the Princess Grill, which was smaller and more elegant than the main dining room. She barely had been seated when a familiar voice said, Well, hello there. She looked up and there stood Tom Bowers, the bogus FBI man. Oh, no, I don't deserve this, Tracy thought. What a pleasant surprise. Do you mind if I join you? Very much. He slid into the chair across from her and gave her an engaging smile. We might as well be friends, after all. We're both here for the same reason, aren't we? Tracy had no idea what he was talking about. Look, Mr. Bowers. Stevens, he said easily. Jeff Stevens. Whatever. Tracy started to rise. Wait. I'd like to explain about the last time we met. There's nothing to explain, Tracy assured him. An idiot child could have figured it out and did. I owe Conrad Morgan a favor. He grinned ruefully. I'm afraid he wasn't too happy with me. There was that same easy, boyish charm that had completely taken her in before. For God's sakes, Dennis, it isn't necessary to put cuffs on her. She's not going to run away. She said hostily, I'm not too happy with you either. What are you doing aboard this ship? Shouldn't you be on a riverboat? He laughed. <laughs> with Maximilian Pierpont on board, this is a riverboat. Who? He looked at her in surprise. Come on. You mean you really don't know? Know what? Max Pierpont is one of the richest men in the world. His hobby's forcing competitive companies out of business. He loves slow horses and fast women, and he owns a lot of both. He's the last of the big-time spenders. And you intend to relieve him of some of his excess wealth? Quite a lot of it, as a matter of fact. He was eyeing her speculatively. Do you know what you and I should do? I certainly do, Mr. Stevens. We should say goodbye and he sat there watching as Tracy got up and walked out of the dining room. She had dinner in her cabin. As she ate, she wondered what ill fate had placed Jeff Stevens in her path again. She wanted to forget the fear she had felt on the train when she thought she was under arrest. Well, I'm not going to let him spoil this trip. I'll simply ignore him. After dinner, Tracy went up on deck. It was a fantastic night with a magic canopy of stars sprayed against a velvet sky. She was standing at the rail in the moonlight, watching the soft phosphorescence of the waves and listening to the sounds of the night wind when he moved up beside her. You have no idea how beautiful you look standing there. Do you believe in shipboard romances? Definitely. What I don't believe in is you. She started to walk away. Wait! I have some news for you. I just found out Max Pierpoint isn't on board after all. He canceled at the last minute. Oh, what a shame. You wasted your fare. Not necessarily. He eyed her speculatively. How would you like to pick up a small fortune on this voyage? This man is unbelievable. Unless you have a submarine or a helicopter in your pocket, I don't think you'll get away with robbing anyone on this ship. Who said anything about robbing anyone? Have you ever heard of Boris Melnikov? Or Pietro Negolesco? What if I have? Melnikov and Negolesco are on the way to Russia for a championship match. If I can arrange for you to play the two of them, Jeff said earnestly, 
We can win a lot of money. It's a perfect setup. Tracy was looking at him incredulously. If you can arrange for me to play the two of them, that's your perfect setup? Uh-huh. How do you like it? I love it. There's just one tiny hitch. What's that? I don't play chess. He smiled benignly. No problem. I'll teach you. You're insane, Tracy said. If you want some advice, you'll find yourself a good psychiatrist. Good night. The following morning, Tracy literally bumped into Boris Melnikov. He was jogging on the boat deck, and as Tracy rounded a corner, he ran into her, knocking her off her feet. Watch where are you going, he growled, and he kept running. Tracy sat on the deck, looking after him. Of all the rude, she stood up and brushed herself off. A steward approached. Are you hurt, miss? I saw him. No, I'm fine. Thank you. Nobody was going to spoil this trip. When Tracy returned to her cabin, there were six messages to call Mr. Jeff Stevens. She ignored them. In the afternoon, she swam and read and had a massage, and by the time she went into the bar that evening to have a cocktail before dinner, she was feeling wonderful. Her euphoria was short-lived. Pietro Negalesco, the Romanian, was seated at the bar. When he saw Tracy, he stood up and said, May I buy you drink, beautiful lady? Tracy hesitated, then smiled. Why, yes, thank you. What would you like? A vodka and tonic, please. Negalesco gave the order to the barman and turned back to Tracy. And Pietro Negalesco. I know. Of course. Everyone knows me. I am the greatest chess player in the world. In my country, I am national hero. He leaned close to Tracy, put a hand on her knee, and said, I am also a great fuck. Tracy thought she had misunderstood him. What? I am a great fuck. Her first reaction was to throw her drink in his face, but she controlled herself. She had a better idea. Excuse me, she said. I have to meet a friend. She went to look for Jeff Stevens. She found him in the Princess Grill. But as Tracy started toward his table, she saw that he was dining with a lovely-looking blonde with a spectacular figure dressed in an evening gown that looked as if it had been painted on. I should have known better, Tracy thought. She turned and headed down the corridor. A moment later, Jeff was at her side. Tracy, did you want to see me? I don't want to take you away from your dinner. She's dessert, Jeff said lightly. What can I do for you? Were you serious about Melnikov and Negalesco? Absolutely. Why? I think they both need a lesson in manners. So do I. And we'll make money while we teach them. Good. What's your plan? You're going to beat them at chess. I'm serious. So am I. I told you. I don't play chess. I don't know a pawn from a king. I... Don't worry, Jeff promised her. A couple of lessons from me, and you'll slaughter them both. Both? Oh, didn't I tell you? You're going to play them simultaneously. Jeff was seated next to Boris Melnikov in the double-down piano bar. The woman is a fantastic chess player, Jeff confided to Melnikov. She's traveling incognito. The Russian grunted. Women know nothing about chess. They cannot think. This one does. She says she could beat you easily. Boris Melnikov laughed aloud. Nobody beats me, easily or not. She's willing to bet you $10,000 that she can play you and Pietra Negalesco at the same time and get a draw with at least one of you. Boris Melnikov choked on his drink. <coughs> what? That's, that's ridiculous. Play two of us at the same time. This, this female amateur. That's right. For $10,000 each. I should do a dress to teach the stupid idiot a lesson. If you win, the money will be deposited in any country you choose. A covetous expression flitted across the Russian's face. I've never even heard of this person. And to play the two of us, my God, she must be insane.
She has the twenty thousand dollars in cash. What nationality is she? American. Ah, that explains it. All rich Americans are crazy, especially their women. Jeff started to rise. Well, I guess she'll just have to play Pietro Negolesco alone. Negolesco's going to play her. Yeah, didn't I tell you? She wanted to play the two of you, but if you're afraid, afraid, Boris Melnikov, afraid. His voice was a roar. I will destroy her. When is this ridiculous match to take place? She thought perhaps Friday night, the last night out. Boris Melnikov was thinking hard. The best two out of three. No, only one game. For ten thousand dollars. That is correct. The Russian sighed. I do not have that much cash with me. No problem. Jeff assured him, "All Miss Whitney really wants is the glory of playing the great Boris Melnikov. If you lose, you give her a personally autographed picture. If you win, you get ten thousand dollars. Who holds the stakes?" There was a sharp note of suspicion in his voice. "The ship's purser." "Very well," Melnikov decided. "Friday night, we will start at ten o'clock promptly." She'll be so pleased," Jeff assured him. The following morning, Jeff was talking to Pietro Negolesco at the gymnasium, where the two men were working out. "She's an American," Pietro Negolesco said. "I should have known. All Americans are cuckoo. She's a great chess player." Pietro Negolesco made a gesture of contempt. "Great is not good enough. Best is what counts, and I am the best." That's why she's so eager to play against you. If you lose, you give her an autograph picture. If you win, you get ten thousand dollars in cash. Negolesco does not play amateurs. Deposit in any country you like. Out of the question. Well, then I guess she'll have to play only Boris Melnikov. What? Are you saying Melnikov has agreed to play against this woman? Of course, but she was hoping to play you both at once. I've never heard of anything so, so. Negolesco sputtered, at a loss for words. The arrogance! Who is she that she thinks she can defeat the two top chess masters in the world? She must have escaped from some lunatic asylum. She's a little erratic," Jeff confessed, "but her money is good, all cash. You said ten thousand dollars for defeating her. That's right. And Boris Melnikov gets the same amount if he defeats her. Pietro Negolesco grinned. Oh, he will defeat her, and so will I. Just between us. I wouldn't be a bit surprised. Who will hold the stakes? The ship's purser. Why should Melnikov be the only one to take money from this woman? Thought Pietro Negolesco. My friend, you have a deal. Where and when? Friday night, ten o'clock, the Queen's room. Pietro Negolesco smiled wolfishly. I will be there. You mean they agreed? Tracy cried. That's right. I'm going to be sick. I'll get you a cold towel. Jeff hurried into the bathroom of Tracy's suite, ran cold water on a towel, and brought it back to her. She was lying on the chaise longue. He placed the towel on her forehead. How does that feel? Terrible. I think I have a migraine. Have you ever had a migraine before? No. And you don't have one now. Listen to me, Tracy. It's perfectly natural to be nervous before something like this. She leapt up and flung down the towel. Something like this? There's never been anything like this. I'm playing two international master chess players with one chess lesson from you and two. Jeff corrected her. You have a natural talent for chess. 
My God, why did I ever let you talk me into this? Because we're going to make a lot of money. I don't want to make a lot of money, Tracy wailed. I want this boat to sink. Why couldn't this be the Titanic? Now just stay calm, Jeff said soothingly. It's going to be, it's going to be a disaster. Everyone on the ship is going to be watching. That's exactly the point, isn't it? Jeff beamed. Jeff had made all the arrangements with the ship's purser. He had given the purser the stakes to hold, twenty thousand dollars in traveler's checks, and asked him to set up two chess tables for Friday evening. The word spread rapidly throughout the ship, and passengers kept approaching Jeff to ask if the matches were actually going to take place. Absolutely, Jeff assured all who inquired. It's incredible. Poor Miss Whitney believes she can win. In fact, she's betting on it. I wonder, a passenger asked, if I might place a small bet. Certainly, as much money as you like. Miss Whitney is asking only ten to one odds. A million to one odds would have made more sense. From the moment the first bet was accepted, the floodgates opened. It seemed that everyone on board, including the engine room crew and the ship's officers, wanted to place bets on the game. The amounts varied from five dollars to five thousand dollars, and every single bet was on the Russian and the Romanian. The suspicious purser reported to the captain, "I've never seen anything like it, sir. It's a stampede. Nearly all the passengers have placed wagers. I must be holding two hundred thousand dollars in bets." The captain studied him thoughtfully. "You say Miss Whitney is going to play Melnikoff and Negolesko at the same time?" "Yes, captain." Have you verified the two men are really Pietro Negolesco and Boris Melnikoff? Oh, yes, of course, sir. There's no chance they would deliberately throw the chess game, is there? Not with their egos. I think they'd rather die first. And if they lost to this woman, that's probably exactly what would happen to them when they got home. The captain ran his fingers through his hair, a puzzled frown on his face. Do you know anything about Miss Whitney or this Mister Stevens? Not a thing, sir. As far as I can determine, they're traveling separately. The captain made his decision. It smells like some kind of con game, and ordinarily I would put a stop to it. However, I happen to be a bit of an expert myself, and if there was one thing I'd stake my life on, it's the fact that there is no way to cheat at chess. Let the match go on. He walked over to his desk and withdrew a black leather wallet. Put down fifty pounds for me, on the masters. By nine o'clock Friday evening, the Queen's room was packed with passengers from first class, those who sneaked in from second and third class, and the ship's officers and members of the crew who were off duty. At Jeff Stevens' request, two rooms had been set up for the tournament. One table was in the center of the Queen's room, and the other table was in the adjoining salon. Curtains had been drawn to separate the two rooms, so that the players aren't distracted by each other. Jeff explained, and we would like the spectators to remain in whichever room they choose. Velvet ropes had been placed around the two tables to keep the crowds back. The spectators were about to witness something they were sure they would never see again. They knew nothing about the beautiful young American woman except that it would be impossible for her or anyone else. To play the great Negolesko and Melnikoff simultaneously, and obtain a draw with either of them, Jeff introduced Tracy to the two grandmasters shortly before the game was to begin. Tracy looked like a Grecian painting in a muted green chiffon Galano's gown, which left one shoulder bare. Her eyes seemed tremendous in her pale face. Pietro Negolesko looked her over carefully. "Have you won all the national tournaments you have played in?" he asked. "Yes." Tracy replied truthfully. He shrugged. I have never heard of you. Boris Melnikoff was equally rude. You Americans do not know what to do with your money, he said. I wish to thank you in advance. My winnings will make my family very happy. Tracy's eyes were green jade. You haven't won yet, Mister Melnikoff. Melnikoff's laugh boomed out through the room. <laughs> oh, my dear lady, I don't know who you are, but I know who I am. I am the great Boris Melnikoff. It was ten o'clock. 
Jeff looked around and saw that both salons had filled up with spectators. It's time for the match to start. Tracy sat down across the table from Melnikoff and wondered for the hundredth time how she had gotten herself into this. There's nothing to it, Jeff had assured her. Trust me. And like a fool, she had trusted him. I must have been out of my mind, Tracy thought. She was playing the two greatest chess players in the world, and she knew nothing about the game except what Jeff had spent four hours teaching her. The big moment had arrived. Tracy felt her legs trembling. Melnikoff turned to the expectant crowd and grinned. He made a hissing noise at a steward. Bring me brandy, Napoleon. In order to be fair to everyone, Jeff had said to Melnikoff, I suggest that you play the white so that you go first. And in the game with Mr. Negolesco, Miss Whitney will play the white and she will go first. Both grandmasters agreed. While the audience stood hushed, Boris Melnikoff reached across the board and played the Queen's Gambit decline opening, moving his queen pawn two squares. I'm not simply going to beat this woman, I'm going to crush her. He glanced up at Tracy. She studied the board, nodded, and stood up, without moving a piece. A steward cleared the way through the crowd as Tracy walked into the second salon, where Pietro Negolesco was seated at a table waiting for her. There were at least a hundred people crowding the room as Tracy took her seat opposite Nicolesco. Ah, my little pigeon, have you defeated Boris yet? <laughs> oh. Pietro Nicolesco laughed uproariously at his joke. I'm working on it, Mr. Nicolesco, Tracy said quietly. She reached forward and moved her white queen's pawn two squares. Nicolesco looked up at her and grinned. He had arranged for a massage in one hour, but he planned to finish this game before then. He reached down and moved his black queen's pawn two squares. Tracy studied the board a moment, then rose. The steward escorted her back to Boris Melnikoff. Tracy sat down at the table and moved her black queen's pawn two squares. In the background, she saw Jeff's almost imperceptible nod of approval. Without hesitation, Boris Melnikoff moved his white queen's bishop pawn two squares. Two minutes later, at Negolesco's table, Tracy moved her white queen's bishop two squares. Negolesco played his king's pawn square. Tracy rose and returned to the room where Boris Melnikoff was waiting. Tracy played her king's pawn square. So, she is not a complete amateur, Melnikoff thought in his surprise. Let us see what she does with this. He played his queen's knight to queen's bishop three. Tracy watched his move, nodded, and returned to Negolesco, where she copied Melnikoff's move. Negolesco moved the queen's bishop pawn two squares, and Tracy went back to Melnikoff and repeated Negolesco's move. With growing astonishment, the two grandmasters realized they were up against a brilliant opponent. No matter how clever their moves, this amateur managed to counteract them. Because they were separated, Boris Melnikoff and Pietro Negolesco had no idea that, in effect, they were playing against each other. Every move that Melnikoff made with Tracy, Tracy repeated with Negolesco, and when Negolesco counted with a move, Tracy used the move against Melnikoff. By the time the Grandmasters entered the middle game, they were no longer smug. They were fighting for their reputations. They paced the floor while they contemplated moves and puffed furiously on cigarettes. Tracy appeared to be the only calm one. In the beginning, in order to end the game quickly, Melnikoff had tried a night's sacrifice to allow his white bishop to put pressure on the black king's side. Tracy had carried the move to Negolesco. Negolesco had examined the move carefully, then refuted the sacrifice by covering his exposed side. And when Negolesco had sacked a bishop to advance a rook to white seventh rank, Melnikoff had refuted it before the black rook could damage his pawn structure. There was no stopping Tracy. The game had been going on for four hours, and not one person in either audience had stirred. Every grandmaster carries in his head hundreds of games played by other grandmasters. It was as this particular match was going into the end game that both Melnikoff and Negolesco recognized the hallmark of the other. Da bitch, Melnikoff thought. She has studied with Negolesco. He has tutored her. And Negolesco thought, She is Melnikoff's protege. The bastard has taught her his game. The harder they fought Tracy, 
The more they came to realize there was simply no way they could beat her, the match was appearing drawish. In the sixth hour of play at 4 a.m., when the players had reached the end game, the pieces on each board had been reduced to three pawns, one rook, and a king. There was no way for either side to win. Melnikov studied the board for a long time, then took a deep, choked breath and said, I offer a draw. Over the hubbub, Tracy said, I accept. The crowd went wild. Tracy rose and made her way through the crowd into the next room. As she started to take her seat, Negalesco, in a strangled voice, said, Ari, offer a draw. And the uproar from the other room was repeated. The crowd could not believe what it had just witnessed. A woman had come out of nowhere to simultaneously stalemate the two greatest chess masters in the world. Jeff appeared at Tracy's side. Come on, he grinned. We both need a drink. When they left, Boris Melnikov and Pietra Negalesco were still slumped in their chairs, mindlessly staring at their boards. Tracy and Jeff sat at a table for two in the upper deck bar. <laughs> you were beautiful, Jeff laughed. Did you notice the look of Melnikov's face? I thought he was going to have a heart attack. I thought I was going to have a heart attack, Tracy said. How much did we win? About two hundred thousand dollars. We'll collect it from the purser in the morning when we dock at Southampton. I'll meet you for breakfast in the dining room. Fine. I think I'll turn in now. Let me walk you to your stateroom. I'm not ready to go to bed yet, Jeff. I'm too excited. You go ahead. You were a champion, Jeff told her. He leaned over and kissed her lightly on the cheek. Good night, Tracy. Good night, Jeff. She watched him leave. Go to sleep? Impossible. It had been one of the most fantastic nights of her life. The Russian and the Romanian had been so sure of themselves, so arrogant. Jeff had said, Trust me. And she had. She had no illusions about what he was. He was a con artist. He was bright and amusing and clever, easy to be with. But of course she could never be seriously interested in him. Jeff was on his way to his stateroom when he encountered one of the ship's officers. Good show, Mr. Stevens. The word about the match has already gone out over the wireless. I imagine the press will be meeting you both at Southampton. Are you Miss Whitney's manager? No, we're just shipboard acquaintances, Jeff said easily. But his mind was racing. If he and Tracy were linked together, it would look like a setup. There could even be an investigation. He decided to collect the money before any suspicions were aroused. Jeff wrote a note to Tracy. Have picked up money and will meet you for a celebration breakfast at the Savoy Hotel. You were magnificent, Jeff. He sealed it in an envelope and handed it to a steward. Please see that Miss Whitney gets this first thing in the morning. Yes, sir. Jeff headed for the purser's office. Sorry to bother you, Jeff apologized. But we'll be docking in a few hours, and I know how busy you're going to be, so I wonder whether you mind paying me off now. No trouble at all, the purser smiled. Your young lady is really wizard, isn't she? She certainly is. If you don't mind me asking, Mr. Stevens, where in the world did she learn to play chess like that? Jeff leaned close and confided. I heard she studied with Bobby Fisher. The purser took two large manila envelopes out of the safe. This is a lot of cash to carry around. Would you like me to give you a check for this amount? No, don't bother. The cash will be fine, Jeff assured him. I wonder if you could do me a favor. The mailboat comes out to meet the ship before it docks, doesn't it? Yes, sir. We're expecting it at 6 a.m. I'd appreciate if you could arrange for me to leave on the mailboat. My mother is seriously ill, and I'd like to get to her before it's... His voice dropped. Before it's too late. Oh, I'm dreadfully sorry, Mr. Stevens. Of course I can handle that for you. I'll make the arrangements with customs. At 6.15 a.m., Jeff Stevens, with the two envelopes carefully stashed away in his suitcase, climbed down the ship's ladder into the mailboat. He turned to take one last look at the outline of the huge ship towering above him. 
The passengers on the liner were sound asleep. Jeff would be on the dock long before the QE2 landed. It was a beautiful voyage, Jeff said to one of the crewmen on the mailboat. Yes, it was, wasn't it? A voice agreed. Jeff turned around. Tracy was seated on a coil of rope, her hair blowing softly around her face. Tracy, what are you doing here? What do you think I'm doing? He saw the expression on her face. Wait a minute. You didn't think I was going to run out on you. Why would I think that? Her tone was bitter. Tracy, I left a note for you. I was going to meet you at the Savoy and. Of course you were, she said cuttingly. You never give up, do you? He looked at her and there was nothing more for him to say. In Tracy's suite at the Savoy, she watched carefully as Jeff counted out the money. Your share comes to one hundred and one thousand dollars. Thank you. Her tone was icy. Jeff said, You know you're wrong about me, Tracy. I wish you'd give me a chance to explain. Will you have dinner with me tonight? She hesitated, then nodded. All right. Good. I'll pick you up at eight o'clock. When Jeff Stevens arrived at the hotel that evening and asked for Tracy, the room clerk said, I'm sorry, sir. Miss Whitney checked out early this afternoon. She left no forwarding address. Chapter 21 It was the handwritten invitation, Tracy decided later, that changed her life. After collecting her share of the money from Jeff Stevens, Tracy checked out of the Savoy and moved into 47 Park Street a quiet, semi-residential hotel with large, pleasant rooms and superb service. On her second day in London, the invitation was delivered to her suite by the hall porter. It was written in a fine, copper-plate handwriting. A mutual friend has suggested that it might be advantageous for us to become acquainted. Won't you join me for tea at the Ritz this afternoon at four o'clock? If you will forgive the cliché, I will be wearing a red carnation. It was signed Gunther Hartog. Tracy had never heard of him. Her first inclination was to ignore the note, but her curiosity got the better of her, and at 4.15 she was at the entrance of the elegant dining hall of the Ritz Hotel. She noticed him immediately. He was in his sixties, Tracy guessed. An interesting-looking man with a lean, intellectual face. His skin was smooth and clear, almost translucent. He was dressed in an expensively tailored gray suit and wore a red carnation in his lapel. As Tracy walked toward his table, he rose and bowed slightly. Thank you for accepting my invitation. He seated her with an old-fashioned gallantry that Tracy found attractive. He seemed to belong to another world. Tracy could not imagine what on earth he wanted with her. I came because I was curious, Tracy confessed. But are you sure you haven't confused me with some other Tracy Whitney? Gunther Hartog smiled. From what I have had... There's only one Tracy Whitney. What exactly have you heard? Shall we discuss that over tea? Tea consisted of finger sandwiches filled with chopped egg, salmon, cucumber, watercrust, and chicken. There were hot scones with clotted cream and jam and freshly made pastries, accompanied by Twining's tea. As they ate, they talked. Your note mentioned a mutual friend, Tracy began. Conrad Morgan. I do business with him from time to time. I did business with him once, Tracy thought grimly, and he tried to cheat me. He is a great admirer of yours, Gunther Hartog was saying. Tracy looked at her host more closely. He had the bearing of an aristocrat and look of wealth. What does he want with me? Tracy wondered again. She decided to let him pursue the subject, but there was no further mention of Conrad Morgan or what possible mutual benefit there could be between Gunther Hartog and Tracy Whitney. Tracy found the meeting enjoyable and intriguing. Gunther told her about his background. I was born in Munich. My father was a banker. He was wealthy, and I'm afraid I grew up rather spoiled. Surrounded by beautiful paintings and antiques, my mother was Jewish, and when Hitler came to power, my father refused to desert my mother, and so he was stripped of everything. They were both killed in the bombing. Friends smuggled me out of Germany to Switzerland. 
and when the war was over, I decided not to return to Germany. I moved to London and opened a small antique shop on Mount Street. I hope that you will visit it one day. That's what this is all about, Tracy thought in surprise. He wants to sell me something. As it turned out, she was wrong. As Gunther Hartog was paying the check, he said casually, I have a little country house in Hampshire. I'm having a few friends down for the weekend, and I'd be delighted if you would join us. Tracy hesitated. The man was a complete stranger, and she still had no idea what he wanted from her. She decided she had nothing to lose. The weekend turned out to be fascinating. Gunther Hartog's little country house was a beautiful 17th-century manor home on a 30-acre estate. Gunther was a widower, and except for his servants, he lived alone. He took Tracy on a tour of the grounds. There was a barn, stabling half a dozen horses, and a yard where he raised chickens and pigs. That so will never go hungry, he said gravely. Now, let me show you my real hobby. He led Tracy to a coat full of pigeons. These are homing pigeons. Gunther's voice was filled with pride. Look at these little beauties. See that slate gray one over there. That's Margot. He picked her up and held her. You really are a dreadful girl. Do you know that? She bullies the others, but she's the brightest. He gently smoothed the feathers over the small head and carefully set her down. The colors of the birds were spectacular. There was a variety of blue-black, blue-gray, with check patterns and silver. But no white ones, Tracy noticed. Homing pigeons are never white, Gunther explained. Because white feathers come off too easily, and when pigeons are homing, they fly at an average of 40 miles an hour. Tracy watched Gunther as he fed the birds a special racing feed with added vitamins. They are amazing species, Gunther said. Do you know they can find their way home from over 500 miles away? That's fascinating. The guests were equally fascinating. There was a cabinet minister with his wife, an earl, a general and his girlfriend, and the Maharani of Morvi, a very attractive, friendly young woman. Please call me Vijay, she said, in an almost unaccented voice. She wore a deep red sari shot with golden threads, and the most beautiful jewels Tracy had ever seen. I keep most of my jewelry in a vault, B.J. explained. There are so many robberies these days. On Sunday afternoon, shortly before Tracy was to return to London, Gunther invited her into his study. They sat across from each other over a tea tray. As Tracy poured the tea into the wafer-thin Belik cups, she said, I don't know why you invited me here, Gunther, but whatever the reason... I've had a wonderful time. I'm pleased, Tracy. Then after a moment he continued, I've been observing you. I see. Do you have any plans for the future? She hesitated. No, I haven't decided what I'm going to do yet. I think we could work well together. You mean in your antique shop? He laughed. <laughs> no, my dear. <laughs> It would be a shame to waste your talents. You'll see. I know about your escapade with Conrad Morgan. You handled it brilliantly. Gunther, all that's behind me. But what's ahead of you? You said you have no plans. You must think about your future. Whatever money you have is surely going to run out one day. I'm suggesting a partnership. I travel in very affluent international circles. I attend charity balls, hunting parties, and yachting parties. I know the comings and goings of the rich. I don't see what that has to do with me. I can introduce you into that golden circle, and I do mean golden, Tracy. I can supply you with information about fabulous jewels and paintings and how you can safely acquire them. I can dispose of them privately. You will be balancing the ledgers of people who have become wealthy at the expense of others. Everything would be divided evenly between us. What do you say? I say no. He studied her thoughtfully. I see. You will call me if you change your mind. I won't change my mind, Gunther. 
Late that afternoon, Tracy returned to London. Tracy adored London. She dined at Le Gavroche and Bill Bentley's and Croix de Feu and went to Drones after the theater for real American hamburgers and hot chili. She went to the National Theater and the Royal Opera House and attended auctions at Christie's and Sotheby's. She shopped at Harrods and Fortnum and Mason's and browsed for books at Hatcher's and Foyle's and W. H. Smith. She hired a car and driver and spent a memorable weekend at Chewton Glen Hotel in Hampshire on the fringe of the new forest where the setting was spectacular and the service impeccable. But all these things were expensive. Whatever money you have is sure to run out some day. Gunther Hartog was right. Her money was not going to last forever, and Tracy realized she would have to make plans for the future. She was invited back for more weekends at Gunther's country home, and she thoroughly enjoyed each visit and delighted in Gunther's company. One Sunday evening at dinner, a member of Parliament turned to Tracy and said, I've never met a real Texan, Miss Whitney. What are they like? Tracy went into a wicked imitation of a nouveau rich Texas dowager and had the company roaring with laughter. Later, when Tracy and Gunther were alone, he asked, How would you like to make a small fortune doing that imitation? I'm not an actress, Gunther. You underestimate yourself. There's a jewelry farm in London, Parker and Parker, that takes a delight in, as you Americans would say, ripping off their customers. You've given me an idea how to make them pay for their dishonesty. He told Tracy his idea. No, Tracy said. But the more she thought about it, the more intrigued she was. She remembered the excitement of outwitting the police in Long Island and Boris Melnikoff, and Pietro Negolesco, and Jeff Stevens. It had been a thrill that was indescribable. Still, that was part of the past. No, Gunther, she said again, but this time there was less certainty in her voice. London was unseasonably warm for October, and Englishmen and tourists alike took advantage of the bright sunshine. The noon traffic was heavy with tie-ups at Trafalgar Square, Charing Cross, and Piccadilly Circus. A white dambler turned off Oxford Street to New Bond Street and threaded its way through the traffic, passing Roland Cartier, Geiger's, and the Royal Bank of Scotland. A few doors farther on, it coasted to a stop in front of a jewelry store. A discreet polished sign at the side of the door read, Parker and Parker. A liveried chauffeur stepped out of the limousine and hurried around to open the rear door for his passenger. A young woman with blonde sassooned hair, wearing far too much makeup, and a tight-fitting Italian knit dress under a sable coat, totally inappropriate for the weather, jumped out of the car. "'Which way's the joint, Junior?' she asked. Her voice was loud with a grating Texas accent. The chauffeur indicated the entrance. "'There, madam.' "'Okay, honey, stick around. This ain't gonna take long.' "'I may have to circle the block, madam.' I won't be permitted to park here. She clapped him on the back and said, You do what you gotta do, sport. Sport, the chauffeur winced. It was his punishment for being reduced to chauffeuring rental cars. He disliked all Americans, particularly Texans. They were savages, but savages with money. He would have been astonished to learn that his passenger had never even seen the Lone Star State. Tracy checked her reflection in the display window smiled broadly, and strutted toward the door, which was opened by a uniform attendant. Good afternoon, madam. Afternoon, sport. You selling anything besides costume jewelry in this joint? Ha, ha, ha. She chuckled at her joke. The doorman blanched. Tracy swept into the store, trailing an overpowering scent of Chloe behind her. Arthur Chilton, a salesman in a morning coat, moved toward her. May I help you, madam? Maybe, maybe not. Old PJ told me to buy myself a little birthday present. So here I am. What you got? Is there something in particular Madam is interested in? Hey, partner, you English fellas are fast workers, ain't you? She laughed ruckusly and clapped him on the shoulder. He forced himself to remain impassive. Maybe something in emeralds. Old BJ loves to buy me emeralds. 
If you'll step this way, please. Chilton led her to a vitrine where several trays of emeralds were displayed. The bleached blonde gave them one disdainful glance. These are the babies. Where are the mamas and the papas? Chilton said stiffly, These range in price up to $30,000. Hell, I tip my hairdresser that. The woman guffawed. Old PJ would be insulted if I came back with one of them little pebbles. Chilton visualized old PJ, fat and paunchy, and as loud and obnoxious as this woman. They deserved each other. Why did money always flow to the undeserving, he wondered. What price range was Madame interested in? Why don't we start with something round a hundred G's? He looked blank. A hundred G's? Hell, I thought you people were supposed to speak the king's English. A hundred grand, a hundred thou? He swallowed. Oh, in that case, perhaps it would be better if you spoke with our managing director. The managing director, Gregory Halston, insisted on personally handling all large sales, and since the employees of Parker and Parker received no commission, it made no difference to them. With a customer as distasteful as this one, Chilton was relieved to let Halston deal with her. Chilton pressed a button under the counter, and a moment later, a pale, reedy-looking man bustled out of a back room. He took a look at the outrageously dressed blonde and prayed that none of his regular customers appeared until the woman had departed. Chilton said, Mr. Halston, this is Mrs. Uh, he turned to the woman. Banneke, honey. Mary Lou Banneke. Oh, P.J. Banneke's wife. Bet you all have heard of P.J. Banneke. Of course. Gregory Halston gave her a smile that barely touched his lips. Mrs. Banneke is interested in purchasing an emerald, Mr. Halston. Gregory Halston indicated the trays of emeralds. We have some fine emeralds here that she wanted something for approximately a hundred thousand dollars. This time the smile that lit Gregory Halston's face was genuine. What a nice way to start the day. You see, it's my birthday, and old PJ wants me to buy myself something pretty. Indeed, Halston said. Would you follow me, please? You little rascal! What you got in mind? The blonde giggled. Halston and Chilton exchanged a pained look. Bloody Americans. Halston led the woman to a locked door and opened it with a key. They entered a small, brightly lit room, and Halston carefully locked the door behind them. This is where we keep our merchandise for our valued customers, he said. In the center of the room was a showcase filled with a stunning array of diamonds, rubies, and emeralds, flashing their bright colors. Well, this is more like it. Oh, PJ, go crazy in here. Does Madam see something she likes? Well, let's just see what we got here. She walked over to the jewelry case containing emeralds. Let me look at that there bunch. Halston extracted another small key from his pocket, unlocked the case, lifted out a tray of emeralds, and placed it on top of the table. There were ten emeralds in the velvet case. Halston watched as the woman picked up the largest of them, an exquisite pin in a platinum setting. As old PJ would say, this here one's got my name writ on it. Madam has excellent taste. This is a ten-carat grass green Colombian. It's flawless, and emeralds ain't never flawless. Halston was taken aback for an instant. Madam is correct, of course. What I meant was, for the first time he noticed that the woman's eyes were as green as the stone she twisted in her hands, turning it around, studying its facets. No sweat, sweetie. I'll take this here one. The sale had taken fewer than three minutes. Splendid. Halston said. Then he added delicately, In dollars it comes to one hundred thousand. How will Madam be paying? Don't you worry, Ralston, old sport. I have a dollar account at a bank here in London. I'll write out a little old personal check. Then PJ can just pay me back. Excellent. I'll have the stone cleaned for you and delivered to your hotel. The stone did not need cleaning but Halston had no intention of letting it out of his possession until her check had cleared, for too many jewelers he knew had been bilked by clever swindlers. 
Halston prided himself on the fact that he had never been cheated out of one pound. Where shall I have the emerald delivered? We got ourselves the Oliver Messel suite at the Dorch. Halston made a note. The Dorchester? I call it the Oliver Messy suite. She laughed. Lots of people don't like the hotel anymore because it's full of Arabs. But old PJ does a lot of business with them. Oil is its own country, he always says. PJ Benneke's one smart fella. I'm sure he is, Holston replied dutifully. He watched as she tore out a check and began writing. He noted that it was a Barclays Bank check. Good. He had a friend there who had verified the Benneke's account. He picked up the check. I'll have the emerald delivered to you personally tomorrow morning. Oh, PJ's gonna love it, she beamed. I am sure he will, Halston said politely. He walked her to the front door. Ralston! He almost corrected her, then decided against it. Why bother? He was never going to lay eyes on her again. Thank God. Yes, madam. You gotta come up and have tea with us some afternoon. You'll love old PJ. I'm sure I would. Unfortunately, I work afternoons. Too bad. He watched as his customer walked out to the curb. A white dammler slithered up, and a chauffeur got out and opened the door for her. The blonde turned to give Halston the thumbs up sign as she drove off. When Halston returned to his office, he immediately picked up the phone and called his friend at Barclays. Peter, dear, I have a check here for a hundred thousand dollars. Drawn on the account of Mrs. Mary Lou Benneke. Is it good? Hold on, old boy. Halston waited. He hoped the check was good, for business had been slow lately. The miserable Parker brothers, who owned the store, were constantly complaining, as though it were he who was responsible and not the recession. Of course, profits were not down as much as they could have been, for Parker and Parker had a department that specialized in cleaning jewelry. And at frequent intervals, the jewelry that was returned to the customer was inferior to the original that had been bought in. Complaints had been lodged, but nothing had ever been proven. Peter was back on the line. No problem, Gregory. There's more than enough money in that account to cover the check. Halston felt a little freezing of relief. Thank you, Peter. Not at all. Lunch next week, on me. The check cleared the following morning, and the Columbian Emerald was delivered by bonded messenger to Mrs. P. J. Benneke at the Dorchester Hotel. That afternoon, shortly before closing time, Gregory Halston's secretary said, A Mrs. Benneke is here to see you, Mr. Halston. His heart sank. She had come to return the pin, and he could hardly refuse to take it back. Damn all women, all Americans, and all Texans. Halston put on a smile and went out to greet her. Good afternoon, Mrs. Benneke. I assume your husband didn't like the pin. She grinned. You assume wrong, Buster. Old PJ was just plain crazy about it. Holston's heart began to sing. He was. In fact, he liked it so much, he wants to get another one, so we can have them made into a pair of earrings. Let me have a twin to the one I got. A small frown appeared on Gregory Holston's face. I'm afraid we might have a little problem there, Mrs. Benneke. What kind of problem, honey? Yours is a unique stone. There's not another one like it. Now I have a lovely set in a different style. I could. I don't want a different style. I want one just like the one I bought. To be perfectly candid, Mrs. Benneke, there aren't very many ten carat Colombian flawless. He saw her look. Nearly flawless stones available. Come on, sport. There's got to be one somewhere. In all honesty, I've seen very few stones of that quality, and to try to duplicate it exactly in shape and color would be almost impossible. We got a saying in Texas that the impossible just takes a little longer. Saturday's my birthday. PJ wants me to have those earrings, and what PJ wants, PJ gets. I don't really think I can. How much did I pay for that pin? A hundred grand? I know all PJ will go up to two hundred or three hundred thousand for another one. Gregory Halston was thinking fast. There had to be a duplicate of that stone somewhere, and if PJ Benneke was willing to pay an extra two hundred thousand for it, 
That would mean a tidy profit. In fact, Halston thought, I can work it out so that it means a tidy profit for me. Aloud, he said, I'll inquire around, Mrs. Benneke. I'm sure that no other jeweler in London has the identical emerald, but there are always estates coming up for auction. I'll do some advertising and see what results I get. You got till the end of the week, the blonde told him. And just between you and me and the lamppost, old PJ will probably be willing to go up to three hundred fifty thousand for it. And Mrs. Benneke was gone, her sable coat billowing out behind her. Gregory Halston sat in his office, lost in a daydream. Fate had placed in his hands a man who was so besalted with his blonde tart that he was willing to pay three hundred fifty thousand dollars for a hundred thousand dollar emerald. That was a net profit of two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Gregory Halston saw no need to burden the Parker brothers with the details of the transaction. It would be a simple matter to record the sale of the second emerald at a hundred thousand dollars and pocket the rest. The extra two hundred and fifty thousand dollars would set him up for life. All he had to do now was to find a twin to the emerald he had sold to Mrs. P. J. Benneke. It turned out to be even more difficult than Halston had anticipated. None of the jewelers he telephoned had anything in stock that resembled what he required. He placed advertisements in the London Times and the Financial Times, and he called Christie's and Sotheby's and a dozen estate agents. In the next few days. Halston was inundated with a flood of inferior emeralds, good emeralds, and a few first quality emeralds, but none of them came close to what he was looking for. On Wednesday, Mrs. Benneke telephoned. Old PJ's getting mighty restless, she warned. Did you find it yet? Not yet, Mrs. Benneke, Halston assured her. But don't worry, we will. On Friday, she telephoned again. Tomorrow's my birthday. She reminded Halston, "I know, Mrs. Benneke. If I only had a few more days, I know I could. Well, never mind, sport. If you don't have that emerald by tomorrow morning, I'll return the one I bought from you. Oh, P.J. Bless his heart. Says he's gonna buy me a big old country estate instead. Ever hear of a place called Sussex?" Halston broke out in perspiration. "Mrs. Benneke," he moaned earnestly. You would hate living in Sussex. You would loathe living in a country house. Most of them are in deplorable condition. They have no central heating, and between you and I, she interrupted, I'd rather have them earrings. Old P.J. even mentioned something about being willing to pay four hundred thousand dollars for a twin to that stone. You got no idea how stubborn old P.J. can be. Four hundred thousand. Halston could feel the money slipping between his fingers. Believe me, I'm doing everything I can," he pleaded. "I need a little more time. It ain't up to me, honey," she said. "It's up to P.J." And the line went dead. Halston sat there cursing fate. Where could he find an identical ten-carat emerald? He was so busy with his bitter thoughts that he did not hear his intercom until the third buzz. He pushed down the button and snapped. "What is it?" "There's a Contessa Marissa on the telephone, Mr. Halston." She's calling about an advertisement for the emerald. Another one. He had had at least ten calls that morning. Every one of them a waste of time. He picked up the telephone and said ungraciously, "Yes." A soft female voice with an Italian accent said, "Buongiorno, signore. I have read you are interested possibly in buying an emerald. See?" If it fits my qualifications, yes. He could not keep the impatience out of his voice. I have an emerald that has been in my family for many years. It is a peccato, a pity, but I am in a situation now where I am forced to sell it. He had heard that story before. I must try Christie's again, Halston thought, or Sotheby's. Maybe something came in at the last minute. Or, Signore, you are looking for a ten-carat emerald, see? Yes. I have a ten-carat verde green Colombian. When Halston started to speak, he found that his voice was choked. Would, <clears throat> would you say that again, please? See,、si. I have a ten-carat grass green Colombian. Would you be interested in that? I might be, he said carefully. 
I wonder if you could drop by and let me have a look at it. No, scusi. I am afraid I am very busy right now. We are preparing a party at the embassy for my husband. Perhaps next week I could... No. Next week would be too late. May I come to see you? He tried to keep the eagerness out of his voice. I could come up now. Me no sono occupado stamani. I was planning to go shopping. Where are you staying, Contessa? At the Savoy. I could be there in fifteen minutes. Ten. His voice was feverish. Molto bene. And your name is... Halston. Gregory Halston. Sweet venti say. Twenty-six. The taxi ride was interminable. Holston transported himself from the heights of heaven to the depths of hell and back again. If the emerald was indeed similar to the other one, he would be wealthy beyond his wildest dreams. Four hundred thousand dollars he'll pay. A three hundred thousand dollar profit. He would buy a place on the Riviera, perhaps get a cruiser. With a villa and his own boat, he would be able to attract as many handsome young men as he liked. Gregory Halston was an atheist, but as he walked down the corridor of the Savoy Hotel to Suite 26, he found himself praying, Let the stone be similar enough to satisfy old P.J. Benneke. He stood in front of the door of the Contessa's room, taking slow, deep breaths, fighting to get control of himself. He knocked on the door, and there was no answer. Oh, my God, Halston thought. She's gone. She didn't wait for me. She went out shopping and... The door opened, and Halston found himself facing an elegant-looking lady in her fifties, with dark eyes, a lined face and black hair laced with gray. When she spoke, her voice was soft, with a familiar melodic Italian accent. See? I'm G Gregory Halston. You telephoned me. In his nervousness, he was stuttering. Ah, oh, see, si. I am Contessa Marissa. Come in, signor, por favore. Thank you. He entered the suite, pressing his knees together to keep them from trembling. He almost blurted out, Where's the emerald? But he knew he must control himself. He must not seem too eager. If the stone was satisfactory, he would have the advantage in bargaining. After all, he was the expert. She was an amateur. Please to sit yourself, the Contessa said. He took a chair. Scusi, no parlo molto bene inglese. I speak poor English. No, no, it's charming, charming. Grazie. Would you take perhaps coffee, te? No, thank you, Contessa. He could feel his stomach quivering. Was it too soon to bring up the subject of the emerald? He could not wait another second. The emerald? She said, Ah, si, the emerald was given to me by my grandmother. I wish to pass it on to my daughter when she is twenty-five. But my husband is going into a new business in Milano, and I... Halston's mind was elsewhere. He was not interested in the boring life story of the stranger sitting across from him. He was burning to see the emerald. The suspense was more than he could bear. Credo che sia importante to help my husband get started in his business. She smiled ruefully. Perhaps I am making a mistake. No, no, Halston said hastily. Not at all, Contessa. It's a wife's duty to stand by her husband. Where is the emerald now? I have it here, the Contessa said. She reached into her pocket, pulled out a jewel wrapped in a tissue, and held it out to Halston. He stared at it, and his spirit soared. He was looking at the most exquisite ten-carat grass-green Colombian emerald he had ever seen. It was so close in appearance, size, and color to the one he had sold Mrs. Benneke that the difference was almost impossible to detect. It is not exactly the same, Halston told himself, but only an expert would be able to tell the difference. His hands began to tremble. He forced himself to appear calm. He turned the stone over, letting the light catch the beautiful facets, and said casually, It's a rather nice little stone. Splendente, si. I have loved it very much all these years. I will hate to part with it. You're doing the right thing, Halston assured her. Once your husband's business is successful, you will be able to buy as many of these as you wish. That is exactly what I feel. You are molto simpatico. I'm doing a little favor for a friend, Contessa. 
We have much better stones than this in our shop, but my friend wants one to match an emerald that his wife bought. I imagine he would be willing to pay as much as sixty thousand dollars for the stone. The Contessa sighed. Hmm. My grandmother would haunt me from her grave if I sold it for sixty thousand dollars. Halston pursed his lips. He could afford to go higher. He smiled. I'll tell you what. I think I might persuade my friend to go as high as one hundred thousand. That's a great deal of money, but he's anxious to have the stone. That sounds fair, the Contessa said. Gregory Halston's heart swelled within his breast. Bene, I brought my checkbook with me, so I'll just write out a check. Mais non, I'm afraid it will not solve my problem. The Contessa's voice was sad. Halston stared at her. Your problem. See,、si. as I explained, my husband is going into his new business, and he needs three hundred fifty thousand dollars. I have a hundred thousand of my money to give him, but I need two hundred fifty thousand more. I was hoped to get it for this emerald. He shook his head. My dear Contessa, no emerald in the world is worth that kind of money. Believe me, one hundred thousand dollars is more than a fair offer. I'm sure it is so, Mr. Halston," the Contessa told him. "But it will not help my husband, will it?" She rose to her feet. "I will save this to give to our daughter." She held out her slim, delicate hand. "Grazie, signore. Thank you for coming." Halston stood there in a panic. "Wait a minute," he said. His greed was dueling with his common sense, but he knew he must not lose the emerald now. "Please." Sit down, Contessa. I'm sure we can come to some equitable arrangement. If I can persuade my client to pay a hundred and fifty thousand, two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Let's say two hundred thousand. Two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. There was no budging her. Halston made his decision. A one hundred and fifty thousand dollar profit was better than nothing. It would mean a smaller villa and a boat. But it was still a fortune. It would serve the Parker brothers right for the shabby way they treated him. He would wait a day or two and then give them his notice. By next week, he would be on the Côte d'Azur. You have a deal, he said. Mi avviglioso, sono contenta. You should be contented, you bitch, Halston thought. But he had nothing to complain about. He was set for life. He took one last look at the emerald and slipped it into his pocket. I'll give you a check written on the store's account. Bene, signore. Halston wrote out the check and handed it to her. He would have Mrs. P. J. Benneke make out her four hundred thousand dollar check to cash. Peter would cash the check for him, and he would exchange the Contessa's check for the Parker brothers' check and pocket the difference. He would arrange it with Peter. So that the two hundred and fifty thousand dollar check would not appear on the Parker Brothers' monthly statement, one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. He could already feel the warm French sun on his face. A taxi ride back to the store seemed to take only seconds. Halston visualized Mrs. Benneke's happiness when he broke the good news to her. He had not only found the jewel she wanted; he had spared her from the excruciating experience of living in a drafty, run-down country house. When Halston floated into the store, Chilton said, "Sir, a customer here is interested in." Halston cheerfully waved him aside. Later, he had no time for customers. Not now. Not ever again. From now on, people would wait on him. He would shop at Hermes and Gucci and Lanvin. Halston fluttered into his office, closed the door, set the emerald on the desk in front of him, and dialed the number. An operator's voice said, "Dorchester Hotel." The Oliver Messel Suite, please. To whom do you wish to speak? Mrs. P. J. Benneke. One moment, please. Halston whistled softly while he waited. The operator came back on the line. I'm sorry, Mrs. Benneke has checked out. Then ring whatever suite she moved to. Mrs. Benneke has checked out of the hotel. That's impossible. She. I'll connect you with the reception. A male voice said, "Reception, may I help you?" "Yes. What suite is Mrs. P. J. Benneke in?" "Mrs. Benneke checked out of the hotel this morning."
There had to be an explanation, some unexpected emergency. May I have her forwarding address, please? This is... I'm sorry. She didn't leave one. Of course she left one. I checked Mrs. Benicky out myself. She left no forwarding address. It was a jab to the pit of his stomach. Halston slowly replaced the receiver and sat there, bewildered. He had to find a way to get in touch with her, to let her know that he had finally located the emerald. In the meantime, he had to get back the $250,000 check from the Contessa Marissa. He hurriedly dialed the Savoy Hotel. Suite 26. Whom are you calling, please? The Contessa Marissa. One moment, please. But even before the operator came back on the line, some terrible premonition told Gregory Halston the disastrous news he was about to hear. I'm sorry. The Contessa Marissa has checked out. He hung up. His fingers were trembling so hard that he was barely able to dial the number of the bank. Give me the head bookkeeper, quickly. I wish to stop payment on a check. But, of course, he was too late. He had sold an emerald for $100,000 and had bought back the same emerald for $250,000. Gregory Halston sat there slumped in his chair, wondering how he was going to explain it to the Parker brothers. Chapter 22 It was the beginning of a new life for Tracy. She purchased a beautiful old Georgian house at 45 Eaton Square that was bright and cheerful and perfect for entertaining. It had a Queen Anne, British slang for a front garden, and a Mary Anne, a back garden, and in season the flowers were magnificent. Gunther helped Tracy furnish the house, and before the two of them were finished, it was one of the showplaces of London. Gunther introduced Tracy as a wealthy young widow, whose husband had made his fortune in the import-export business. She was an instant success, beautiful, intelligent, and charming. She was soon inundated with invitations. At intervals, Tracy made short trips to France and Switzerland and Belgium and Italy, and each time she and Gunther Hartog profited. Under Gunther's tutelage, Tracy studied the Almanac de Gotha and de Brett's Peerage and Baronage, the authoritative books listing detailed information on all the royalty and titles in Europe. Tracy became a chameleon, an expert in makeup and disguises and accents. She acquired half a dozen passports. In various countries, she was a British duchess, a French airline stewardess, and a South American heiress. In a year, she had accumulated more money than she would ever need. She set up a fund from which she made large anonymous contributions to organizations that helped former women prisoners and she arranged for a generous pension to be sent to Otto Schmidt every month. She no longer even entertained the thought of quitting. She loved the challenge of outwitting clever, successful people. The thrill of each daring escapade acted like a drug, and Tracy found that she constantly needed new and bigger challenges. There was one credo she lived by. She was careful never to hurt the innocent. The people who jumped at her swindles were greedy or immoral or both. No one will ever commit suicide because of what I've done to them, Tracy promised herself. The newspapers began to carry stories of the daring escapades that were occurring all over Europe, and because Tracy used different disguises, the police were convinced that a rash of ingenious swindles and burglaries was being carried out by a gang of women. Interpol began to take an interest. At the Manhattan headquarters of the International Insurance Protection Association, J.J. Reynolds sent for Daniel Cooper. We have a problem, Reynolds said. A large number of our European clients are being hit, apparently, by a gang of women. Everybody's screaming bloody murder. They want the gang caught. Interpol has agreed to cooperate with us. It's your assignment, Dan. You'll leave for Paris in the morning. Tracy was having dinner with Gunther at Scott's on Mont Street, have you ever heard of Maximilian Pierpont Tracy? The name sounded familiar. Where had she heard it before? She remembered. Jeff Stevens, on board the QE2, had said, We're here for the same reason. Maximilian Pierpont. Very rich, isn't he? And quite ruthless. He specializes in buying up companies and stripping them. When Joe Romano took over the business, he fired everybody and brought in his own people to run things. Then he began to raise the company. 
They took everything. The business, the house, your mother's car. Gunther was looking at her oddly. Tracy, are you all right? Yes, I'm fine. Sometimes life can be unfair, she thought, and it's up to us to even things out. Tell me more about Maximilian Pierpont. His sad wife just divorced him, and he's alone now. I think it might be profitable if you made the gentleman's acquaintance. He's booked on the Orient Express Friday, from London to Istanbul. Tracy smiled. I've never been on the Orient Express. I think I'd enjoy it. Gunther smiled back. Good. Maximilian Pierpont has the only important Fabergé egg collection outside of the Hermitage Museum in Leningrad. It's conservatively estimated to be worth twenty million dollars. If I manage to get some of the eggs for you, Tracy asked, curious. What would you do with them, Gunther? Wouldn't they be too well known to sell? Private collectors, dear Tracy. You bring the little eggs to me, and I will find a nest for them. I'll see what I can do. Maximilian Pierpont is not an easy man to approach. However, there are two other pigeons also booked on the Orient Express Friday, bound for the film festival in Venice. I think they're ripe for plucking. Have you heard of Silvania Lodi, the Italian movie star? Of course, she's married to Alberto Fonati, who produces those terrible epic films. Fonati is infamous for hiring actors and directors for very little cash, promising them big percentages of the profits, and keeping all the profits for himself. He manages to make enough to buy his wife very expensive jewels. The more unfaithful he is to her, the more jewelry he gives her. By this time, Savanna should be able to open her own jewelry store. I'm sure you'll find all of them interesting company. I'm looking forward to it, Tracy said. Thirty minutes before departure, a portable check-in counter is set up at the entrance to the boarding platform in the terminal, and two burly uniformed men roll a red rug up to the counter, elbowing aside eagerly waiting passengers. The new owners of the Orient Express had attempted to recreate the golden age of rail travel. As it existed in the late 19th century, and the rebuilt train was a duplicate of the original, with a British Pullman car, wagon-lit restaurants, a bar salon car, and sleeping cars. An attendant in a 1920s marine blue uniform with gold braid carried Tracy's two suitcases and her vanity case to her cabin, which was disappointingly small. There was a single seat upholstered with a flower-patterned mohair, the rug as well as a ladder that was used to reach the top berth. Was covered in the same green plush. It was like being in a candy box. Tracy read the card accompanying the small bottle of champagne in a silver bucket. Oliver Albert, train manager. I'll save it until I have something to celebrate. Tracy decided. Maximilian Pierpont. Jeff Stevens had failed. It would be a wonderful feeling to top Mr. Stevens. Tracy smiled at the thought. She unpacked in the cramped space and hung up the clothes she would be needing. She preferred traveling on a Pan American jet rather than a train, but this journey promised to be an exciting one. Exactly on schedule, the Orient Express began to move out of the station. Tracy sat back in her seat and watched the southern suburbs of London roll by. At 1:15 that afternoon, the train arrived at the port of Folkestone, where the passengers transferred to the Sea Link ferry, which would take them across the Channel to Boulogne, where they would board another Orient Express heading south. Tracy approached one of the attendants. I understand Maximilian Pierpont is traveling with us. Could you point him out to me? The attendant shook his head. I wish I could, ma'am. He booked his cabin and paid for it, but he never showed up. Very unpredictable gentleman, so I'm told. That left Savanna Lottie and her husband, the producer of forgettable epics. In Boulogne, the passengers were escorted into the Continental Orient Express. Unfortunately. Tracy's cabin on the second train was identical to the one she had left, and the rough roadbed made the journey even more uncomfortable. She remained in her cabin all day making her plans, and at eight in the evening she began to dress. The dress code of the Orient Express recommended evening clothes, 
and Tracy chose a stunning dove gray chiffon gown with gray hose and gray satin shoes. Her only jewelry was a single strand of matched pearls. She checked herself in the mirror before she left her quarters, staring at her reflection for a long time. Her green eyes had a look of innocence, and her face looked guileless and vulnerable. The mirror's lying, Tracy thought. I'm not that woman anymore. I'm living a masquerade, but an exciting one. As Tracy left her cabin, her purse slipped out of her hand, and as she knelt down to retrieve it, she quickly examined the outside locks on the door. There were two of them, a Yale lock and a universal lock. No problem. Tracy rose and moved on toward the dining cars. There were three dining cars aboard the train. The seats were plush-covered, the walls were veneered, and the soft lights came from brass sconces topped with lalique shades. Tracy entered the first dining room and noted several empty tables. The maitre d' greeted her. A table for one, mademoiselle? Tracy looked around the room. I'm joining some friends. Thank you. She continued on to the next dining car. This one was more crowded, but there were still several unoccupied tables. Good evening, the maitre d' said. Are you dining alone? No, I'm meeting someone. Thank you. She moved on to the third dining car. There, every table was occupied. The maitre d' stopped her at the door. I'm afraid there will be a wait for a table, madame. There are available tables in the other dining cars, however. Tracy looked around the room, and at a table in the far corner, she saw what she was looking for. That's all right, Tracy said. I see friends. She moved past the maitre d' and walked over to the corner table. Excuse me, she said apologetically. All the tables seem to be occupied. Would you mind if I joined you? The man quickly rose to his feet, took a good look at Tracy, and exclaimed, Prego, con piacere. I am Alberto Fornati, and this is my wife, Savania Laudi. Tracy Whitney. She was using her own passport. Ah, in Americana. I speak the excellent English. Alberto Fornati was short, bald, and fat. Why Savana Laudi had ever married him had been the most lively topic in Rome for the twelve years they had been together. Savana Laudi was a classic beauty, with a sensational figure and a compelling natural talent. She had won an Oscar and a Silver Palm Award and was always in great demand. Tracy recognized that she was dressed in a Valentino evening gown that sold for $5,000 and the jewelry she wore must have been worth close to a million. Tracy remembered Gunther Hortog's words, The more unfaithful he is to her, the more jewelry he gives her. By this time, Savannah should be able to open her own jewelry store. This is your first time on the Orient Express, Signorina. Fornati opened the conversation after Tracy was seated. Yes, it is. Ah, it does very romantic train, filled with legend. His eyes were moist. There are many interessante tales about it. For instance, Sir Basil Zaroff, the arms tycoon, used to ride the old Orient Express, always in the 17th compartment. One night he hears a scream and the pounding on his door. A bellissima, young Spanish duchess throws herself upon him. Fernati paused to butter a roll and take a bite. Her husband was trying to murder her. The parents had arranged the marriage, and the poor girl now realized her husband was insane. Zaroff restrained the husband and calmed the hysterical young woman, and thus began a romance that lasted forty years. How exciting, Tracy said. Her eyes are wide with interest. See, si. every year after they met on the Orient Express, he in compartment number seven, she in number eight. When her husband died, the lady and Zara were married, and as a token of his love, he bought her the casino at Monte Carlo as a wedding gift. What a beautiful story, Mr. Fernati. Savannah Lotti sat in stony silence. Manja, Fernati urged Tracy, eat. The menu consisted of six courses, and Tracy noted that Alberto Fanati ate each one and finished what his wife left on her plate. In between bites, he kept up a constant chatter. You are an actress, perhaps? He asked Tracy. She laughed. Oh, no. I'm just a tourist. He beamed at her. Bellissima. You are beautiful enough to be an actress. She said she is not an actress, Savania said sharply. Alberto Fanati ignored her. I produce motion pictures, 
he told Tracy. You have heard of them, of course. Wild Savages, the Titans vs. Superwoman. I don't see many movies, Tracy apologized. She felt his fat leg press against hers under the table. Perhaps I can arrange to show you some of mine. Savannah turned white with anger. Do you ever get to Rome, my dear? His leg was moving up and down against Tracy's. As a matter of fact, I'm planning to go to Rome after Venice. Splendid! Bonissimo! We will all get together for dinner. Won't we, Cara? He gave a quick glance toward Savannah before he continued. We have a lovely villa off the Appian Way. Ten acres of... His hand made a sweeping gesture and knocked a bowl of gravy into his wife's lap. Tracy could not be sure whether it was deliberate or not. Savannah Laudi rose to her feet and looked at the spreading stain on her dress. Sei un mascazone, she screamed. Tiane le tue putana letano de me. She stormed out of the dining car, every eye following her. What a shame, Tracy murmured. It's such a beautiful dress. She could have slapped the man for degrading his wife. She deserves every carrot of jewelry she has, Tracy thought, and more. He sighed. Hmm, for not they will buy another one. Pay no attention to her manners. She is very jealous of Fornati. I'm sure she has good reason to be. Tracy covered her irony with a small smile. He preened. It is true. Women find Fornati very attractive. It was all Tracy could do to keep from bursting out laughing at the pompous little man. I can understand that. He reached across the table and took her hand. Fornati likes you, he said. Fornati likes you very much. What do you do for a living? I'm a legal secretary. I saved up all my money for this trip. I hope to get an interesting position in Europe. His bulging eyes roved over her body. You will have no problem. Fornati promises you. He is very nice to people who are very nice to him. How wonderful of you, Tracy said shyly. He lowered his voice. Perhaps, um... Uh, we could discuss this later, this evening, in your cabin. That might be embarrassing. Perché? Why? You're so famous. Everyone on the train probably knows who you are. Naturally. If they see you come to my cabin, well, you know, some people might misunderstand. Of course. If your cabin is near mine, what number are you in? A setanta. Seventy. He looked at her, hopefully. Tracy sighed. I'm in another car. Why don't we meet in Venice? Bene! My wife, she stays in her room most of the time. She cannot stand the sun on her face. Have you ever been to Venezia? No. Ah, you and I shall go to Torcello, a beautiful little island with a wonderful restaurant, the Locanda Cipriani. It is also a small hotel. His eyes gleamed. Molto privato. Tracy gave him a slow, understanding smile. It sounds exciting. She lowered her eyes, too overcome to say more. Fernati leaned forward, squeezed her hand, and whispered wetly, You do not know what excitement is yet, Cara. Half an hour later, Tracy was back in her cabin. The Orient Express sped through the lonely night, past Paris and Dijon and Vallarbe, while the passengers slept. They had turned in their passports the evening before, and the border formalities would be handled by the conductors. At 3.30 in the morning, Tracy quietly left her compartment. The timing was critical. The train would cross the Swiss border and reach Lausanne at 5.21 a.m., and was due to arrive in Milan, Italy, at 9.15 a.m. Clad in pajamas and robe, and carrying a sponge bag, Tracy moved down the corridor, every sense alert, the familiar excitement making her pulse leap. There were no toilets in the cabins of the train, but there were some located at the end of each car. If Tracy was questioned, she was prepared to say that she was looking for the ladies' room, but she encountered no one. The conductors and porters were taking advantage of the early morning hours to catch up on their sleep. Tracy reached cabin E-70 without incident. She quietly tried the doorknob. The door was locked. Tracy opened the sponge bag and took out a metallic object and a small bottle with a syringe and went to work. Ten minutes later she was back in her cabin, and thirty minutes after that she was asleep, 
with a trace of a smile on her freshly scrubbed face. At 7 a.m., two hours before the Orient Express was due to arrive in Milan, a series of piercing screams rang out. They came from cabin E-70, and they awakened the entire car. Passengers poked their heads out of their cabins to see what was happening. A conductor came hurrying along the car and entered E-70. Savannah Laudi was in hysterics. Aiuto! Help! she screamed. All my jewelry is gone! This miserable train is full of ladri! Thieves! Please, calm down, madam, the conductor begged. The other, calm down? Her voice went up an octave. How dare you tell me to calm down, stupid Amele! Someone has stolen more than a million dollars worth of my jewels! How could this have happened? Alberto Fonati demanded. The door was locked, and Fonati is a light sleeper. If anyone had entered, I would have awakened instantly! The conductor sighed. He knew only too well how it had happened, because it had happened before. During the night, someone had crept down the corridor and sprayed a syringe full of ether through the keyhole. The locks would have been child's play for someone who knew what he was doing. The thief would have closed the door behind him, looted the room, and, having taken what he wanted, quietly crept back to his compartment while his victims were still unconscious. But there was one thing about this burglary that was different from the others. In the past, the thefts had not been discovered until after the train had reached its destination, so the thieves had had a chance to escape. This was a different situation. No one had disembarked since the robbery, which meant that the jewelry still had to be on board. Don't worry. The conductor promised the Fornatis, You'll get your jewels back. The thief is still on this train. He hurried forward to telephone the police in Milan. When the Orient Express pulled into the Milan terminal, twenty uniformed policemen and plainclothes detectives lined the station platform with orders not to let any passengers or baggage off the train. Luigi Ricci, the inspector in charge, was taken directly to the Fornati compartment. If anything, Savannah Laudi's hysteria had increased. Every bit of jewelry I owned was in that jewelry case, she screamed, and none of it was insured. The inspector examined the empty jewelry case. You are sure you put your jewels in there last night, signora? Of course I am sure. I put them there every night. Her luminous eyes, which had thrilled millions of adoring fans, pulled over with large tears and Inspector Ricci was ready to slay dragons for her. He walked over to the compartment door, bent down, and sniffed the keyhole. He could detect the lingering odor of ether. There had been a robbery, and he intended to catch the unfeeling bandit. Inspector Ricci straightened up and said, Do not worry, signora. There is no way the jewels can be removed from this train. We will catch the thief, and your gems will be returned to you. Inspector Ricci had every reason to be confident. The trap was tightly sealed, and there was no possibility for the culprit to get away. One by one, the detectives escorted the passengers to a station waiting room that had been roped off, and they were expertly body-searched. The passengers, many of them people of prominence, were outraged by this indignity. I'm sorry, Inspector Ricci explained to each of them, but the million-dollar theft is a very serious business. As each passenger was led from the train... Detectives turned their cabins upside down. Every inch of space was examined. This was a splendid opportunity for Inspector Ricci, and he intended to make the most of it. When he recovered the stolen jewels, it would mean a promotion and a raise. His imagination became inflamed. Savannah Laudi would be so grateful to him that she would probably invite him to... He gave orders with renewed vigor. There was a knock at Tracy's cabin door, and a detective entered. Excuse me, signorina. There has been a robbery. It is necessary to search all the passengers. If you will come with me, please. A robbery? Her voice was shocked. On this train? I fear so, signorina. When Tracy stepped out of her compartment, two detectives moved in, opened her suitcases, and began carefully sifting through the contents. At the end of four hours, the search had turned up several packets of marijuana, five ounces of cocaine, a knife, and an illegal gun. There was no sign of missing jewelry. Inspector Ricci could not believe it. Have you searched the entire train? He demanded of his lieutenant. Inspector, we have searched every inch. We have examined the engine, the dining rooms, the bar, the toilets, the compartments. We have searched the passengers and crew and examined every piece of luggage. I can swear to you 
that the jeweler is not on board this train. Perhaps the lady imagined the theft. But Inspector Ricci knew better. He had spoken to the waiters, and they had confirmed that Savannah Laudy had indeed worn a dazzling display of jewelry at dinner the evening before. A representative of the Orient Express had flown to Milan. You cannot detain this train any longer, he insisted. We are already far behind schedule. Inspector Ricci was defeated. He had no excuse for holding the train any further. There was nothing more he could do. The only explanation he could think of was that somehow, during the night, the thief had tossed the jewels off the train to a waiting confederate. But could it have happened that way? The timing would have been impossible. The thief could not have known in advance when the corridor would be clear, when a conductor or passenger might be prowling about, what time the train would be at some deserted assignation point. This was a mystery beyond the inspector's power to solve. Let the train go on, he ordered. He stood watching helplessly as the Orient Express slowly pulled out of the station. With it went his promotion, his raise, and a blissful orgy with Silvana Laudi. The sole topic of conversation in the breakfast car was the robbery. It's the most exciting thing that's happened to me in years, confessed a prim teacher at a girl's school. She fingered a small gold necklace with a tiny diamond chip. I'm lucky they didn't take this. Very, Tracy gravely agreed. When Alberta Fornati walked into the dining car, he caught sight of Tracy and hurried over to her. You know what happened, of course. But did you know it was Fanati's wife who was robbed? No. Yes. My life was in great danger. A gang of thieves crept into my cabin and chloroformed me. Fanati could have been murdered in his sleep. How terrible. E una bella fragatura. Now I shall have to replace all of Savagna's jewelry. It's going to cost me a fortune. The police didn't find the jewels? No. But Fronati knows how the thieves got rid of them. Really? How? He looked around and lowered his voice. An accomplice was waiting at one of the stations we passed during the night. The ladri threw the jewels out of the train. And that go, it was done. Tracy said admiringly, How clever of you to figure that out. See, si. he raised his eyebrows meaningfully. You will not forget our little tryst in Venezia. Oh, how could I? Tracy smiled. He squeezed her arm hard. Fornati is looking forward to it. Now I must go console Sylvania. She is hysterical. When the Orient Express arrived at the Santa Lucia station in Venice, Tracy was among the first passengers to disembark. She had her luggage taken directly to the airport and was on the next plane to London with Savannah Laudy's jewelry. Gunther Hartog was going to be pleased. Chapter 23 The seven-story headquarters building of Interpol, the International Criminal Police Organization, is at 26 Rue Amangol in the hills of Saint Cloud, about six miles west of Paris, discreetly hidden behind a high green fence and white stone walls. The gate at the street entrance is locked 24 hours a day, and visitors are admitted only after being scrutinized through a closed-circuit television system. Inside the building, at the head of the stairs at each floor, are white iron gates which are locked at night, and every floor is equipped with a separate alarm system and closed-circuit television. The extraordinary security is mandatory, for within this building are kept the world's most elaborate dossiers with files on two and a half million criminals. Interpol is a clearinghouse of information for 126 police forces in 78 countries and coordinates the worldwide activities of police forces in dealing with the swindlers, counterfeiters, narcotic smugglers, robbers, and murderers. It disseminates up to the second information by an updated bulletin called the Circulation, by radio, phototelegraphy, and early broad satellite. The Paris headquarters is manned by former detectives from the Sûreté Nationale or the Paris Préfecture. On an early May morning, a conference was underway in the office of Inspector André Trignon, in charge of Interpol headquarters. The office was comfortable and simply furnished, and the view was breathtaking. In the far distance to the east, the Eiffel Tower loomed, and in another direction the white dome of the Sacre Coeur in Montmartre was clearly visible. The inspector was in his mid-forties, an attractive, authoritative figure, with an intelligent face, dark hair, 
and shrewd brown eyes behind black horn rim glasses. Seated in the office with him were detectives from England, Belgium, France, and Italy. Gentlemen, Inspector Trunel said, I have received urgent requests from each of your countries for information about the rash of crimes that has recently sprung up all over Europe. Half a dozen countries have been hit by an epidemic of ingenious windows and burglaries, in which there are several similarities. The victims are of unslavery reputation, there is never violence involved, and the perpetrator is always a female. We have reached the conclusion that we are facing an international gang of women. We have identified pictures based on the descriptions by victims and random witnesses. As you will see, none of the women in the pictures is alike. Some are blonde, some are brunette. They have variously been reported as being English, French, Spanish, Italian, American, or Texan. Inspector Trignon pressed a switch, and a series of pictures began to appear on the wall screen. Here you see a identikit sketch of a brunette with short hair. He pressed the button again. Here is a young blonde with a shag cut. Here is another blonde with a perm, a brunette with a page boy. Here is an older woman with a French twist, a young woman with blonde streaks, an older woman with a coupe sauvage. He turned off the projector. An older woman with a coup sauvage. He turned off the projector. We have no idea who the gang leader is or where their headquarters is located. They never leave any clues behind, and they vanish like smoke rings. Sooner or later, we will catch one of them, and when we do, we shall get them all. In the meantime, gentlemen... Until one of you can furnish us with some specific information, I am afraid we are at a dead end. When Daniel Cooper's plane landed in Paris, he was met at Rosé Charles de Gaulle Airport by one of Inspector Trignol's assistants and driven to the Prince de Galais, next door to its more illustrious sister hotel, the George Sank. It is arranged for you to meet Inspector Trignol tomorrow, his escort told Cooper. I will pick you up at uh, 8.15. Daniel Cooper had not been looking forward to the trip to Europe. He intended to finish his assignment as quickly as possible and return home. He knew about the flesh pots of Paris, and he had no intention of becoming involved. He checked into his room and went directly into the bathroom. To his surprise, the bathtub was satisfactory. In fact, he admitted to himself it was much larger than the one at home. He ran the bath water and went into the bedroom to unpack. Near the bottom of his suitcase was a small locked box, safe between its extra suit and his underwear. He picked up the box and held it in his hands, staring at it, and it seemed to pulse with a life of its own. He carried it into the bathroom and placed it on the sink. With the tiny key dangling from his key ring, he unlocked the box and opened it, and the words screamed up at him from the yellowed newspaper clipping. Boy testifies in murder trial. Twelve-year-old Daniel Cooper today testified in the trial of Fred Zimmer, accused of the rape murder of the young boy's mother. According to his testimony, the boy returned home from school and saw Zimmer, a next-door neighbor, leaving the Cooper home with blood on his hands and face. When the boy entered his home, he discovered the body of his mother in the bathtub. She had been savagely stabbed to death. Zimmer confessed to being Mrs. Cooper's lover, but denied that he had killed her. The young boy has been placed in the care of an aunt. Daniel Cooper's trembling hands dropped the clipping back into the box and locked it. He looked around wildly. The walls and ceiling of the hotel bathroom were spattered with blood. He saw his mother's naked body floating in the red water. He felt a wave of vertigo and clutched the sink. The screams inside him became guttural moans, and he frantically tore off his clothes and sank down into the blood-warm bath. "'I must inform you, Mr. Cooper,' Inspector Trignon said." that your position here is most unusual. You are not a member of any police force, and your presence here is unofficial. However, we have been requested by the police departments of several European countries to extend our cooperation. Daniel Cooper said nothing. As I understand it, you are an investigator for the International Insurance Protective Association, a consortium of insurance companies, 
Some of our European clients have had heavy losses lately. I was told there are no clues. Inspector Twignol sighed. I'm afraid that is the case. We know we are dealing with a gang of very clever women. But beyond that, no information from informers. No, nothing. Doesn't that strike you as odd? What do you mean, monsieur? It seems so obvious to Cooper that he did not bother to keep the impatience out of his voice. When a gang is involved, there's always someone who talks too much, drinks too much, spends too much. It's impossible for a large group of people to keep a secret. Would you mind giving me your files on this gang? The inspector started to refuse. He thought Daniel Cooper was one of the most physically unattractive men he had ever met, and certainly the most arrogant. He was going to be a chiali, a pain in the ass. But the inspector had been asked to cooperate fully. Reluctantly, he said, I will have copies made for you. He spoke into the intercom and gave the order. To make conversation, Inspector Trignon said, An interesting report just crossed my desk. Some valuable jewels were stolen aboard the Orient Express while it... I read about it. The thief made a fool of the Italian police. No one has been able to figure out how the robbery was accomplished. It's obvious, Danny Cooper said rudely. A matter of simple logic. Inspector Trignon looked over his glasses in surprise. Mon Dieu, he has the manners of a pig. He continued coolly. In this case, logic does not help. Every inch of that train was examined, and the employees, passengers, and all the luggage searched. No, Daniel Cooper contradicted. This man is crazy, Inspector Trignon decided. No what? They didn't search all the luggage. And I tell you they did, Inspector Trignon insisted. I have seen the police report. The woman from whom the jewels were stolen, Savani Lauri. We? Oui? She had placed her jewels in an overnight case from which they were taken. That is correct. Did the police search Miss Lowry's luggage? Only her overnight case. She was the victim. Why should they search her luggage? Because that's logically the only place the thief could have hidden the jewels, in the bottom of one of her other suitcases. He probably had a duplicate case, and when all the luggage was piled on the platform at the Venice station, all he had to do was exchange suitcases and disappear. Daniel Cooper rose. If those reports are ready, I'll be running along. Thirty minutes later, Inspector Trignon was speaking to Alberto Fonati in Venice. Monsieur, the inspector said, I was calling to inquire whether there happened to be any problem with your wife's luggage when you arrived in Venice. Si, si. Fonati complained. The idiot porter got her suitcase mixed up with someone else's. When my wife opened her bag at the hotel, it contained nothing but a lot of old magazines. I reported it to the uffici of the Orient Express. Have they located my wife's suitcase? He asked hopefully. No, monsieur, the inspector said. And he added silently to himself, Nor would I expect it if I were you. When he completed the telephone call, he sat back in his chair thinking, This Daniel Cooper is très formidable, very formidable indeed. Chapter 24 Tracy's house in Eaton Square was a heaven. It was in one of the most beautiful areas in London, with old Georgian houses facing tree-filled private parks. Nannies in stiffly starched uniforms wheeled their small charges and status-named prams along the gravel paths, and children played their games. I miss Amy, Tracy thought. Tracy walked along the storied old streets and shopped at the greengrocers and the chemist on Elizabeth Street. She marveled at the variety of brilliantly colored flowers sold outside the little shops. Gunther Hartog saw to it that Tracy contributed to the right charities and met the right people. She dated wealthy dukes and impoverished earls and had numerous proposals of marriage. She was young and beautiful and rich, and she seemed so vulnerable. Everyone thinks you are a perfect target, Gunther laughed. You've really done splendidly for yourself, Tracy. You're set now. You have everything you'll ever need. It was true. She had money in safe deposit boxes all over Europe, the house in London, and a chalet in St. Moritz. Everything she would ever need, 
except for someone to share it with. Tracy thought of the life she had almost had, with a husband and a baby. Would that ever be possible for her again? She could never reveal to any man who she really was, nor could she live a lie by concealing her past. She had played so many parts, she was no longer sure who she really was, but she did know that she could never return to the life she had once had. It's all right, Tracy thought defiantly. A lot of people are lonely. Gunther is right. I have everything. She was giving a cocktail party the following evening, the first since her return from Venice. I'm looking forward to it, Gunther told her. Your parties are the hottest ticket in London. Tracy said fondly, Look who my sponsor is. Who's going to be there? Everybody, Tracy told him. Everybody turned out to be one more guest than Tracy had anticipated. She had invited the Baroness Haworth, an attractive young heiress, and when Tracy saw the Baroness arrive, she walked over to greet her. The greeting died on Tracy's lips. With the Baroness was Jeff Stevens. Tracy, darling, I don't believe you know Mr. Stevens. Jeff, this is Mrs. Tracy Whitney, your hostess. Tracy said stiffly, How do you do, Mr. Stevens? Jeff took Tracy's hand, holding it in a fraction longer than necessary. Mrs. Tracy Whitney, he said. Of course. I was a friend of your husband's. We were together in India. Isn't that exciting? Baroness Haworth exclaimed. Strange. He never mentioned you, Tracy said coolly. Didn't you really? I'm surprised. Interesting old fella. Pity he had to go the way he did. Oh, what happened? Baroness Haworth asked. Tracy glared at Jeff. It was nothing, really. Nothing, Jeff said reproachfully. If I remember correctly, he was hanged in India. Pakistan, Tracy said tightly. And I believe I do remember my husband mentioning you. How is your wife? Baroness Haworth looked at Jeff. You never mentioned that you were married, Jeff. Cecily and I are divorced. Tracy smiled sweetly. I meant Rose. Oh, that wife. Baroness Haworth was astonished. You've been married twice? Once, he said easily. Rose and I got an annulment. We were very young. He started to move away. Tracy asked, But weren't there twins? Baroness Haworth exclaimed, Twins? They live with their mother, Jeff told her. He looked at Tracy. I can't tell you how pleasant it's been talking to you, Mrs. Whitney, but we mustn't monopolize you. And he took the Baroness's hand and walked away. The following morning, Tracy ran into Jeff in an elevator at Harrods. The store was crowded with shoppers. Tracy got off at the second floor. As she left the elevator, she turned to Jeff and said in a loud, clear voice, By the way, how did you ever come out on that morals charge? The door closed, and Jeff was trapped in an elevator filled with indignant strangers. Tracy lay in bed that night thinking about Jeff, and she had to laugh. He really was a charmer, a scoundrel. But an engaging one. She wondered what his relationship with Baroness Haworth was. She knew very well what his relationship with Baroness Haworth was. Jeff and I are two of a kind, Tracy thought. Neither of them would ever settle down. The life they led was too exciting and stimulating and rewarding. She turned her thoughts toward her next job. It was going to take place in the south of France, and it would be a challenge. Gunther had told her that the police were looking for a gang. She fell asleep with a smile on her lips. In his hotel room in Paris, Daniel Cooper was reading the reports Inspector Trignon had given him. It was 4 a.m., and Cooper had been poring over the papers for hours, analyzing the imaginative mix of robberies and swindles. Some of the scams Cooper was familiar with, but others were new to him. As Inspector Trignon had mentioned, all the victims had unsavory reputations. This gang apparently thinks they're Robin Hood. Cooper reflected. He had nearly finished. There were only three reports left. The one on top was headed Brussels. Cooper opened the cover and glanced at the report. Two million dollars worth of jewelry had been stolen from the wall safe of a Mr. Van Ryzen, a Belgian stockbroker.
who had been involved in some questionable financial dealings. The owners were away on vacation, and the house was empty, and Cooper caught something on the page that made his heart quicken. He went back to the first sentence and began rereading the report, focusing on every word. This one varied from the others in one significant respect. The burglar had set off an alarm, and when the police arrived, they were greeted at the door by a woman wearing a filmy negligee. Her hair was tucked into a curler cap, and her face was thickly covered with cold cream. She claimed to be a house guest of the Van Risens. The police accepted her story, and by the time they were able to check it out with the absent owners, the woman and the jewelry had vanished. Cooper laid down the report. Logic. Logic. Inspector Twignol was losing his patience. You're wrong, I tell you. It's impossible for one woman to be responsible for all these crimes. There's a way to check it out, Daniel Cooper said. How? I'd like to see a computer run on the dates and locations of the last few burglaries and swindles that fit into this category. This simple enough, but next, I would like to get an immigration report on every female American tourist who was in those same cities at the times the crimes were committed. It's possible that she uses false passports some of the time, but the probabilities are that she also uses her real identity. Inspector Trion was thoughtful. I see your line of reasoning, monsieur. He studied the little man before him and found himself half hoping that Cooper was mistaken. He was much too sure of himself. Very well. I will set the wheels in motion. The first burglary in the series had been committed in Stockholm. The report from Interpol Sekti on Rixbola Stil Ralston, the Interpol branch in Sweden, listed the American tourists in Stockholm that week, and the names of the women were fed into a computer. The next city checked was Milan. When the names of American women tourists in Milan, at the time of the burglary, was cross-checked with the names of women who had been in Stockholm during that burglary, there were 55 names on the list. That list was checked against the names of female Americans who had been in Ireland during a swindle, and the list was reduced to 15. Inspector Trignon handed the printout to Daniel Cooper. I'll start checking these names against the Berlin swindle, Inspector Trignon said, and... Daniel Cooper looked up. Don't bother. The name at the top of the list was Tracy Whitney. With something concrete finally to go on, Interpol went into action. Red circulations, which meant top priority, were sent to each member nation, advising them to be on the lookout for Tracy Whitney. We'll also teletyping green notices, Inspector Trignon told Cooper. Green notices? We use a color code system. A red circulation is top priority. Blue is an inquiry for information about a suspect. A green notice puts police departments on warning that an individual is under suspicion and should be watched. Black is an inquiry into unidentified bodies. XD signals that the message is very urgent, while D is urgent. No matter what country Miss Whitney goes to, from the moment she checks through customs, she will be under observation. The following day, telephoto pictures of Tracy Whitney from the Southern Louisiana Penitentiary for Women were in the hands of Interpol. Daniel Cooper put in a call to J.J. Reynolds' home. The phone rang a dozen times before it was answered. Hello. I need some information. Is that you, Cooper? For Christ's sakes, it's four o'clock in the morning here. I was sound at... I want you to send me everything you can find on Tracy Whitney. Press clippings, videotapes, everything. What's happening over... Cooper had hung up. One day I'm going to kill the son of a bitch, Reynolds swore. Before, Daniel Cooper had been only casually interested in Tracy Whitney. Now she was his assignment. He taped her photographs on the walls of his small Paris hotel room and read all the newspaper accounts about her. He rented a video cassette player and ran and re-ran the television news shots of Tracy after her sentencing and after her release from prison. Cooper sat in his darkened room hour after hour, looking at the film, and the first glimmering of suspicion became a certainty. You're the gang of women, Miss Whitney, Daniel Cooper said aloud. Then he flicked the rewind button of the cassette player once more. Chapter 25 Every year, on the first Saturday in June, 
The Count de Matignon sponsored a charity ball for the benefit of the Children's Hospital in Paris. Tickets for the white tie affair were a thousand dollars apiece, and society's elite flew in from all over the world to attend. The Chateau de Matigny at Catantibes was one of the show places of France. The carefully manicured grounds were superb, and the chateau itself dated back to the 15th century. On the evening of the fete, the grand ballroom and the petite ballroom were filled with beautifully dressed guests and smartly liveried servants offering endless glasses of champagne. Huge buffet tables were set up, displaying an astonishing array of hors d'oeuvres on Georgian silver platters. Tracy, looking ravishing in a white lace gown, her hair dressed high and held in place by a diamond tiara, was dancing with her host, Count de Matigny, a widower in his late sixties, small and trim with pale, delicate features. The benefit ball the Count gives each year for the children's hospital is a racket, Gunther Hotog had told Tracy. Ten percent of the money goes to the children. Ninety percent goes into his pocket. You are a superb dancer, Duchess, the Count said. Tracy smiled. That's because of my partner. How is it that you and I have not met before? I've been living in South America, Tracy explained. In the jungles, I'm afraid. Why on earth? My husband owns a few mines in Brazil. Ah, and is your husband here this evening? No, unfortunately, he had to stay in Brazil and take care of business. Unlucky for him, eh? Lucky for me. His arm tightened around her waist. I look forward to our becoming very good friends. And I too, Tracy murmured. Over the Count's shoulder, Tracy suddenly caught sight of Jeff Stevens, looking suntanned and ridiculously fit. He was dancing with a beautiful willowy brunette in crimson taffeta, who was clinging to him possessively. Jeff saw Tracy at the same moment and smiled. The bastard has every reason to smile, Tracy thought grimly. During the previous two weeks, Tracy had meticulously planned two burglaries. She had broken into the first house and opened the safe, only to find it empty. Jeff Stevens had been there first. On the second occasion, Tracy was moving through the grounds toward the targeted house when she heard the sudden acceleration of a car and caught a glimpse of Jeff as he sped away. He had beaten her to it again. He was infuriating. Now he's here at the house I'm planning to burgle next, Tracy thought. Jeff and his partner danced nearer. Jeff smiled and said, Good evening, Count. The Count de Martigny smiled. Ah, Jeffrey, good evening. I'm so pleased that you could come. I wouldn't have missed it. Jeff indicated the voluptuous-looking woman in his arms. This is Miss Wallace, the Count de Martigny. Enchanté, the Count indicated Tracy. Duchess, may I present Miss Wallace and Mr. Jeffrey Stevens, the Duchess de la Rosa. Jeff's eyebrows raised, questioningly. Sorry, I didn't hear the name. De la Rosa, Tracy said evenly. De la Rosa, De la Rosa. Jeff was studying Tracy. That name seems so familiar. Of course, I know your husband. Is the dear fellow here with you? He's in Brazil. Tracy found that she was gritting her teeth. Jeff smiled. Ah, too bad. We used to go hunting together before he had his accident, of course. Accident? The Count asked. Yeah. Jeff's tone was rueful. His gun went off and shot him in a very sensitive area. It was one of those stupid things. He turned to Tracy. Is there any hope that he'll ever be normal again? Tracy said tonelessly, I'm sure that one day he'll be as normal as you are, Mr. Stevens. Ah, oh, good. You will give him my best regards when you talk to him, won't you, Duchess? The music stopped. The Count de Martinet apologized to Tracy. If you'll excuse me, my dear, I have a few hostile duties to attend to. He squeezed her hand. Don't forget you're seated at my table. As the Count moved away, Jeff said to his companion, Angel, you put some aspirin in your bag, didn't you? Could you get one for me? I'm afraid I'm getting a terrible headache. Oh, my poor darling. There was an adoring look in her eyes. I'll be right back, sweetheart. Tracy watched her slink across the floor. 
Aren't you afraid she'll give you diabetes? She is sweet, isn't she? And how have you been lately, Duchess? Tracy smiled for the benefit of those around her. That's really none of your concern, is it? Ah, but it is. In fact, I'm concerned enough to give you some friendly advice. Don't try to rob this chateau. Why? Are you planning to do it first? Jeff took Tracy's arm and walked her over to a deserted spot near the piano, where a dark-eyed young man was soulfully massacring American show tunes. Only Tracy could hear Jeff's voice over the music. As a matter of fact, I was planning a little something, but it's too dangerous. Really? Tracy was beginning to enjoy the conversation. It was a relief to be herself, to stop play-acting. The Greeks had the right word for it, Tracy thought. Hypocrite was from the Greek word for actor. Listen to me, Tracy, Jeff's tone was serious. Don't try this. First of all, you never get through the grounds alive. A killer god dog is let loose at night. Suddenly Tracy was listening intently. Jeff was planning to rob the place. Every window and door is wired. The alarms connect directly to the police station. Even if you did manage to get inside the house, the whole place is crisscrossed with invisible infrared beams. I know all that. Tracy was a little smug. Then you must also know that the beam doesn't sound the alarm when you step into it. It sounds the alarm when you step out of it. It senses the heat change. There's no way you can get through it without setting it off. She had not known that. How had Jeff learned of it? Why are you telling me all this? He smiled, and she thought he had never looked more attractive. I really don't want you to get caught, Duchess. I like having you around. You know, Tracy, you and I could become very good friends. You're wrong, Tracy assured him. She saw Jeff State hurrying toward them. Here comes Ms. Diabetes. Enjoy yourself. As Tracy walked away, she heard Jeff State say, I brought you some champagne to wash it down with, poor baby. The dinner was sumptuous. Each course was accompanied by the appropriate wine, impeccably served by white glove footmen. The first course was a native asparagus with a white truffle sauce, followed by a consomme with delicate morals. After that came a saddle of lamb with an assortment of fresh vegetables from the Count's gardens. A Chris Endive salad was next. For dessert, there were individually molded ice cream servings with a silver appelnier, piled high with petit fours. Coffee and brandy came last. Cigars were offered to the men, and the women were given joy perfume in a baccarat crystal flacon. After dinner, the Count de Martinier turned to Tracy. You mentioned that you were interested in seeing some of my paintings. Would you like to take a look now? I'd love to, Tracy assured him. The picture gallery was a private museum, filled with Italian masters, French impressionists, and Picassos. The long hall was ablaze with bewitching colors and forms painted by immortals. There were Monets and Renoirs, Canalettos and Gardis, and Tintorettos. There was an exquisite Tiepolo and Gersino and Titian, and there was almost a full wall of Cezanne. There was no calculating the value of the collection. Tracy stared at the paintings a long time, savoring their beauty. I hope these are all well guarded, the Count smiled. On three occasions, thieves have tried to get at my treasures. One was killed by my dog, the second was maimed, and the third is serving a left home in prison. The chateau is an invulnerable fortress, Duchess. I'm so relieved to hear that, Count. There was a bright flash of light from outside. The fireworks display is beginning, the Count said. I think you'll be amused. He took Tracy's soft hand in his papery dry one and led her out of the picture gallery. I am leaving for Duville in the morning, where I have a villa on the sea. I've invited a few friends down next weekend. You might enjoy it. I'm sure I would, Tracy said regretfully. But I'm afraid my husband is getting restless. He insists that I return. The fireworks display lasted for almost an hour, and Tracy took advantage of the distraction to reconnoiter the house. What Jeff had said was true. The odds against a successful burglary was formidable. But for that very reason, Tracy found the challenge irresistible. She knew that upstairs in the Count's bedroom were two million dollars in jewels and half a dozen masterpieces, including a Leonardo. 
The chateau is a treasure house, Gunther Hotchock had told her, and it's guarded like Van. Don't make a move unless you have a foolproof plan. Well, I've worked out a plan, Tracy thought. Whether it's foolproof or not, I'll know tomorrow. The following night was chilly and cloudy, and the high walls around the chateau appeared grim and forbidding, as Tracy stood in the shadows, wearing black coveralls, dumb-soled shoes, and supple black kid gloves, carrying a shoulder bag. For an unguarded moment, Tracy's mind embraced the memory of the walls of the penitentiary, and she gave an involuntary shiver. She had driven the rented van alongside the stone wall at the back of the estate. From the other side of the wall came a low, fierce growl that developed into a frenzied barking as the dog leapt into the air, trying to attack. Tracy visualized the Doberman's powerful heavy body and deadly teeth. She called out softly to someone in the van. Now! A slight, middle-aged man, also dressed in black, with a rucksack on his back, came out of the van holding onto a female Doberman. The dog was in season, and the tone of barking from the other side of the stone wall suddenly changed to an excited whine. Tracy helped lift the bitch to the top of the van, which was almost the exact height of the wall. One, two, three, she whispered, and the two of them tossed the bitch over the wall into the grounds of the estate. There were two sharp barks, followed by a series of snuffling noises, then the sound of the dogs running. After that, all was quiet. Tracy turned to her confederate. Let's go. The man, Jean-Louis, nodded. She had found him in Antibes. He was a thief who had spent most of his life in prison. Jean-Louis was not bright, but he was a genius with locks and alarms, perfect for this job. Tracy stepped from the roof of the van onto the top of the wall. She unrolled the scaling ladder and hooked it to the edge of the wall. They both moved down it onto the grass below. The estate appeared vastly different from the way it had looked the evening before, when it was brightly lit and crowded with laughing guests. Now, everything was dark and bleak, Jean-Louis trailed behind Tracy, keeping a fearful watch for the Dobermans. The chateau was covered with centuries-old ivy clinging to the wall up to the rooftop. Tracy had casually tested the ivy the evening before. Now as she put her weight on a vine, it held. She began to climb, scanning the grounds below. There was no sign of the dogs. I hope they stay busy for a long time, she prayed. When Tracy reached the roof, she signaled to Jean-Louis and waited until he climbed up beside her. From the pinpoint light Tracy switched on, they saw a glass skylight securely locked from below. As Tracy watched, Jean-Louis reached into the rucksack on his back and pulled out a small glass cutter. It took him less than one minute to remove the glass. Tracy glanced down and saw that their way was blocked by a spider web of alarm wires. Can you handle that, Jean? she whispered. Je peux faire ça. No problem. He reached into his pack and pulled out a foot-long wire with an alligator clamp on each end. Moving slowly, he traced the beginning of the alarm wire, stripped it, and connected the alligator clamp to the end of the alarm. He pulled out a pair of pliers and carefully cut the wire. Tracy tensed herself, waiting for the sound of the alarm, but all was quiet. Jean-Louis looked up and grinned. Voilà! Fini! Wrong, Tracy thought. This is just the beginning. They used a second scaling ladder to climb down through the skylight. So far, so good. They had made it safely into the attic. But when Tracy thought of what lay ahead, her heart began to pound. She pulled out two pairs of red lens goggles and handed one of them to Jean-Louis. Put these on. She had figured out a way to distract the Doberman, but the infrared ray alarms had proved to be a more difficult problem to solve. Jeff had been correct. The house was crisscrossed with invisible beams. Tracy took several long, deep breaths. Center your energy, your chi. Relax. She forced her mind into a crystal clarity. When a person moves into a beam, nothing happens. But the instant a person moves out of the beam, the sensor detects the difference in temperature, and the alarm is set off. It has been set to go off before the burglar opens the safe, leaving him no time to do anything before the police arrive. And there, Tracy had decided, was the weakness in the system. She had needed to devise a way to keep the alarm silent until after the safe was open. At 6.30 in the morning, she had found the solution. The burglary was possible, and Tracy had felt that familiar feeling of excitement begin to build within her. Now, she slipped the infrared goggles on, 
and instantly everything in the room took on an eerie red glow. In front of the attic door, Tracy saw a beam of light that would have been invisible without the glasses. Slip under it, she warned John Louis. Careful. They crawled under the beam and found themselves in a dark hallway leading to Count de Martinier's bedroom. Tracy flicked on the flashlight and led the way. Through the infrared goggles, Tracy saw another light beam, this one low across the threshold of the bedroom door. Gingerly, she jumped over it, and Jean Louis was right behind her. Tracy played her flashlight around the walls, and there were the paintings, impressive, awesome. Promise to bring me the Leonardo, Gunther had said, and of course the jewelry. Tracy took down the picture, turned it over, and laid it on the floor. She carefully removed it from its frame, rolled up the vellum, and stored it in her shoulder bag. All that remained now was to get into the safe, which stood in a curtain alcove at the far end of the bedroom. Tracy opened the curtains. Four infrared lights transversed the alcove, from the floor to the ceiling, crisscrossing one another. It was impossible to reach the safe without breaking one of the beams. Jean-Louis stared at the beams with dismay. Bon Dieu de merde! We can't get through those. They're too low to crawl under and too high to jump over. I want you to do just as I tell you, Tracy said. She stepped in back of him and put her arms tightly around his waist. Now, walk with me, left foot first. Together, they took a step toward the beams, then another. Jean-Louis breathed. Hello, we're going into them. Right. They moved directly into the center of the beams, where they converged and Tracy stopped. Now, listen carefully, she said. I want you to walk over to the safe. But the beams! Don't worry, it will be all right. She fervently hoped she was right. Hesitantly, John louis stepped out of the infrared beams. All was quiet. He looked back at Tracy with large, frightened eyes. She was standing in the middle of the beams, her body heat keeping the sensors from sounding the alarm. Jean Louis hurried over to the safe. Tracy stood stock still, aware that the instant she moved, the alarm would sound. Out of the corner of one eye, Tracy could see Jean Louis as he removed some tools from his pack and began to work on the dial of the safe. Tracy stood motionless, taking slow, deep breaths. Time stopped. Jean Louis seemed to be taken forever. The calf of Tracy's right leg began to ache, then went into spasm. Tracy gritted her teeth. She dared not move. How long? she whispered. Ten, fifteen minutes. It seemed to Tracy she had been standing there a lifetime. The leg muscles in her left leg were beginning to cramp. She felt like screaming from the pain. She was pinned in the beams, frozen. She heard a click. The safe was open. Magnifique! C'est la banque! Do you wish everything? Jean-Louis asked. No papers, only the jewels. Whatever cash is there is yours. Merci! Tracy heard Jean-Louis rifling through the safe and a few moments later he was walking toward her. Farm in a ball, he said. But how do we get out of here without breaking the beam? We don't, Tracy informed him. He stared at her. What? Stand in front of me. But do as I say. Panicky, Jean-Louis stepped into the beam. Tracy held her breath. Nothing happened. All right now, very slowly, we're going to back out of the room. And then... John louis eyes looked enormous behind the goggles. Then, my friend, we run for it. Inch by inch, they backed through the beams toward the curtains, where the beams began. When they reached them, Tracy took a deep breath. Right. When I say now, we go out the same way we came in. Jean louis swallowed and nodded. Tracy could feel his small body tremble. Now! Tracy spun around and raced toward the door. Jean louis after her. The instant they stepped out of the beams, the alarm sounded. The noise was deafening, shattering. Tracy streaked to the attic and scurried up the hook ladder, Jean-Louis close behind. They raced across the roof and clambered down the ivy, and the two of them sped across the grounds toward the wall, where the second ladder was waiting. Moments later, they reached the roof of the van and scurried down. Tracy leapt into the driver's seat, Jean-Louis at her side. As the van raced down the side road, Tracy saw a dark sedan parked under a grove of trees. For an instant, the headlights of the van lit the interior of the car. Behind the wheel sat Jeff Stevens. At his side was a large Doberman. Tracy laughed aloud and blew a kiss to Jeff as the van sped away. From the distance came the wail of approaching police sirens. 
Chapter 26 Biarritz, on the southwestern coast of France, has lost much of its turn-of-the-century glamour. The once-famed Casino Bellevue is closed for badly needed repairs, while the Casino Municipal en Rue Mazagran is now a run-down building housing small shops and a dancing school. The old villas on the hills have taken on a look of shabby gentility. Still, in high season, from July to September, the wealthy and titled of Europe continue to flock to Biarritz to enjoy the gambling and the sun and their memories. Those who do not have their own chateaus stay at the luxurious Hotel du Palais at 1 Avenue Imperatrice, the former summer residence of Napoleon III. The hotel is situated on a promontory over the Atlantic Ocean in one of nature's most spectacular settings, a lighthouse on one side, flanked by huge jagged rocks looming out of the gray ocean like prehistoric monsters, and the boardwalk on the other side. On an afternoon in late August, the French baroness, Marguerite de Chantilly, swept into the lobby of the Hotel du Palais. The baroness was an elegant young woman with a sleek cap of ash-blonde hair. She wore a green and white silk Givenchy dress that set off a figure that made the women turn and watch her enviously, and the men gape. The baroness walked up to the concierge. Ma clé, s'il vous plaît, she said. She had a charming French accent. Certainly, Baroness. He handed Tracy her key in several telephone messages. As Tracy walked toward the elevator, a bespectacled, rumbled-looking man turned abruptly away from the vitrine displaying her scarves and crashed into her, knocking the purse from her hand. Oh, dear, he said. I'm terribly sorry. He picked up her purse and handed it to her. Please, forgive me. He spoke with a middle European accent. The Baroness Marguerite de Chantilly gave him an imperious nod and moved on. An attendant ushered her into the elevator and led her off at the third floor. Tracy had chosen Suite 312, having learned that often the selection of the hotel accommodations was as important as the hotel itself. In Capri, it was Bungalow 522 in the Quisisana. In Mallorca, it was the Royal Suite of San Vida, overlooking the mountains and the distant bay. In New York, it was Tower Suite 4717 at the Helmsley Palace Hotel, and in Amsterdam, Room 325 at the Amstel, where one was lulled to sleep by the soothing lapping of the canal waters. Suite 312 at the Hotel du Palais had a panoramic view of both the ocean and the city. From every window, Tracy could watch the waves crashing against the timeless rocks protruding from the sea like drowning figures. Directly below her window was an enormous kidney-shaped swimming pool, its bright blue water clashing with the gray of the ocean, and next to it a large terrace with umbrellas to ward off the summer sun. The walls of the suite were upholstered in blue and white silk damask with marble baseboards, and the rugs and curtains were the color of faded sweetheart roses. The wood of the doors and shutters was stained with the soft pentina of time. When Tracy had locked the door behind her, she took off the tight-fitting blonde wig and massaged her scalp. The Baroness persona was one of her best. There were hundreds of titles to choose from, and Debritz Peerage and Baronetage, and the Almanac de Gotha. There were ladies and duchesses, and princesses and baronesses, and countesses by the score, from two dozen countries, and the books were invaluable to Tracy, for they gave her family histories dating back centuries, with the names of fathers and mothers and children schools and houses, and addresses of family residences. It was a simple matter to select a prominent family and become a distant cousin, particularly a wealthy distant cousin. People were so impressed by titles and money. Tracy thought of the stranger who had bumped into her in the hotel lobby and smiled. It had begun. At eight o'clock that evening, the Baroness Marguerite de Chantilly was seated in the hotel's bar when the man who had collided with her earlier approached her table. Excuse me, he said diffidently, but I must apologize again for my inexcusable clumsiness this afternoon. Tracy gave him a gracious smile. That's quite all right. It was an accident. You are most kind, he hesitated. I would feel much better if you would permit me to buy you a drink. Oui, if you wish. He slid into a chair opposite her. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Professor Adolf Zuckerman. Marguerite de Chantilly. Zuckerman signaled the captain. What are you drinking? 
Zuckerman asked Tracy. Champagne. But perhaps... He raised a reassuring hand. I can afford it. In fact, I am on the verge of being able to afford anything in the world. Really? Tracy gave him a small smile. How nice for you. Yes. Zuckerman ordered a bottle of Bollinger, then turned to Tracy. The most extraordinary thing has happened to me. I really should not be discussing this with a stranger, but it is too exciting to keep to myself. He leaned closer and lowered his voice. To tell you the truth, I am simple school teacher, or I was until recently. I teach history. It is most enjoyable. You understand, but not too exciting. She listened, a look of polite interest in her face. That is to say, it was not exciting until a few months ago. May I ask what, uh, happened a few months ago, Professor Zuckerman? I was doing research on the Spanish Amada, looking for odd bits and pieces that might make the subject more interesting for my students. And in the archives of the local museum, I came across an old document that had somehow gotten mixed in with other papers. It gave the details of a secret expedition that Prince Philip sent out in 1588. One of the ships loaded with gold bullion was supposed to have sunk in a storm and vanished without a trace. Tracy looked at him thoughtfully. Supposed to have sunk? Exactly. But according to those records, the captain and crew deliberately sank the ship in a deserted cove, planning to come back later and retrieve the treasure, but they were attacked and killed by pirates before they could return. The documents survived only because none of the sailors on the pirate ship could read or write. They did not know the significance of what they had. His voice was trembling with excitement. Now, he lowered his voice and looked around to make sure it was safe to continue. I have the document with detailed instructions on how to get to the treasure. What a fortunate discovery for you, Professor. There was a note of admiration in her voice. The gold bullion is probably worth fifty million dollars today, Zuckerman said. All I have to do is bring it up. What is stopping you? He gave an embarrassed shrug. Money. I must stop the ship to bring the treasure to the surface. I see. How much would that uh, cost? A hundred thousand dollars. I must confess I did something extremely foolish. I took twenty thousand dollars, my life savings, and came to Biarritz to gamble at the casino, hoping to win enough to... His voice trailed off. And you lost it? He nodded. Tracy saw the glint of tears behind his spectacles. The champagne arrived, and the captain popped the cork and poured the golden liquid into their glasses. Bon chance, Tracy toasted. Thank you. They sipped their drinks in contemplative silence. Please forgive me for boring you with all this, Zuckerman said. I should not be telling a beautiful lady my troubles. But I find your stories fascinating, she assured him. You are sure the gold is there, we? Oui? Beyond a shadow of doubt, I have the original shipping orders and a map drawn by the captain himself. I know the exact location of the treasure. She was studying him with a thoughtful expression on her face. But uh, you need a hundred thousand dollars? Zuckerman chuckled ruefully. Yes, for a treasure worth fifty million. He took another sip of his drink. C'est possible. She stopped. What? Have you considered taking in a partner? He looked at her in surprise. A partner? No. I plan to do this alone. But of course, now that I've lost my money... His voice trailed off again. Professor Zuckerman... Suppose I were to give you the hundred thousand dollars. He shook his head. Absolutely not, Baroness. I could not permit that. You might lose your money. But if you sure the treasure is there? Oh, of that I am positive. But a hundred things could go wrong. There are no guarantees. In life, there are few guarantees. 
Your problem is très intéressant. Perhaps if I help you solve it, it could be lucrative for both of us. No, I could never forgive myself if by any remote chance you should lose your money. I can afford it, she assured him. And I would stand to make a great deal on my investment, n'est-ce sais pas? Of course there is that side of it, Zuckerman admitted. He sat there weighing the matter, obviously torn with doubts. Finally, he said, If that is what you wish, you will be a fifty-fifty partner. She smiled. Please. D'accord. I accept. The professor added quickly, After uh, expenses, of course. Naturalement. How soon can we get started? Immediately. The professor was charged with a sudden vitality. I have already found the boat I want to use. It has a modern dredging equipment and a crew of four. Of course, we will have to give them a small percentage of whatever we bring up. Bien sûr. We should get started as quickly as possible, or we might lose the boat. I can have the money for you in five days. Wonderful! Zuckerman exclaimed. That will give me time to make all the preparations. Ah, this was a fortuitous meeting for both of us, was it not? We, oui, sans doute. To our adventure. The professor raised his glass. Tracy raised hers and toasted. May it prove to be as profitable as I feel it will be. They clinked glasses. Tracy looked across the room and froze. At a table in the far corner was Jeff Stevens, watching her with an amused smile on his face. With him was an attractive woman ablaze with jewels. Jeff nodded to Tracy, and she smiled, remembering how she had last seen him outside the Dumontigny estate with that silly dog beside him. That was one for me. Tracy thought happily. So, if you will excuse me, Zuckerman was saying, I have much to do. I will be in touch with you. Tracy graciously extended her hand, and he kissed it and departed. I see your friend has deserted you, and I can't imagine why. You look absolutely terrific as a blonde. Tracy glanced up. Jeff was standing beside her table. He sat down in the chair Adolf Zuckerman had occupied a few minutes earlier. Congratulations, Jeff said. The de Martini caper was ingenious, very neat. Coming from you, that's a high praise, Jeff. You're costing me a lot of money, Tracy. You'll get used to it. He toyed with the glass in front of him. What did、uh, Professor Zuckerman want? Oh, you know him. You might say that. He、uh, just wanted to have a drink. And tell you all about his sunken treasure? Tracy was suddenly wary. How do you know about that? Jeff looked at her in surprise. Don't tell me you fell for it. It's the oldest con game in the world. Not this time. You mean you believed him? Tracy said stiffly. I'm not at liberty to discuss it, but the professor happens to have some inside information. Jeff shook his head in disbelief. Tracy, he's trying to take you. How much did he ask you to invest in his sunken treasure? Never mind, Tracy said primly. It's my money and my business. Jeff shrugged. Right. Just don't say old Jeff didn't try to warn you. It couldn't be that you're interested in that gold for yourself, could it? He threw up his hands in mock despair. Why are you always so suspicious of me? It's simple, Tracy replied. I don't trust you. Who was the woman you were with? She instantly wished she could have withdrawn the question. Suzanne? A friend. Rich, of course. Jeff gave her a lazy smile. As a matter of fact, I think she does have a bit of money. If you'd like to join us for luncheon tomorrow, the chef on her 250 foot yacht in the harbor makes a Thank you. I wouldn't dream of interfering with your lunch. What are you selling her? That's personal. I'm sure it is. It came out harsher than she had intended. Tracy studied him over the rim of her glass. He really was too damn attractive. He had clean, regular features, beautiful gray eyes with long lashes, and the heart of a snake, a very intelligent snake. 
Have you ever thought of going into a legitimate business? Tracy asked. You'd probably be very successful. Jeff looked shocked. What? And give up all this? You must be joking. Have you always been a con artist? Con artist? I'm an entrepreneur, he said reprovingly. How did you become an entrepreneur? I ran away from home when I was fourteen and joined a carnival. At fourteen. It was the first glimpse Tracy had had into what lay beneath a sophisticated, charming veneer. It was good for me. I learned to cope. When that wonderful war in Vietnam came along, I joined up as a Green Beret and got an advanced education. I think the main thing I learned was that the war was the biggest con of all. Compared to that, you and I are amateurs. He changed the subject abruptly. Do you like pelota? If you're selling it, no thank you. It's a game. A variation of Hialeah. I have two tickets for tonight and Susan can't make it. Would you like to go? Tracy found herself saying yes. They dined at a little restaurant in the town square, where they had a local wine and confit de canard et l'aile. Roast duck simmered in its own juices with roasted potatoes and garlic. It was delicious. The specialty of the house, Jeff informed Tracy. They discussed politics and books and travel, and Tracy found Jeff surprisingly knowledgeable. When you're on your own at fourteen, Jeff told her, you pick up things fast. First you learn what motivates you, then you learn what motivates other people. A con game is similar to jiu-jitsu. In jiu-jitsu, you use your opponent's strength to win. In a con game, you use his greed. You make the first move, and he does the rest of your work for you. Tracy smiled, wondering if Jeff had any idea how much alike they were. She enjoyed being with him, but she was sure that given the opportunity, he would not hesitate to double-cross her. He was a man to be careful of, and that she intended to be. The front on where Pelota was played was a large outdoor arena, the size of a football field, high in the hills of Biarritz. There were huge green concrete backboards at either end of the court, and playing area in the center, with four tiers of stone benches on both sides of the field. At dusk, floodlights were turned on. When Tracy and Jeff arrived, the stands were almost full, crowded with fans, as the two teams went into action. Members of each team took turns slamming the ball into the concrete wall and catching it on the rebound in their cestas, the long, narrow baskets strapped to their arms. Pelota was a fast, dangerous game. When one of the players missed the ball, the crowd screamed. They really take this very seriously, Tracy commented. A lot of money is bet on these games. The baths are a gambling race. As spectators kept filling in, the benches became more crowded, and Tracy found herself being pressed against Jeff. If he was aware of her body against his, he gave no sign of it. The pace and ferocity of the game seemed to intensify as the minutes passed, and the screams of the fans kept echoing through the night. Is it as dangerous as it looks? Tracy asked. Baroness, the ball travels through the air almost a hundred miles an hour. If you get hit in the head, you're dead. But it's rare for a player to miss. He patted her hand absently, his eyes glued to the action. The players were experts, moving gracefully in perfect control. But in the middle of the game, without warning, one of the players hurled the ball at the backboard at the wrong angle, and the lethal ball came hurtling straight toward the bench where Tracy and Jeff sat. The spectators scrambled for cover. Jeff grabbed Tracy and shoved her to the ground, his body covering hers. They heard the sound of the ball sailing directly over their heads and smashing into the side wall. Tracy lay on the ground, feeling the hardness of Jeff's body. His face was very close to hers. He held her a moment, then lifted himself up and pulled her to her feet. There was a sudden awkwardness between them. I, I think I've had enough excitement for one evening, Tracy said. I'd like to go back to my hotel, please. They said good night in the lobby. I enjoyed this evening, Tracy told Jeff. She meant it. Tracy, you're not really going ahead with Zuckerman's crazy sunken treasure scheme, are you? Yes, I am. He studied her for a long moment. You still think I'm after that gold, don't you? She looked him in the eye. Aren't you? His expression hardened. Good luck. Good night, Jeff. Tracy watched him turn and walk out of the hotel. She supposed he was on his way to see Susan. Poor woman. The concierge said, Ah, 
Good evening, Baroness. There is a message for you. It was from Professor Zuckerman. Adolf Zuckerman had a problem, a very large problem. He was sitting in the office of Armand Grangier, and Zuckerman was so terrified of what was happening that he discovered he had wet his pants. Grangier was the owner of an illegal private casino located in an elegant private villa at 123 Rue d'Afria. It made no difference to Grangier whether the casino municipal was closed or not, for the club at Rue de Fria was always filled with wealthy patrons. Unlike the government-supervised casinos, bets there were unlimited, and that was where the high rollers came to play, roulette, chamade de fer, and crafts. Grangier's customers included Arab princes, English nobility, oriental businessmen, African heads of state, Scantily clad young ladies circulated around the room, taking orders for complimentary champagne and whiskey, for Armand Grangier had learned long before that, more than any other class of people, the rich appreciated getting something for nothing. Grangier could afford to give drinks away. His roulette wheels and his card games were rigged. The club was usually filled with beautiful young women, escorted by older gentlemen with money, and sooner or later the women were drawn to Grangier. He was a miniature of a man, with perfect features, liquid brown eyes, and a soft, sensual mouth. He stood five feet four inches, and the combination of his looks and his small stature drew him in like a magnet. Grangier treated each one with a feigned admiration. I find you irresistible, Chargui, but, unfortunately for both of us, I am madly in love with someone. And it was true. Of course, that someone changed from week to week, for in Biarritz, there was an endless supply of beautiful young men, and Armand Grangier gave each one his brief place in the sun. Grangier's connections with the underworld and the police were powerful enough for him to maintain his casino. He had worked his way up from being a ticket runner for the mob to running drugs and finally to ruling his own little fiefdom in Biarritz. Those who opposed him found out too late how deadly the little man could be. Now, Adolf Zuckerman was being cross-examined by Armand Grangier, Tell me more about this baroness you talked into the second treasure scheme. From the furious tone of his voice, Zuckerman knew that something was wrong, terribly wrong. He swallowed and said, Well, she's a widow whose husband left her a lot of money, and she said she's going to come up with a hundred thousand dollars. The sound of his own voice gave him confidence to go on. Once we get the money, of course, we'll tell her that the salvage ship had an accident and that we need another fifty thousand. Then it'll be another hundred thousand, and you know, just like always. He saw the look of contempt in Armand Grangier's face. What? What's the problem, chief? The problem, said Grangier in a steely tone, is that I just received a call from one of my boys in Paris. He forged a passport for your baroness. Her name is Tracy Whitney, and she's an American. Zuckerman's mouth was suddenly dry. He licked his lips. She really seemed interested, chief. Balcano. She's a con artiste. You tried to pull a swindle and a swindler. Then wh why did she say yes? Why didn't she just turn it down? Armand Grangier's voice was icy. I don't know, professor, but I intend to find out. And when I do... I'm sending the lady for a swim in the bay. Nobody can make a fool out of Armand Grangier. Now, pick up the phone. Tell her a friend of yours has offered to put up half the money and that I'm on my way over to see her. Do you think you can handle that? Zuckerman said eagerly. Sure, chief, not to worry. I do worry. Armand Grangier said slowly, I worry a lot about you, Professor. Armand Grangier did not like mysteries. The sunken treasure game had been worked for centuries, but the victims had to be gullible. There was simply no way a con artist would ever fall for it. That was the mystery that bothered Grangier, and he intended to solve it. And when he had the answer, the woman would be turned over to Bruno Vicente. Vicente enjoyed playing games with his victims before disposing of them. Armand Grangier stepped out of the limousine. As it stopped in front of the Hotel du Palais, walked into the lobby. 
and approached Jules Berejac, the white-haired Basque who had worked at the hotel from the age of thirteen. What's the number of the Baroness Margarita Chantilly suite? There was a strict rule that desk clerks not divulge the room numbers of guests, but rules did not apply to Armand Grangier. Suite three twelve, Monsieur Grangier. Merci. And room three eleven. Grangier stopped. What? The Countess also has room adjoining her suite. Oh, who occupies it? No one. No one? Are you sure? Oui, Monsieur. She keeps it locked. The maids have been ordered to keep out. A puzzled frown appeared in Grangier's face. You have a pass key. Of course. Without an instant's hesitation, the concierge reached under the desk for a pass key and handed it to Armand Grangier. Jules watched as Armand Grangier walked toward the elevator. One never argued with a man like Grangier. When Armand Grangier reached the door of the Baroness's suite, he found it ajar. He pushed it open and entered. The living room was deserted. Hello, anyone here? A feminine voice from another room sang out, "I'm in the bath. I'll be with you in a minute. Please help yourself to a drink." Grangier wandered around the suite, familiar with its furnishings. For over the years, he had arranged for many of his friends to stay in the hotel. He strolled into the bedroom. Expensive jewelry was carelessly spread out on a dressing table. I won't be a minute," the voice called out from the bathroom. "No hurry, Baroness." Baroness Moncule, he thought angrily. Whatever little game you're playing, Cherie, is going to backfire. He walked over to the door that connected to the adjoining room. It was locked. Granger took out the pass key and opened the door. The room he stepped into had a musty, unused smell. The concierge had said that no one occupied it. Then why did she need? Granger's eye was caught by something oddly out of place: a heavy black electrical cord attached to a wall socket snaked along the length of the floor and disappeared into a closet. The door was open just enough to allow the cord to pass through. Curious, Granger walked over to the closet door and opened it. A row of wet hundred-dollar bills, held up by clothespins on a wire, was strung across the closet, hanging out to dry. On a typewriter stand was an object covered by a draped cloth. Granger flicked up the cloth. He uncovered a small printing press with a still wet hundred-dollar bill in it. Next to the press were sheets of blank paper the size of American currency and a paper cutter. Several one hundred-dollar bills that had been unevenly cut were scattered on the floor. An angry voice behind Granger demanded, "What are you doing in here?" Granger spun around. Tracy Whitney, her hair damp from the bath and wrapped in a towel, had come into the room. Armand Granger said softly. Counterfeit. You are going to pay us off with counterfeit money. He watched the expressions that played across her face: denial, outrage, and then defiance. All right, Tracy admitted, but it wouldn't have mattered. No one can tell these from the real thing. Come, it was going to be a pleasure to destroy this one. These bills are as good as gold. Really. There was contempt in Granger's voice. He pulled one of the wet bills from the wire and glanced at it. He looked at one side, then the other, and then examined them more closely. They were excellent. Who cut these dies? What's the difference? Look, I can have the hundred thousand dollars ready by Friday. Granger stared at her, puzzled, and when he realized what she was thinking, he laughed aloud. <laughs> oh, Jesus! He said, "You're really stupid." There's no treasure. Tracy was bewildered. What do you mean, no treasure? Professor Zuckerman told me. And you believed him? Shame, Baroness. He studied the bill in his hand again. I'll take this. Tracy shrugged. Take as many as you like. It's only paper. Granger grabbed a handful of the wet hundred-dollar bills. How do you know one of the maids won't walk in here? He asked. I pay them well to keep away, and when I'm out, I lock the closet. She is cool, Armand Granger thought, but it's not going to keep her alive. Don't leave the hotel, he ordered. I have a friend I want you to meet. 
Armand Grangier had intended to turn the woman over to Bruno Vicente immediately, but some instinct held him back. He examined one of the bills again. He had handled a lot of counterfeit money, but nothing nearly as good as this. Whoever cut the dies was a genius. The paper felt authentic, and the lines were crisp and clean. The colors remained sharp and fixed, even with the bill wet, and the picture of Benjamin Franklin was perfect. The bitch was right. It was hard to tell the difference between what he held in his hand and the real thing. Granger wondered whether it would be possible to pass it off as genuine currency. It was a tempting idea. He decided to hold off on Bruno Vicente for a while. Early the following morning, Armand Granger sent for Zuckerman and handed him one of the hundred-dollar bills. Go down to the bank and exchange this for francs. Sure, chief. Granger watched him hurry out of the office. This was Zuckerman's punishment for his stupidity. If he was arrested, he would never tell where he got the counterfeit bill, not if he wanted to live. But if he managed to pass the bill successfully, I'll see, Granger thought. Fifteen minutes later, Zuckerman returned to the office. He counted out a hundred dollars worth of French francs. Anything else, chief? Granger stared at the francs. Did you have any trouble? Trouble? No. Why? I want you to go back to the same bank, Granger ordered. This is what I want you to say. Adolf Zuckerman walked into the lobby of the Banque de France and approached the desk where the bank manager sat. This time Zuckerman was aware of the danger he was in, but he preferred facing that than Granger's wrath. Me, I help you? The manager asked. Yes. He tried to conceal his nervousness. You'll see, I got into a poker game last night with some Americans I met at the bar. He stopped. The bank manager nodded wisely. And you lost your money and perhaps wished to make a loan? No, Zuckerman said. As, as a matter of fact, I won. The only thing is, the men didn't look quite honest to me. He pulled out two hundred dollar bills. They paid me with these, and I'm afraid they... They might be counterfeit. Zuckerman held his breath as the bank manager leaned forward and took the bills in his pudgy hands. He examined them carefully, first one side and then the other, then held them up to the light. He looked at Zuckerman and smiled. You were lucky, monsieur. These bills are genuine. Zuckerman allowed himself to exhale. Thank God. Everything was going to be all right. No problem at all, chief. He said they were genuine. It was almost too good to be true. Armand Granger sat there thinking, a plan already half formed in his mind. Go get the Baroness. Tracy was seated in Armand Granger's office, facing him across his empire desk. You and I are going to be partners, Granger informed her. Tracy started to rise. I don't need a partner, and sit down. She looked into Granger's eyes and sat down. Biarritz is my town. You try to pass a single one of these bills and you'll get arrested so fast you won't know what hit you. Comprenez-vous? Bad things happen to pretty ladies in our jails. You can't make a move here without me. She studied him. So what I'm buying from you is protection. Wrong. What you are buying from me is your life. Tracy believed him. Now, tell me where you got your printing press. Tracy hesitated and Granger enjoyed her squirming. He watched her surrender. She said reluctantly, I bought it from an American living in Switzerland. He was an engraver with the U.S. Mint for 25 years. And when they retired him, there was some technical problem about his pension, and he never received it. He felt cheated and decided to get even. So he smuggled out some hundred-dollar plates that were supposed to have been destroyed and used his contacts to get the paper that the Treasury Department prints its money on. That explains it, Granger thought triumphantly. That is why the bills look so good. His excitement grew. How much money can that price turn out in a day? Only one bill an hour. Each side of the paper has to be processed, and he interrupted. Isn't there a larger press? Yes. He has one that will turn out 50 bills every eight hours, $5,000 a day, but he wants half a million dollars for it. 
Buy it, Granger said. I don't have five hundred thousand dollars. I do. How soon can you get hold of the press? She said reluctantly. Now, I suppose, but I don't. Granger picked up the telephone and spoke into it. Louis, I want five hundred thousand dollars worth of French francs. Take what we have from the safe and get the rest from the banks. Bring it to my office. Vite. Tracy stood up nervously. I'd better go and you're not going anywhere. I really should just sit there and keep quiet. I'm thinking. He had business associates who would expect to be cut in on the steal, but what they don't know won't hurt them. Granger decided. He would buy the large press for himself and replace what he borrowed from the casino's bank account with money he would print. After that, he would tell Bruno Vicente to handle the woman. She did not like partners. Well, neither did Armand Granger. Two hours later, the money arrived in a large sack. Granger said to Tracy, "You're checking out of the Palais. I have a house up in the hills that's very private. You will stay there until we set up the operation." He pushed the phone toward her. Now, call your friend in Switzerland and tell him you're buying the big press. I have his phone number at the hotel. I'll call from there. Give me the address of your house, and I'll tell him to ship the press there. And no, Granger snapped. I don't want to leave a trail. I'll have it picked up at the airport. We will talk about it at dinner tonight. I'll see you at eight o'clock. It was a dismissal. Tracy rose to her feet. Granger nodded toward the sack. Be careful with the money. I wouldn't want anything to happen to it, or to you. Nothing will, Tracy assured him. He smiled lazily. I know. Professor Zuckerman is going to escort you to your hotel. The two of them rode in the limousine in silence, the money bag between them, each busy with his own thoughts. Zuckerman was not exactly sure what was happening, but he sensed it was going to be very good for him. The woman was the key. Granger had ordered him to keep an eye on her, and Zuckerman intended to do that. Armand Granger was in a euphoric mood that evening. By now, the large printing press would have been arranged for. The Whitney woman had said it would print five thousand dollars a day, but Granger had a better plan. He intended to work the press on twenty-four hour shifts. That would bring it to fifteen thousand a day, more than one hundred thousand a week, and one million every ten weeks. And that was just the beginning. Tonight he would learn who the engraver was and make a deal with him for more machines. There was no limit to the fortune it would make him. At precisely eight o'clock, Granger's limousine pulled into the sweeping curve of the driveway of the Hotel du Palais, and Granger stepped out of the car. As he walked into the lobby, he noticed with satisfaction that Zuckerman was seated near the entrance, keeping a watchful eye on the doors. Granger walked over to the desk. Jules, tell the Baroness de Chantilly I am here. Have her come down to the lobby. The concierge looked up and said. But the Baroness has checked out, Monsieur Granger. You're mistaken. Call her. Jules Barajac was distressed. It was unhealthy to contradict Armand Granger. I checked her out myself. Impossible. When? Shortly after she returned to the hotel, she asked me to bring her bill to her suite so she could settle in cash. Armand Granger's mind was racing. In cash. French francs, as a matter of fact, yes, Monsieur. Granger asked frantically, "Did she take anything out of her suite? Any baggage or boxes?" No, she said she would send for her luggage later. So she had taken his money and gone to Switzerland to make her own deal for the large printing press. Take me to her suite quickly. Oui, Monsieur Granger. Jules Barjac grabbed a key from a rack and raced with Armand Granger toward the elevator. As Granger passed Zuckerman, he hissed, "Why are you sitting there, you idiot? She's gone!" Zuckerman looked up at him uncomprehendingly. "She can't be gone. She hasn't come down to the lobby. I've been watching for her." "Watching for her?" Granger mimicked. "Have you been watching for a nurse, a gray-haired old lady, a maid going out the service door?" Zuckerman was bewildered. "Why would I do that?" Get back to the casino," Granger snapped. "I'll deal with you later." 
the suite looked exactly the same as when Granger had seen it last. The connecting door to the adjoining room was open. Granger stepped in and hurried over to the closet and yanked open the door. The printing press was still there, thank God. The Whitney woman had left in too big a hurry to take it with her. That was her mistake. And it is not her only mistake, Granger thought. She had cheated him out of five hundred thousand dollars, and he was going to pay her back with a vengeance. He would let the police help him find her and put her in jail, where his men could get at her. They would make her tell who the engraver was and then shut her up for good. Armand Grangier dialed the number of police headquarters and asked to talk to Inspector Dumont. He spoke earnestly into the phone for three minutes and then said, I'll wait here. Fifteen minutes later, his friend the inspector arrived, accompanied by a man with an epicene figure and one of the most unattractive faces Grangier had ever seen. His forehead looked ready to burst out of his face, and his brown eyes, almost hidden behind thick spectacles, had the piercing look of a fanatic. This is Monsieur Daniel Cooper, Inspector Dumont said. Monsieur Grangier, Mr. Cooper is also interested in the woman you telephoned me about. Cooper spoke up. You mentioned to Inspector Dumont that she's involved in a counterfeiting operation? Vraiment. She is on her way to Switzerland at this moment. You can pick her up at the border. I have all the evidence you need right here. He led them to the closet, and Daniel Cooper and Inspector Dumont looked inside. There is the press she printed her money on. Daniel Cooper walked over to the machine and examined it carefully. She printed the money on this press? I just told you so, Grunge snapped. He took a bill from his pocket. Look at this. It is one of the counterfeit hundred-dollar bills she gave me. Cooper walked over to the window and held the bill up to the light. This is a genuine bill. It only looks like one. That is because she used stolen plates she bought from an engraver who once worked at the Mint in Philadelphia. She printed these bills on this press. Cooper said rudely, You're stupid. This is an ordinary printing press. The only thing you can print on this is letterheads. Letterheads? The room was beginning to spin. You actually believed in the fable of a machine that turns paper into genuine hundred-dollar bills? I tell you, I saw with my own eyes. Granger stopped. What had he seen? Some wet hundred-dollar bills strung up to dry, some blank paper, and a paper cutter. The enormity of the swindle began to dawn on him. There was no counterfeiting operation, no engraver waiting in Switzerland. Tracy Whitney had never fallen for the sunken treasure story. The bitch had used his own scheme as a bait to swindle him out of half a million dollars. If the word of this got out, the two men were watching him. Do you wish to press charges of some kind, Armand? Inspector Dumont asked. How could he? What could he say? That he had been cheated while trying to finance a counterfeiting operation? And what were his associates going to do to him when they learned he had stolen half a million dollars of their money and given it away? He was filled with sudden dread. No, I... I don't wish to press charges. There was panic in his voice. Africa, Armand Granger thought. They'll never find me in Africa. Daniel Cooper was thinking. Next time. I'll get her next time. Chapter 27 It was Tracy who suggested to Gunther Hartog that they meet in Mallorca. Tracy loved the island. It was one of the truly picturesque places in the world. Besides, she told Gunther, it was once the refuge of pirates. We'll feel right at home there. It might be best if we are not seen together, he suggested. I'll arrange it. It had started with Gunther's phone call from London. I have something for you that is quite out of the ordinary, Tracy. I think you'll find it a real challenge. The following morning, Tracy flew to Palma, Mallorca's capital. Because of Interpol's red circulation on Tracy, her departure from Biarritz and her arrival in Mallorca were reported to the local authorities. When Tracy checked into the royal suite at the San Vida Hotel, a surveillance team was set up on a 24-hour basis. Police commanded... Ernesto Marza, at Palma, had spoken with Inspector Trignon at Interpol. I am convinced, Trignon said, that Tracy Whitney is a one-woman crime wave. All the worse for her. If she commits a crime in Mallorca, she will find that our justice system is swift. 
Inspector Trouillon said, Monsieur, there is one other thing I should mention. See? Si? You will be having an American visitor. His name is Daniel Cooper. It seemed to the detectives trailing Tracy that she was interested only in sightseeing. They followed her as she toured the island, visiting the cloister of San Francisco and the colorful Belleville Castle and the beach of the Yetas. She attended a bullfight in Palma and died on Sobrazados and Comillot in the Plaza de la Reine, and she was always alone. She took trips to Formentor, and Valle de Mosa, and La Granja, and visited the pearl factors at Manacor. Nada, the detectives reported to Ernesto Marza. He is here as a tourist commandant. The commandant's secretary came into the office. There is an American here to see you, Senor Daniel Cooper. Commandant Marza had many American friends. He liked Americans, and he had the feeling that despite what Inspector Twignon has said, he was going to like this Daniel Cooper. He was wrong. You're idiots, all of you, Daniel Cooper snapped. Of course, she's not here as a tourist. She's after something. Commandant Marza barely managed to hold his temper in check. Senor, you yourself have said that Miss Whitney's targets are always something spectacular that she's enjoying doing the impossible. I have checked carefully, Senor Cooper. There is nothing in Mallorca that is worthy of attracting Senorita Whitney's talents. Has she met anyone here, talked to anyone? The insolent tone of the ojete. No, no one. Then she will, Daniel Cooper said flatly. I finally know, Commander Marza told himself what they mean by the ugly American. There are 200 known caves in Mallorca, but the most exciting is at Cuevas del Drac, the Caves of the Dragon, near Porta Cristo, an hour's journey from Palma. The ancient caves go deep into the ground, enormous vaulted caverns carved with stalagmites and stalactites, tombs silent except for the occasional rush of meandering underground streams, with the water turning green or blue or white, each color denoting the extent of the tremendous depths. The caves are a fairyland of pale ivory architecture, a seemingly endless series of labyrinths, dimly lit by strategically placed torches. No one is permitted inside the caves without a guide, but from the moment the caves are open to the public in the morning, they are filled with tourists. Tracy chose Saturday to visit the caves when they were most crowded, packed with hundreds of tourists from countries all over the world. She bought her ticket at the small counter and disappeared into the crowd. Daniel Cooper and two of Commandant Marza's men were close behind her. A guide led the excursionists along narrow stone paths, made slippery by the dripping water from the stalactites above, pointing downward like accusing skeletal fingers. There were alcoves where the visitors could step off the paths to stop and admire the calcium formations that looked like huge birds and strange animals and trees. There were pools of darkness along the dimly lit paths, and it was into one of these that Tracy disappeared. Daniel Cooper hurried forward, but she was nowhere in sight. The press of the crowd moving down the steps made it impossible to locate her. He had no way of knowing whether she was ahead of him or behind him. She is planning something here, Cooper told himself. But how? Where? What? In an arena-sized grotto, at the lowest point in the caves facing the Great Lake, is a Roman theater, Tiers of stone benches have been built to accommodate the audiences. They come to watch the spectacle staged every hour, and the sightseers take their seats in darkness, waiting for the show to begin. Tracy counted her way up to the tenth tier and moved in twenty seats. The man in the twenty-first seat turned to her. Any problem? None, Gunther. She leaned over and kissed him on the cheek. He said something, and she had to lean closer to hear him above the babble of voices surrounding them. I thought it best that we not be seen together, in case you're being followed. Tracy glanced around at the huge packed black cavern. We're safe here. She looked at him curious. It must be important. It is. He leaned closer to her. A wealthy client is eager to acquire a certain painting. It's a Goya called Puerto. He'll pay whoever can obtain it for him. Half a million dollars in cash. That's above my commission. Tracy was thoughtful. Are there others trying? Frankly, yes. 
In my opinion, the chances of success are limited. Where is the painting? In the Prado Museum in Madrid. The Prado? The word that flashed through Tracy's mind was impossible. He was leaning very close, speaking into her ear, ignoring the chattering going on around them as the arena filled up. This will take a great deal of ingenuity. That is why I thought of you, my dear Tracy. I'm flattered, Tracy said. Half a million dollars, free and clear. The show began, and there was a sudden hush. Slowly, invisible bulbs began to glow, and music filled the enormous cavern. The center of the stage was a large lake in front of the seated audience, and on it, from behind a stalagmite, a gondola appeared, lighted by hidden spotlights. An organist was in the boat, filling the air with a melodic serenade that echoed across the water. The spectators watched, wrapped as the color lights rainbowed the darkness, and the boat slowly crossed the lake and finally disappeared as the music faded. Fantastic, Gunther said. It was worth traveling here just to see this. I love traveling, Tracy said. And do you know what city I've always wanted to see, Gunther? Madrid. Standing at the exit to the caves, Daniel Cooper watched Tracy Whitney come out. She was alone. Chapter 28 The Ritz Hotel on the Plaza de la Lealtad in Madrid is considered the best hotel in Spain, and for more than a century it has housed and fed monarchs from a dozen European countries. Presidents, dictators, and billionaires had slept there. Tracy had heard so much about the Ritz that the reality was a disappointment. The lobby was faded and seedy-looking. The assistant manager escorted her to the suite she had requested, 411, 412, in the south wing of the hotel on Calle Filipe Cinco. I trust this will be satisfactory, Miss Whitney. Tracy walked over to the window and looked out. Directly below, across the street, was the Prado Museum. This will do nicely, thank you. The suite was filled with blaring sounds of the heavy traffic from the streets below, but it had what she wanted, a bird's-eye view of the Prado. Tracy ordered a light dinner in her room and retired early. When she got into the bed, she decided that trying to sleep in it had to be a modern form of medieval torture. At midnight, a detective stationed in the lobby was relieved by a colleague. She hasn't left her room. I think she's settled in for the night. In Madrid, Direccion General de Seredad, police headquarters, is located in the Porta del Sol and takes up an entire city block. It is a gray building with red brick, boasting a large clock tower at the top. Over the main entrance, the red and yellow Spanish flag flies, and there is always a policeman at the door, wearing a beige uniform and a dark brown beret, and equipped with a machine gun, a billy club, a small gun, and handcuffs. It is at this headquarters that the liaison from Interpol is maintained. On the previous day, an XD urgent cable had come in from Santiago Romero, the police commandant in Madrid, informing him of Tracy Whitney's impending arrival. The commandant had read the final sentence of the cable twice, and then telephoned Inspector André Trignon at Interpol headquarters in Paris. I do not comprehend your message, Romero had said. Do you ask me to extend my department's full cooperation to an American who is not even a policeman? For what reason? Commandant, I think you will find Mr. Cooper most useful. He understands Miss Whitney. What is there to understand? The commandant retorted. She is a criminal. Ingenious, perhaps. But Spanish prisons are full of ingenious criminals. This one will not slip through our net. Bon. And you will consult Monsieur Cooper. The commandant said grudgingly, If you say he can be youthful, I have no objection. Merci, monsieur. De nada, senor. Commandant Romero, like his counterpart in Paris, was not fond of Americans. He found them rude, materialistic, and naive. This one, he thought, may be different. I would probably like him. He hated Daniel Cooper on sight. She's outsmarted half the police forces in Europe, Daniel Cooper asserted, as he entered the commandant's office, and she'll probably do the same to you. It was all the commander could do to control himself. Senor, 
We do not need anyone to tell us our business. Senorita Whitney has been under surveillance from the moment she arrived at Barajas Airport this morning. I assure you that if someone drops even a pin on the street and your Miss Whitney picks it up, she will be whisked to jail. She has not dealt with the Spanish police before. She's not here to pick up a pin on the street. Why do you think she is here? I'm not sure. I can only tell you that it will be something big. Commandant Romero said smugly, The bigger, the better. We will watch her every move. When Tracy awakened in the morning, groggy from a torturous night's sleep, in the bed designed by Tomas T. Torquemada, she ordered a light breakfast and hot black coffee and walked over to the window, overlooking the Prado. It was an imposing fortress, built of stone and red bricks from the native soil and was surrounded by grass and trees. Two Doric columns stood in front, and on either side twin staircases led up to the front entrance. At the street level were two side entrances. School children and tourists from a dozen countries were lined up in front of the museum, and at exactly 10 a.m., the two large front doors were opened by guards, and the visitors began to move through the revolving door in the center and through the two side passages at ground level. The telephone rang, startling Tracy. No one except Gunther Hartog knew she was in Madrid. She picked up the telephone. Hello? Buenos dias, senorita. It was a familiar voice. I'm calling for the Madrid Chamber of Commerce, and they have instructed me to do everything I can to make sure you have an exciting time in our city. How did you know I was in Madrid, Jeff? Senorita, the Chamber of Commerce knows everything. Is this your first time here? Yes. Bueno. Then I can show you a few places. How long do you plan to be here, Tracy? It was a leading question. I'm not sure, she said lightly. Just long enough to do a little shopping and sightseeing. What are you doing in Madrid? The same, his tone matched hers. Shopping and sightseeing. Tracy did not believe in coincidence. Jeff Stevens was there for the same reason she was to steal the puerto. He asked, Are you free for dinner? It was a dare. Yes. Good. I'll make a reservation at the jockey. Tracy certainly had no illusions about Jeff, but when she stepped out of the elevator into the lobby and saw him standing there waiting for her, she was unreasonably pleased to see him. Jeff took her hand in his. Fantastico, querida, you look lovely. She had dressed carefully. She wore a Valentino navy blue suit with a Russian sable flung around her neck, mowed free zone pumps, and she carried a navy purse emblazoned with the Hermes H. Daniel Cooper, seated at a small round table in a corner of the lobby with a glass of Perrier before him, watched Tracy as she greeted her escort, and he felt a sense of enormous power. Justice is mine, saith the Lord, and I am his sword and his instrument of vengeance. My life is a penance and you shall help me pay. I'm going to punish you. Cooper knew that no police force in the world was clever enough to catch Tracy Whitney. But I am, Cooper thought. She belongs to me. Tracy had become more than an assignment to Daniel Cooper. She had become an obsession. He carried her photographs and file with him everywhere, and at night before he went to sleep, he lovingly poured over them. He had arrived in Biarritz too late to catch her, and she had eluded him in Mallorca. But now that Interpol had picked up her trail again, Cooper was determined not to lose it. He dreamed about Tracy at night. She was in a giant cage, naked, pleading with him to set her free. I love you, he said, but I'll never set you free. The jockey was a small, elegant restaurant on Amado de los Rios. The food here is superb, Jeff promised. He was looking particularly handsome, Tracy thought. There was an inner excitement about him that matched Tracy's, and she knew why. They were competing with each other, matching wits in a game for high stakes. But I'm going to win, Tracy thought. I'm going to find a way to steal that painting from the Prado before he does. There's a strange rumor around, Jeff was saying. She focused her attention on him. What kind of rumor? Have you ever heard of Daniel Cooper? He's an insurance investigator. Very bright. No, what about him? Be careful. He's dangerous. 
I wouldn't want anything to happen to you. Don't worry. But I have been, Tracy. She laughed. About me? Why? He put a hand over hers and said lightly, You're very special. Life is more interesting with you around, my love. He's so damn convincing, Tracy thought. If I didn't know better, I'd believe him. Let's order, Tracy said. I'm starved. In the days that followed, Jeff and Tracy explored Madrid. They were never alone. Two of Commandant Romero's men followed them everywhere, accompanied by the strange American. Romero had given permission for Cooper to be a part of the surveillance team, simply to keep the men out of his hair. The American was loco, convinced that the Whitney woman was somehow going to steal some great treasure from under the noses of the police. Que ridiculo! Tracy and Jeff dined at Madrid's classic restaurants, Ocher, the Principe de Viana, at Casa Botin. But Jeff also knew the places undiscovered by tourists, Cazapaco and La Chaleta and El Lacon, where he and Tracy dined on delicious native stews like Cocida Madaleno and Olla Podrida, and they visited a small bar where they had delicious tapas. Wherever they went, Daniel Cooper and the two detectives were never far behind. Watching them from a careful distance, Daniel Cooper was puzzled by Jeff Stevens' role in the drama that was being played out. Who was he, Tracy's next victim? Or were they plotting something together? Cooper talked to Commandant Romero. What information do you have on Jeff Stevens? Cooper asked. Nada. He has no criminal record and is registered as a tourist. I think he is just the companion the lady picked up. Cooper's instincts told him differently, but it was not Jeff Stevens he was after. Tracy, he thought. I want you, Tracy. When Tracy and Jeff returned to the Ritz, at the end of a late evening, Jeff escorted Tracy to her door. Why don't I come in for a nightcap, he suggested. Tracy was almost tempted. She leaned forward and kissed him lightly on the cheek. Think of me as your sister, Jeff. What's your position on incest? But she had closed the door. A few minutes later, he telephoned her from his room. How would you like to spend tomorrow with me in Sagovia? It's a fascinating old city just a few hours outside of Madrid. It sounds wonderful. Thanks for a lovely evening, Tracy said. Good night, Jeff. She lay awake a long time, her mind filled with thoughts she had no right to be thinking. It had been so long since she had been emotionally involved with a man. Charles had hurt her badly, and she had no wish to be hurt again. Jeff Stevens was an amusing companion, but she knew she must never allow him to become any more than that. It would be easy to fall in love with him, and foolish, ruinous, fun. Tracy had difficulty falling asleep. The trip to Sagovia was perfect. Jeff had rented a small car, and they drove out of the city into the beautiful wine country of Spain. An unmarked seat trailed behind them during the entire day, but it was not an ordinary car. The seat is the only automobile manufactured in Spain, and it is the official car of the Spanish police. The regular model has only 100 horsepower, but the ones sold to the Policia Nacional and the Guarda Sevilla are souped up to 150 horsepower, so there was no danger that Tracy Whitney and Jeff Stevens would elude Daniel Cooper and the two detectives. After lunch, they wandered around the medieval city and visited the old cathedral Santa Maria and the Renaissance town hall, and then drove up to the Alcazar, the old Roman fortress perched on a rocky spur high over the city. The view was breathtaking. I'll bet if we stayed here long enough, we'd see Don Quixote and Sancho Panza riding along the plains below, Jeff said. She studied him. You enjoy tilting at windmills, don't you? Depends on the shape of the windmill, he said softly. He moved closer to her. Tracy stepped away from the edge of the cliff. Tell me more about Sagovia. And the spell was broken. Jeff was an enthusiastic guide, knowledgeable about history, archaeology, and architecture, and Tracy had to keep reminding herself that he was also a con artist. It was the most pleasant day Tracy could remember. One of the Spanish detectives, Jose Pereira, grumbled to Cooper, The only thing they're stealing is our time. There are just two people in love. Can't you see that? Are you sure she's planning something? I'm sure, Cooper snarled. He was puzzled by his own reactions. All he wanted was to catch Tracy Whitney, to punish her as she deserved. She was just another criminal, an assignment, 
Yet, every time Tracy's companion took her arm, Cooper found himself stung with fury. When Tracy and Jeff arrived back in Madrid, Jeff said, If you're not too exhausted, I know a special place for dinner. Lovely. Tracy did not want the day to end. I'll give myself this day, this one day, to be like other women. Madrileños dine late, and few restaurants open for dinner before 9 p.m. Jeff made a reservation for 10 o'clock at the Valley Canyon, an excellent restaurant where the food was superb and perfectly served. Tracy ordered no dessert, but the captain brought a delicate flaky pastry that was the most delicious thing she had ever tasted. She sat back in her chair, sated and happy. It was a wonderful dinner, thank you. I'm glad you enjoyed it. This is the place to bring people if you want to impress them. She studied him. Are you trying to impress me, Jeff? He grinned. You bet I am. Wait until you see what's next. What was next was an unprepossessing bodega, a smoky cafe filled with leather jacket Spanish workmen drinking at the bar and at the dozen tables in the room. At one end was a tablado, a slightly elevated platform where two men strummed guitars. Tracy and Jeff were seated at a small table near the platform. Do you know anything about flamenco? Jeff asked. He had to raise his voice over the noise level in the bar. Only that it's a Spanish dance. Gypsy originally. You can go to the fancy nightclubs in Madrid and see imitations of flamenco, but tonight you'll see the real thing. Tracy smiled at the enthusiasm in Jeff's voice. You're going to see a classic cuadro flamenco. That's a group of singers, dancers, and guitarists. First they perform together, then each one takes his turn. Watching Tracy and Jeff from a table in the corner near the kitchen, Daniel Cooper wondered what they were discussing so intently. The dance is very subtle, because everything has to work together. Movements, music, costumes, the building of the rhythm. How do you know so much about it? Tracy asked. I used to know a flamenco dancer. Naturally, Tracy thought. The lights in the bodega dimmed, and the small stage was lit by spotlights. Then the music began. It started slowly. A group of performers casually ascended to the platform. The women wore colorful skirts and blouses, and high combs with flowers banked on their beautiful Andalusian coffers. The male dancers were dressed in the traditional tight trousers and vests, and wore gleaming Cordovan leather half-boots. The guitarist strummed a wistful melody while one of the seated women sang in Spanish. Yo quería dejar a mi amante, pero antes de que pudiera, hacerlo ella me abandono, e destrozo me caradón. Do you understand what she's saying? Tracy whispered. Yeah, I wanted to leave my lover, but before I could, he left me and he broke my heart. A dancer moved to the center of the stage. She started with a simple zapateado, a beginning stamping step, gradually pushed faster and faster by the pulsating guitars. The rhythm grew, and the dancing became a form of sensual violence, variations on steps that had been born in gypsy caves a hundred years earlier. As the music mounted in intensity and excitement, moving through the classic figures of the dance, from Allegra to Fantanguillo to Zambra to Segarida, and as the frantic pace increased, there were shouts of encouragement from the performers at the side of the stage. Cries of Olé tu madre, and Olé tu santos, and anda, anda. The traditional holeos and piopos, or shouts of encouragement, go to the dancers on to wilder, more frantic rhythms. When the music and dancing ended abruptly, a silence roared through the bar, and then there was a loud burst of applause. She's marvelous, Tracy exclaimed. Wait, Jeff told her. A second woman stepped into the center of the stage. She had a dark classical Castilian beauty and seemed deeply aloof, completely unaware of the audience. The guitars began to play a bolero, plaintive and low-key, an oriental-sounding canto. A male dancer joined her, and the castanets began to click in a steady, driving beat. The seated performers joined in with the haleo, and the hand claps that accompanied the flamenco dance and the rhythmic beat of the palms enhanced the music and dancing, lifting it building it, until the room began to rock with the echo of the zapatado and the hypnotic beat of the half-toe, the heel, and the full soul clacking out on endless variation of tone and rhythmic sensations. Their bodies moved apart and came together in a growing frenzy of desire until they were making mad, violent, animal love without ever touching, moving to a wild, passionate climax that had the audience screaming. 
As the lights blacked out and came on again, the crowd roared, and Tracy found herself screaming with the others. To her embarrassment, she was sexually aroused. She was afraid to meet Jeff's eyes. The air between them vibrated with tension. Tracy looked down at the table, at his strong tan hands, and she could feel them caressing her body, slowly, swiftly, urgently, and she quickly put her hands in her lap to hide their trembling. They said very little during the ride back to the hotel. At the door to Tracy's room, she turned and said, It's been a... Jeff's lips were on hers, and her arms went around him, and she held him tightly to her. Tracy. The word on her lips was yes, and it took the last ounce of her willpower to say, It's been a long day, Jeff. I'm a sleepy lady. Oh. I think I'll just stay in my room tomorrow and rest. His voice was level when he answered. Good idea. I'll probably do the same. Neither of them believed the other. Chapter 29 At ten o'clock the following morning, Tracy was standing in the long line at the entrance to the Prado Museum. As the doors opened, a uniformed guard operated a turnstile that admitted one visitor at a time. Tracy purchased the ticket and moved with the crowd going into the large rotunda. Daniel Cooper and Detective Pereira stayed well behind her and Cooper began to feel a growing excitement. He was certain that Tracy Whitney was not there as a visitor. Whatever her plan was, it was beginning. Tracy moved from room to room, walking slowly through the salons filled with Rubens paintings and Titians, Tintorettos, Porsches, and paintings by Dominikos Theotokopoulos, who became famous as El Greco. The Goyas were exhibited in a special gallery below on the ground floor. Tracy noted that a uniformed guard was stationed at the entrance to each room and at his elbow was a red alarm button. She knew that the moment the alarm sounded, all entrances and exits to the museum would be sealed off, and there would be no chance of escape. She sat on the bench in the center of the muse's room, filled with 18th-century Flemish masters, and let her gaze wander toward the floor. She could see a round access fixture on each side of the doorway. That would be the infrared beams that were turned on at night. In other museums Tracy had visited, the guards had been sleepy and bored, paying little attention to the stream of chattering tourists, but here the guards were alert. Works of art were being defaced by fanatics in museums around the world, and the Prado was taking no chance that it could happen there. In a dozen different rooms, artists had set up their easels and were assiduously at work copying paintings of the masters. The museum permitted it, but Tracy noticed that the guards kept a close eye even on the copiers. When Tracy had finished with the rooms on the main floor, she took the stairs to the ground floor, to the Francisco de Goya exhibition. Detective Pereira said to Cooper, See, she's not doing anything but looking. She... You're wrong. Cooper started down the stairs in a run. It seemed to Tracy that the Goya exhibition was more heavily guarded than the others, and it well deserved to be. Wall after wall was filled with an incredible display of timeless beauty, and Tracy moved from canvas to canvas, caught up in the genius of the man, Goya's self-portrait, making him look like a middle-aged pan, the exquisitely colored portrait of the family of Charles IV, the clothed Maja, and the famed nude Maja. And there, next to the witch's Sabbath, was the puerto. Tracy stopped and stared at it, her heart beginning to pound. In the foreground of the painting were a dozen beautifully dressed men and women, standing in front of a stone wall, while in the background, seen through a luminous mist, were fishing boats in a harbor and a distant lighthouse. In the lower left-hand corner of the picture was Goya's signature. This was the target. Half a million dollars. Tracy glanced around. A guard stood at the entrance, beyond him through the long corridor leading to other rooms. Tracy could see more guards. She stood there a long time, studying the puerto. As she started to move away, a group of tourists was coming down the stairs. In the middle of them was Jeff Stevens. Tracy averted her head and hurried out the side entrance before he could see her. It's going to be a race, Mr. Stevens, and I'm going to win it. She's planning to steal a painting from the Prado. Commandant Romero looked at Daniel Cooper incredulously. Cagajon. No one can steal a painting from the Prado. Cooper said stubbornly, She was there all morning. There has never been a theft at the Prado, and there never will be. And did you know why? Because it is impossible. She's not going to try any of the usual ways. You must have events protected in case of a gas attack. 
If the guards drink coffee on the job, find out where they get it, and if it can be drugged, check the drinking water. The limits of Commandant Ramiro's patience was exhausted. It was bad enough that he had had to put up with this rude, unattractive American for the past week, and that he had wasted valuable manpower having Tracy Whitney followed around the clock when his Polizia Nacional was already working under an austerity budget. But now, confronted by this Pito, telling him how to run his police department, he could stand no more. In my opinion, the lady is in Madrid on holiday. I'm calling off the surveillance. Cooper was stunned. No, you can't do that. Tracy Whitney is... Commandant Romero rose to his full height. You will kindly refrain from telling me what I can do, senor. And now, if you have nothing further to say, I am a very busy man. Cooper stood there, filled with frustration. I'd like to continue alone, then. The commandant smiled. To keep the Prado Museum safe from the terrible threat of this woman? Of course, Senor Cooper. Now I can sleep nights. Chapter 30 the chances of success are extremely limited, Gunther Hartog had told Tracy. It will take a great deal of ingenuity. That is the understatement of the century, Tracy thought. She was staring out the window of her suite, down at the skylight roof of the Prado, mentally reviewing everything she had learned about the museum. It was open from ten in the morning until six in the evening, and during that time the alarms were off, but guards were stationed at each entrance and in every room. Even if one can manage to take a painting off the wall, Tracy thought, there's no way to smuggle it out. All packages had to be checked at the door. She studied the roof of the Prado and considered a night foray. There were several drawbacks. The first one was the high visibility. Tracy had watched as the spotlights came on at night flooding the roof, making it visible for miles around. Even if it were possible to get into the building unseen, there were still the infrared beams inside the building, and the night watchman. The Prado seemed to be impregnable. What was Jeff planning? Tracy was certain he was going to make a try for the Goya. I'd give anything to know what he has in his crafty little mind. Of one thing Tracy was sure. She was not going to let him get there ahead of her. She had to find a way. She returned to the Prado the next morning. Nothing had changed except the faces of the visitors. Tracy kept a careful lookout for Jeff, but he did not appear. Tracy thought, He's already figured out how he's going to steal it. The bastard! All this charm he's been using was just to try to distract me and keep me from getting the painting first. She suppressed her anger and replaced it with clear, cold logic. Tracy walked over to the puerto again, and her eyes wandered over the nearby canvases, the alert guards, the amateur painters sitting on stools in front of their easels, the crowds flowing in and out of the room, and as she looked around, Tracy's heart suddenly began to beat faster. I know how I'm going to do it. She made a telephone call from a public booth in the Grand Via, and Daniel Cooper, who stood in a coffee shop doorway watching, would have given a year's pay to know whom Tracy was calling. He was sure it was an overseas call, and that she was phoning collect so that there would be no record of it. He was aware of the lime-green linen dress that he had not seen before, and that her legs were bare so that men can stare at them, he thought. Whore! He was filled with rage. In the telephone booth, Tracy was ending her conversation. Just make sure he's fast, Gunther. He'll have only about two minutes. Everything will depend on speed. To J.J. J. Reynolds, file number Y-72-830-412. From Daniel Cooper, confidential. Subject, Tracy Whitney. It is my opinion that the subject is in Madrid to carry out a major criminal endeavor. The likely target is the Prado Museum. The Spanish police are being uncooperative, but I will, personally, keep the subject under surveillance and apprehend her at the appropriate time. Two days later at 9 a.m., Tracy was seated on a bench in the gardens of the Retiro, the beautiful park running through the center of Madrid, feeding the pigeons. The Retiro with its lake and graceful trees and well-cut grass and miniature stages with shows for children, was a magnet for the Medrileños. Ceda Porreta, an elderly gray-haired man with a slight hunchback, walked along the park path, and when he reached the bench he sat down beside Tracy, opened a paper sack, and began throwing out breadcrumbs to the birds. 
Buenos dias, señorita. Buenos dias. Do you see any problems? Non, señorita. All I need is the time and the date. I don't have it yet, Tracy told him. Soon. He smiled a toothless smile. The police will go crazy. No one has ever tried anything like this before. That's why it's going to work, Tracy said. You'll hear from me. She tossed out a last crumb to the pigeons and rose. She walked away, her silk dress swaying provocatively around her knees. While Tracy was in the park meeting with Leda Poretta, Daniel Cooper was searching her hotel room. He had watched from the lobby as Tracy left the hotel and headed for the park. She had not ordered anything from room service, and Cooper had decided that she was going out to breakfast. He had given himself thirty minutes. Entering her suite had been a simple matter of avoiding the floor maids and using a lockpick. He knew what he was looking for, a copy of a painting. He had no idea how Tracy planned to substitute it, but he was sure it had to be her scheme. He searched the suite with swift, silent efficiency, missing nothing and saving the bedroom for last. He looked through her closet, examining her dresses, and then the bureau. He opened the drawers one by one. They were filled with panties and bras and pantyhose. He picked up a pair of pink underpants and rubbed them against his cheek and imagined her sweet-smelling flesh in them. The scent of her was suddenly everywhere. He replaced the garment and quickly looked through the other drawers. No painting. Cooper walked into the bathroom. There were drops of water in the tub. Her body had lain there, covered with water as warm as the womb, and Cooper could visualize Tracy lying in it, naked, the water caressing her breasts as her hips undulated up and down. He felt an erection begin. He picked up the damp washcloth from the tub and brought it to his lips. The odor of her body swirled around him as he unzipped his trousers. He rubbed a cake of damp soap onto the washcloth and began stroking himself with it, facing the mirror, looking into his blazing eyes. A few minutes later he left, as quietly as he had arrived and headed directly for a nearby church. The following morning when Tracy left the Ritz Hotel, Daniel Cooper followed her. There was an intimacy between them that had not existed before. He knew her smell. He had seen her in her bath, had watched her naked body writhing in the warm water. She belonged completely to him. She was his to destroy. He watched her as she wandered along the Gran Villa, examining the merchandise in the shops, and he followed her into a large department store, careful to remain out of sight. He saw her speak to a clerk, then head for the ladies' room. Cooper stood near the door, frustrated. It was the one place he could not follow her. If Cooper had been able to go inside, he would have seen Tracy talking to a grossly overweight middle-aged woman. Minyana, Tracy said, as she applied fresh lipstick before the mirror. Tomorrow morning, eleven o'clock. The woman shook her head. No, senorita. He will not like that. You could not choose a worse day. Tomorrow the Prince of Luxembourg arrives on a state visit, and the newspapers say he will be taking on a tour of the Prado. There will be extra security guards and police all over the museum. The more the better. Tomorrow. Tracy walked out the door, and the woman looked after her, muttering, La cucha es loca. The royal party was scheduled to appear at the Prado at exactly 11 a.m., and the streets around the Prado had been roped off by the Guardia Civil. Because of a delay in the ceremony at the presidential palace, the entourage did not arrive until close to noon. There were the screams of sirens as police motorcycles came into view, escorting a procession of half a dozen black limousines to the front steps of the Prado. At the entrance, the director of the museum, Christian Machada, nervously awaited the arrival of His Highness. Machada had made a careful morning inspection to be sure everything was in order, and the guards had been forewarned to be especially alert. The director was proud of his museum, and he wanted to make a good impression on the prince. It never hurts to have friends in high places, Machada thought. Quien sabe? I might even be invited to dine with His Highness this evening at the Residential Palace. Christian Machado's only regret was that there was no way to stop the hordes of tourists that wandered about, but the prince's bodyguards and the museum's security guards would ensure that the prince was protected. Everything was in readiness for him. The royal tour began upstairs on the main floor. The director greeted His Highness with an effusive welcome and escorted him, 
followed by the armed guards, through the rotunda, and into the rooms where the 16th century Spanish painters were on exhibit. Juan Teguanes, Pedro Machuca, Fernando Yanez. The prince moved slowly, enjoying the visual feast spread before him. He was a patron of the arts and genuinely loved the painters who could make the past come alive and remain internal. Having no talent for painting himself, the prince, as he looked around the rooms, nonetheless envied the painters who stood before their easels, trying to snatch sparks of genius from the masters. When the official party had visited the upstairs salons, Christian Mochado said proudly, And now, if your highness will permit me, I will take you downstairs to our Goya exhibit. Tracy had spent a nerve-wracking morning. When the prince had not arrived at the Prado, at eleven as scheduled, she had begun to panic. All her arrangements had been made and timed on the second. But she needed the prince in order to make them work. She moved from room to room, mixing with the crowds, trying to avoid attracting attention. He's not coming, Tracy thought finally. I'm going to have to call it off. And at that moment she had heard the sound of approaching sirens from the street. Watching Tracy from a vantage point in the next room, Daniel Cooper, too, was aware of the sirens. His reason told him it was impossible for anyone to steal a painting from the museum, but his instinct told him that Tracy was going to try it, and Cooper trusted his instinct. He moved closer to her, letting the crowds conceal him from view. He intended to keep her in sight every moment. Tracy was in the room next to the salon where the puerto was being exhibited. Through the open doorway, she could see the hunchback, César Paretta, seated from his easel, copying Goya's clothed maja, which hung next to the puerto. A guard stood three feet away. In the room with Tracy, a woman painter stood at her easel, studiously copying the milkmaid of Bordeaux, trying to capture the brilliant browns and greens of Goya's canvas. A group of Japanese tourists flooded into the salon, chattering like a flock of exotic birds. Now, Tracy told herself, this was the moment she had been waiting for, and her heart was pounding so loudly she was afraid the guard could hear it. She moved out of the path of the approaching Japanese tour group, backing toward the woman painter. As a Japanese man brushed in front of Tracy, Tracy fell backwards, as if pushed, bumping the artist and sending her, the easel, the canvas, and painting flying on the ground. Oh, I'm terribly sorry, Tracy exclaimed. Let me help you. As she moved to assist the startled artist, Tracy's heels stamped into the scattered paints, smearing them into the floor. Daniel Cooper, who had seen everything, hurried closer, every sense alert. He was sure Tracy Whitney had made her first move. The guard rushed over, calling out, Que pasa? Que pasa? The accident had attracted the attention of the tourists, and they milled around the fallen woman, smearing the paints from the crushed tubes into grotesque images on the hardwood floor. It was an unholy mess, and the prince was due to appear at any moment. The guard was in a panic. He yelled out, Sergio! Venica! Pronto! Tracy watched as a guard from the next room came running in to help. Cesar Porretta was alone in the salon with the puerto. Tracy was in the middle of the uproar. The two guards were trying vainly to push the tourists away from the area of the paint-smeared floor. Get the director, Sergio yelled. Enstejida! The other guard hurried off toward the stairs. Que birria! What a mess! Two minutes later, Christian Machada was at the scene of the disaster. The director took one horrified look and screamed, Get some cleaning woman down here quickly! Mops and cloths and serpentine! Pronto! A young aide rushed to do his bidding. Machada turned to Sergio. Get back to your post! He snapped. Si, senor! Tracy watched the guard push his way through the crowd to the room where Cesar Paretta was working. Cooper had not taken his eyes off Tracy for an instant. He had waited for her next move, but it had not come. She had not gone near any of the paintings, nor had she made contact with an accomplice. All she had done was knock over an easel and spill some paints on the floor, but he was certain it had been done deliberately. But to what purpose? Somehow Cooper felt that whatever had been planned had already happened. He looked around the walls of the salon. None of the paintings were missing. Cooper hurried into the adjoining room. There was no one there, but the guard and an elderly hunchback seated at his easel, copying the clothed maja. All the paintings were in place, but something was wrong. Cooper knew it. He hurried back to the harassed director, whom he had met earlier. I have reason to believe, Cooper blurted out, that a painting has been stolen from here in the past few minutes. 
Christian Machado stared at the wild-eyed American. What aren't you talking about? If that were so, the guards would have sounded the alarm. I think that somehow a fake painting was substituted for a real one. The director gave him a tolerant smile. There is one small thing wrong with your theory, senor. It is not known to the general public that there are censors hidden behind each painting. If anyone tried to lift a painting from the wall, which they would certainly have to do to substitute another painting, the alarm would instantly sound. Daniel Cooper was still not satisfied. Could your alarm be disconnected? No. If someone cut the wire to the power, that also would cause the alarm to go off, senor. It is impossible for anyone to steal a painting from this museum. Our security is what you call proof from fools. Cooper stood there shaking with frustration. Everything the director had was convincing. It did seem impossible. But then why had Tracy Whitney deliberately spilt those paints? Cooper would not give up. Humor me. Would you ask your staff to go through the museum and check to make sure nothing is missing? I'll be at my hotel. There was nothing more Daniel Cooper could do. At seven that evening, Christian Machado telephoned Cooper. I'd have personally made an inspection, senor. Every painting is in its proper place. Nothing is missing from the museum. So that was that. Seemingly, it had been an accident. But Daniel Cooper, with the instincts of a hunter, sensed that his quarry had escaped. Jeff had invited Tracy to dinner in the main dining room of the Ritz Hotel. You're looking especially radiant this evening, Jeff complimented her. Thank you. I feel absolutely wonderful. It's the company. Come with me to Barcelona next week, Tracy. It's a fascinating city. You'd love... I'm sorry, Jeff, I can't. I'm leaving Spain. Really? His voice was filled with regret. When? In a few days. Ah, I'm disappointed. You're going to be more disappointed, Tracy thought when you learn I've stolen the puerto. She wondered how he had planned to steal the painting. Not that it mattered any longer. I've outwitted clever Jeff Stevens. Yet, for some inexplicable reason, Tracy felt a faint trace of regret. Christian Machada was seated in his office, enjoying his morning cup of strong black coffee and congratulating himself on what a success the prince's visit had been. Except for the regrettable incident of the spilled paints, everything had gone off precisely as planned. He was grateful that the prince and his retinue had been diverted until the mess could be cleaned up. The director smiled when he thought about the idiot American investigator who tried to convince him that someone had stolen a painting from the Prado. Not to yesterday, not today, not tomorrow, he thought smugly. His secretary walked into the office. Excuse me, sir. There is a gentleman to see you. He asked me to give you this. She handed the director a letter. It was a letterhead of the Kunsthaus Museum in Zurich. My esteemed colleague, the letter will serve to introduce Monsieur Henri Rendell, our senior art expert. Monsieur Rendell is making a tour of the World Museums and is particularly eager to see your incomparable collection. I would greatly appreciate any courtesies you extend him. The letter was signed by the curator of the museum. Sooner or later, the director thought happily, everyone comes to me. Send him in. Henry Rendell was a tall, distinguished-looking, balding man with a heavy Swiss accent. When they shook hands, Machado noticed that the index finger on the right hand of his visitor was missing. Henry Rendell said, I appreciate this. It is the first opportunity I've had to visit Madrid, and I'm looking forward to seeing your renowned works of art. Christian Machado said modestly, I do not think you will be disappointed. Monsieur Rendell, please, come with me. I shall personally escort you. They moved slowly, walking through the rotunda with his Flemish masters and Rubens and his followers, and they visited the central gallery filled with Spanish masters, and Henry Rendell studied each painting carefully. The two men spoke as one expert to another, evaluating the various artists' style and perspective and color sense. Now, the director declared, for the pride of Spain... He led his visitor downstairs into the gallery filled with Goyas. It is a feast for the eyes, Randall exclaimed, overwhelmed. Please, let me just stand and look. Christian Machado waited, enjoying the man's awe. 
Never have I seen anything so magnificent, Randall declared. He walked slowly through the salon, studying each painting in turn. The witch's Sabbath, Randall said. Brilliant. They moved on. Goya self-portrait. Fantastic. Chris Machado beamed. Rendo paused in front of the puerto. A nos fake. He started to move on. The director grabbed his arm. What? What was it you said, senor? I said it's a nice fake. You are very much mistaken. He was filled with indignation. I do not think so. You most certainly are. Machada said stiffly, I assure you, it is genuine. I have its provenance. Henry Rendell stepped up to the picture and examined it more closely. Then its provenance has also been faked. This was done by Goya's disciple, Eugenio Lucas Epa Diaz. You must be aware, of course, that Lucas painted hundreds of fake Goyas. Certainly, I'm aware of that, Machada snapped, but this is not one of them. Rendell shrugged. I bow to your judgments. He started to move on. I personally purchased this painting. It has passed the spectrograph test, the pigment test. I do not doubt it. Lucas painted in the same period as Goya and used the same materials. Henry Rendell bent down to examine the signature at the bottom of the painting. You can reassure yourself very simply, if you wish. Take the painting back to your restoration room and test the signature. He chuckled with amusement. <laughs> Lucas Ego made him sign his own paintings, but his pocketbook forced him to forge Goya's name over his own, increasing the price enormously. Rendell glanced at his watch. You must forgive me. I'm afraid I am late for engagement. Thank you so much for sharing your treasures with me. Not at all, the director said coldly. The man is obviously a fool, he thought. I am at the Villa Magna, if I can be a service, and thanks you again, Signor. Henry Rendell departed. Christian Machara watched him leave. How dare that Swiss idiot imply that the precious Goya was a fake? He turned to look at the painting again. It was beautiful, a masterpiece. He leaned down to examine Goya's signature, perfectly normal. But still, was it possible? The tiny seed of doubt would not go away. Everyone knew that Goya's contemporary, Eugenio Lucas A. Padilla, had painted hundreds of fake Goyas, making a career out of forging the master. Machada had paid $3.5 million for the Goya Puerto. If he had been deceived, it would be a terrible black mark against him, something he could not bear to think about. Henry Rendell had said one thing that made sense. There was, indeed, a simple way to ascertain its authenticity. He would test the signature and then telephone Rendell and suggest most politely that perhaps he should seek a more suitable vocation. The director summoned his assistant and ordered the puerto moved to the restoration room. The testing of a masterpiece is a very delicate operation, for if it is done carelessly, it can destroy something both priceless and irreplaceable. The restorers at the Prado were experts. Most of them were unsuccessful painters who had taken up restoration work so they could remain close to their beloved art. They started as apprentices, studying under master restorers, and worked for years before they became assistants and were allowed to handle masterpieces, always under the supervision of senior craftsmen. Juan Delgado, the man in charge of art restoration at the Prado, placed the puerto in a special wooden rack as Christian Machado watched. I want you to test the signature, the director informed him. Delgado kept the surprise to himself. Si, sí, señor director. He poured isopropyl alcohol onto a small cotton ball and set it on the table next to the painting. On a second cotton ball, he poured petroleum distillate, the neutralizing agent. I am ready, señor. Go ahead, then, but be careful. Machada found that it was suddenly difficult for him to breathe. He watched Delgado lift the first cotton ball and gently touch it to the G in Goya's signature. Instantly, Delgado picked up the second cotton ball and neutralized the area so that the alcohol could not penetrate too deeply. The two men examined the canvas. Delgado was frowning. I'm sorry, but I cannot tell yet, he said. 
I must use a stronger solvent. Do it, the director commanded. Delgado opened another bottle. He carefully poured the menthol pitone onto a fresh cotton ball and with it touched the first letter of the signature again, instantly applying the second cotton ball. The room was filled with a sharp, pungent odor from the chemicals. Christian Machada stood there staring at the painting, unable to believe what he was seeing. The G in Goya's name was fading, and in its place was a clearly visible L. Delgado turned to him, his face pale. Shall... shall I go on? Yes, Machada said hoarsely. Go on. Slowly, letter by letter, Goya's signature faded under the application of the solvent, and the signature of Lucas materialized. Each letter was a blow to Machada's stomach. He, the head of one of the most important museums in the world, had been deceived. The board of directors would hear of it. The king of Spain would hear of it. The world would hear of it. He was ruined. He stumbled back to his office and telephoned Henry Rendell. The two men were seated in Machado's office. You were right, the director said heavily. It is a Lucas. When word of this gets out, I shall be a laughing stock. Lucas has deceived many experts, Rendell said comfortingly. His forgeries happen to be a hobby of mine. I paid three and a half million dollars for that painting, Rendell shrugged. Can you get your money back? The director shook his head in despair. I purchased it directly from a widow who claimed it had been in her husband's family for three generations. If I sued her, the case would drag on through the courts and it would be bad publicity. Everything in this museum would become suspect. Henri Rendell was thinking hard. There is really no reason for the publicity at all. Why don't you explain to your superiors what has happened and quietly get rid of the Lucas? You could send the painting to Sotheby's or Christie's and let them auction it off. Machado shook his head. No. Then the whole world would learn the story. Rendell's face brightened. You may be in luck. I may have a client who would be willing to purchase the Lucas. He collects them. He is a man of discretion. I would be glad to get rid of it. I never want to see it again, a fake, among my beautiful treasures. I'd like to give it away, he added bitterly. That will not be necessary. My client would probably be willing to pay you, say, $50,000 for it. Shall I make a telephone call? That would be most kind of you, Senor Rendell. At a hastily held meeting, the Sun Board of Directors decided that the exposure of one of the Prado's prize paintings as a forgery had to be avoided at any cost. It was agreed that the prudent course of action would be to get rid of the painting as quickly and as quietly as possible. The dark-suited men filed out of the room silently. No one spoke a word to Machada, who stood there, sweltering in his misery. That afternoon, a deal was struck. Henry Rendell went to the Bank of Spain and returned with a certified check for $50,000, and the Eugenio Lucas A. Padilla was handed over to him, wrapped in an inconspicuous piece of burlap. The board of directors would be very upset if this incident were to become public, Machada said delicately. But I assured them that your client is a man of discretion. You can count on it, Rendell promised. When Henry Rendell left the museum, he took a taxi to a residential area in the northern end of Madrid carried the canvas up some stairs to a third-floor apartment, and knocked on the door. It was opened by Tracy. In back of her stood Cesar Porretta. Tracy looked at Rendell questioningly, and he grinned. They couldn't wait to get this off their hands. Henry Rendell gloated. Tracy hugged him. Come in. Porretta took the painting and placed it on a table. Now, the hunchback said, you are going to see a miracle. A Goya brought back to life. He reached for a bottle of mentholated spirits and opened it. The pungent odor instantly filled the room. As Tracy and Rendell looked on, Porretta poured some of the spirits onto a piece of cotton and very gently touched the cotton to Lucas's signature, one letter at a time. Gradually, the signature of Lucas began to fade. Under it was the signature of Goya. Rendell stared at it in awe. Brilliant! 
It was Miss Whitney's idea, the hunchback admitted. She asked whether it would be possible to cover up the original artist's signature with a fake signature, and then cover that with the original name. He figured out how it could be done, Tracy smiled. Poretta said modestly, It was ridiculously simple. Took fewer than two minutes. The trick was in the paints I used. First, I covered Goya's signature with a layer of super-refined white French polish to protect it. Then over that, I painted Lucas's name with a quick, drying acrylic base paint. On top of that, I painted in Goya's name with an oreo base paint with a light picture varnish. When the top signature was removed, Lucas's name appeared. If they had gone further, they would have discovered that Goria's original signature was hidden underneath. But, of course, they didn't. Tracy handed each man a fat envelope and said, I want to thank you both. Anytime you need an art expert, Henry Rendell winked. Poretta asked, How do you plan to carry the painting out of the country? I'm having a messenger collected here. Wait for him. She shook the hands of both men and walked out. On her way back to the Ritz, Tracy was filled with a sense of exhilaration. Everything is a matter of psychology, she thought. From the beginning, she had seen that it would be impossible to steal the painting from the Prado, so she had had to trick them, to put them in a frame of mind where they wanted to get rid of it. Tracy visualized Jeff Stevens' face when he learned how he had been outwitted, and she laughed aloud. She waited in her hotel suite for the messenger, and when he arrived, Tracy telephoned Cesar Porretta. The messenger is here now, Tracy said. I'm sending him over to pick up the painting. See that... What? What are you talking about? Porretta screamed. Your messenger picked up the painting half an hour ago. Chapter 31 Paris Wednesday, July 9th, noon In a private office of the Rue Montagnon, Gunther Hartog said, I understand how you feel about what happened in Madrid, Tracy, but Jeff Stevens got there first. No, Tracy corrected him bitterly. I got there first. He got there last. But Jeff delivered it. The puerto was already on its way to my client. After all her planning and scheming, Jeff Stevens had outwitted her. He had sat back and let her do the work and take all the risks, and at the last moment he had calmly walked off with the prize. How he must have been laughing at her all the time. You're a very special lady, Tracy. She could not bear the waves of humiliation that washed over her when she thought of the night of the flamenco dancing. My God, what a fool I almost made of myself. I never thought I could kill anyone, Tracy told Gunther, but I could happily slaughter Jeff Stevens. Gunther said mildly, Oh, dear. Not in this room, I hope. He's on his way here. He's what? Tracy jumped to her feet. I told you I have a proposition for you. It will require a partner. In my opinion, he is the only one who... I'd rather starve first, Tracy snapped. Jeff Stevens is the most contemptible... Ah, did I hear my name mentioned? He stood in the doorway beaming. Tracy, darling, you look even more stunning than usual. Gunther, my friend, how are you? The two men shook hands. Tracy stood there, filled with a cold fury. Jeff looked at her and sighed. You're probably upset with me. Upset? I... She could not find the words. Tracy, if I may say so, I thought your plan was brilliant. I mean it. Really brilliant. You made only one little mistake. Never trust the Swiss with a missing index finger. She took deep breaths, trying to control herself. She turned to Gunther. I'll talk to you later, Gunther. Tracy. No. Whatever it is, I want no part of it. Not if he's involved. Gunther said. Would you at least listen to it? There's no point I... In three days, Da Beers is shipping a four million dollar packet of diamonds from Paris to Amsterdam on Air France cargo plane. I have a client who's eager to acquire those stones. Why don't you hijack them on the way to the airport? Your friend here is an expert on hijacking. She could not keep the bitterness from her voice. By God, she's magnificent when she's angry, Jeff thought. Gunther said, The diamonds are too well guarded. They're going to hijack the diamonds during the flight. Tracy looked at him in surprise. During the flight? 
In a cargo plane? We need someone small enough to hide inside one of the containers. When the plane is in the air, all that person has to do is step out of the crate, open the De Beers container, remove the package of diamonds, replace the package with the duplicate, which will have been prepared, and get back in the other crate. And I'm small enough to fit in a crate, Gunther said. It's much more than that, Tracy. We need someone who's bright and has nerve. Tracy stood there thinking. I like the plan, Gunther. What I don't like is the idea of working with him. This person is a crook. Jeff grinned. Aren't we all, dear heart? Gunther is offering us a million dollars if we can pull this off. Tracy stared at Gunther. A million dollars? He nodded. Half a million for each of you. The reason it can work, Jeff explained, is that I have a contact the loading dock at the airport. He'll help us set it up. He can be trusted, unlike you, Tracy retorted. Goodbye, Gunther. She sailed out of the room. Gunther looked after her. She's really upset with you about Madrid, Jeff. I'm afraid she's not going to do this. You're wrong, Jeff said cheerfully. I know, Tracy. She won't be able to resist it. The pallets are sealed before they are loaded onto the plane. Ramon Vauban was explaining. The speaker was a young Frenchman with an old face that had nothing to do with his years and black, dead eyes. He was a dispatcher with Air France Cargo and the key to the success of the plan. Vauban, Tracy, Jeff, and Gunther were seated at a railside table on the Bateau Mouche, the sightseeing boat that cruises the Seine, circling Paris. If the pallet is sealed, Tracy asked, her voice crisp, how do I get into it? For last minute shipments, Vauban replied, the company uses what we call soft pallets, large wooden crates with a canvas on one side, fastened down only with rope. For security reasons, valuable cargo like Darmans always arrive at the last minute, so it is the last to go on and the first to come off. Tracy said, so the diamonds would be in a soft pallet. That is correct, mademoiselle. As would you. I would arrange for the container with you in it to be placed next to the pallet with the diamonds. All you have to do when the plane is in flight is cut the ropes, open the pallet with the diamonds, exchange a box identical to theirs, get back in your container, and close it up again. Gunther added, When the plane lands in Amsterdam, the guards will pick up the substitute box of diamonds and deliver it to the diamond cutters. By the time they discover their substitution, we'll have you on an airplane out of the country. Believe me, nothing can go wrong. A sentence that chilled Tracy's heart. Wouldn't I freeze to death up there? she asked. Vuban smiled. Mademoiselle, these days cargo planes are heated. They often carry livestock and pets. No, you will be quite comfortable. A little cramp, perhaps, but otherwise fine. Tracy had finally agreed to listen to their idea. A half million dollars for a few hours' discomfort. She had examined the scheme from every angle. It can work, Tracy thought. If only Jeff Stevens were not involved. Her feelings about him were such a royally mixture of emotions that she was confused and angry with herself. He had done what he did in Madrid for the fun of outwitting her. He had betrayed her, cheated her, and now he was secretly laughing at her. The three men were watching her, waiting for her answer. The boat was passing under the Pont Neuf, the oldest bridge in Paris, which the contrary French insisted on calling the new bridge. Across the river... Two lovers embraced on the edge of the embankment, and Tracy could see the blissful look on the face of the girl. She's a fool, Tracy thought. She made her decision. She looked straight into Jeff's eyes as she said, All right, I'll go along with it. And she could feel the tension at the table dissipate. We don't have much time, Vuban was saying. His dead eyes turned to Tracy. My brother works for a shipping agent, and he will let us load the soft container with you in it at his warehouse. I hope Mademoiselle does not have claustrophobia. Don't worry about me. How long will the trip take? You will spend a few minutes in the loading area and one hour flying to Amsterdam. How large is the container? Large enough for you to sit down. There will be other things in it to conceal you, just in case. Nothing can go wrong, they had promised, but just in case. I have a list of things you'll need, Jeff told her. I've already arranged for them. The smug bastard. 
He had been so sure she would say yes. Vuban here. We'll see to it that your passport has a proper exit and entrance stamps, so you can leave Holland without any problem. The boat began docking at its quay. We can go over the final plans in the morning, Raymond Vauban said. Now I have to get back to work. Au revoir. He left. Jeff asked, When we all have dinner together to celebrate? I'm sorry, Gunther apologized, but I have a previous engagement. Jeff turned to Tracy. Would, no thanks, I'm tired, she said quickly. It was an excuse to avoid being with Jeff, but even as Tracy said it, she realized she really was exhausted. It was probably the strain of the excitement she had been going through for so long. She was feeling lightheaded. When this is over, she promised herself, I'm going back to London for a long rest. Her head was beginning to throb. I really must. I brought you a little present, Jeff told her. He handed her a gaily wrapped box. In it was an exquisite silk scarf with the initials T.W. stitched in one corner. Thank you. He can afford it, Tracy thought angrily. He bought it with my half a million dollars. Sure you won't change your mind about dinner? I'm positive. In Paris, Tracy stayed at the classic Place at Antenne in a lovely old suite that overlooked the garden restaurant. There was an elegant restaurant inside the hotel, with soft piano music, but on this evening, Tracy was too tired to change into a more formal dress. She went into the Relais, the hotel's small café, and ordered a bowl of soup. She pushed the plate away, half-finished, and left for her suite. Daniel Cooper, seated at the other end of the room, noted the time. Daniel Cooper had a problem. Upon his return to Paris, he had asked for a meeting with Inspector Trignon, the head of Interpol had been less than cordial. He had just spent an hour on the telephone listening to Commander Romero's complaints about the American. He is loco, the commandant had exploded. I wasted men and money and time following this Tracy Whitney, who he insisted was going to rob the Prado, and she turned out to be a harmless tourist, just as I said she was. The conversation had led Inspector Trignol to believe that Daniel Cooper could have been wrong about Tracy in the first place. There was not one shred of evidence against the woman. The fact that she had been in various cities at the times the crimes were committed was not evidence. And so when Daniel Cooper had gone to see the inspector and said, Tracy Whitney is in Paris. I would like her placed on 24-hour surveillance. The inspector had replied, Unless you can present me with some proof that this woman is planning to commit a specific crime, there is nothing I can do. Cooper had fixed him with his blazing brown eyes and said, you're a fool, and had found himself being unceremoniously ushered out of the office. That was when Cooper had begun his one-man surveillance. He trailed Tracy everywhere, to shops and restaurants, through the streets of Paris. He went without sleep and often without food. Daniel Cooper could not permit Tracy Whitney to defeat him. His assignment would not be finished until he had put her in prison. Tracy lay in bed that night, reviewing the next day's plan. She wished her head felt better. She had taken aspirin, but the throbbing was worse. She was perspiring, and the room seemed unbearably hot. Tomorrow it will be over. Switzerland. That's where I'll go. To the cool mountains of Switzerland. To the chateau. She set the alarm for 5 a.m., and when the bell rang, she was in her prison cell, and old Iron Pants was yelling, Time to get dressed! Move it! And the corridor echoed with the clanging of the bell. Tracy awakened. Her chest felt tight and the light hurt her eyes. She forced herself into the bathroom. Her face looked blotchy and flushed in the mirror. I can't get sick now, Tracy thought. Not today. There's too much to do. She dressed slowly, trying to ignore the throbbing in her head. She put on black overalls with deep pockets, rubber-soled shoes, and a basque beret. Her heart seemed to beat erratically, but she was not sure whether it was from excitement or the melee that gripped her. She was dizzy and weak, her throat felt sore and scratchy. On her table, she saw the scarf Jeff had given her. She picked it up and wrapped it around her neck. The main entrance to the Hotel Plaza Atene is on Avenue Montaigne, but the service entrance is on Rue du Bocador, around the corner. A discreet sign reads, Entrée du Service, and the passageway goes from a back hallway of the lobby through a narrow corridor lined with garbage cans leading to the street. Daniel Cooper, who had taken up an observation post near the main entrance, 
did not see Tracy leave through the service door, but inexplicably, the moment she was gone, he sensed it. He hurried out to the avenue and looked up and down the street. Tracy was nowhere in sight. The gray Renault that picked up Tracy at the side entrance to the hotel headed for the Etoile. There was little traffic at that hour, and the driver, a pimply-faced youth who apparently spoke no English, raced into one of the twelve avenues that formed the spokes of the Etoile. I wish he would slow down, Tracy thought. The motion was making her car sick. Thirty minutes later, the car slammed to a stop in front of a warehouse. The sign over the door read, Brousset et C. Tracy remembered that this was where Ramon Vauban's brother worked. The youth opened the car door and murmured, Vite! A middle-aged man with a quick, furtive manner appeared as Tracy stepped out of the car. Follow me, he said. Hurry! Tracy stumbled after him to the back of the warehouse, where there were a half a dozen containers, most of them filled and sealed, ready to be taken to the airport. There was one soft container with a canvas side, half filled with furniture. Get in, quick! We have no time! Tracy felt faint. She looked at the box and thought, I can't get in there, I'll die! The man was looking at her strangely. Avez-vous mal? Now was the time to back out, to put a stop to this. I'm all right. Tracy mumbled. It would be over soon. In a few hours, she would be on her way to Switzerland. Bon, take this. He handed her a double-edged knife, a long coil of heavy rope, a flashlight, and a small blue jewel box with a red ribbon around it. This is a duplicate of the jewel box you will exchange. Tracy took a deep breath, stepped into the container, and sat down. Seconds later, a large piece of canvas dropped down over the opening. She could hear ropes being tied around the canvas to hold it in place. She barely heard his voice through the canvas. From now on, no talking, no moving, no smoking. I don't smoke, Tracy tried to say, but she did not have the energy. Bon chance. I've cut some holes in the side of the box so you can breathe. Don't forget to breathe. He laughed at his joke, and she heard his footsteps fading away. She was alone in the dark. The box was narrow and cramped, and a set of dining room chairs took up most of the space. Tracy felt as though she were on fire. Her skin was hot to the touch, and she had difficulty breathing. I've caught some kind of virus, she thought, but it's going to have to wait. I have work to do. Think about something else. Gunther's voice. You've nothing to worry about, Tracy. When they unload the cargo in Amsterdam... Your pallet will be taken to a private garage near the airport. Jeff will meet you there. Give him the jewels and return to the airport. There will be a plane ticket for Geneva and waiting for you at the Swiss Air Counter. Get out of Amsterdam as fast as you can. As soon as the police learn of the robbery, they'll close up the city tight. Nothing will go wrong. But just in case, here's the address and the key to the safe house in Amsterdam. It is unoccupied. She must have dozed, for she awakened with a start as the container was jerked into the air. Tracy felt herself swinging through space, and she clung to the sides for support. The container settled down on something hard. There was a slam of a car door, an engine roared into life, and a moment later the truck was moving. They were on their way to the airport. The scheme had been worked out on a split-second schedule. The container with Tracy inside was due to reach the cargo shipping area within a few minutes of the time the De Beers pilot was to arrive. The driver of the truck carrying Tracy had his instructions. Keep it at a steady 50 miles an hour. Traffic on the road to the airport seemed heavier than usual that morning, but the driver was not worried. The pilot would make the plane in time, and he would be in possession of a bonus of 50,000 francs, enough to take his wife and two children on vacation. America, he thought. We'll go to Disney World. He looked at the dashboard clock and grinned to himself. No problem. The airport was only three miles away, and he had ten minutes to get there. Exactly on schedule, he reached the turnoff for Air France Cargo Headquarters at the Fert North sign and drove past the low gray building at the Rosé Charles de Gaulle Airport, away from the passenger entrance where barbed wire fences separated the roadway from the cargo area. As he headed toward the enclosure holding the enormous warehouse, which occupied three blocks and was filled with boxes and packages and containers piled on dollies, there was a sudden explosion sound as a wheel jerked in his hand and the truck began to vibrate. Foutre, he thought. A fucking blowout. 
The giant 747 Air France cargo plane was in the process of being loaded. The nose had been raised, revealing rows of tracks. The cargo containers were on a platform level with the opening, ready to slide across the bridge into the hold of the plane. There were 38 pallets, 28 of them on the main deck and 10 of them in the belly holds. On the ceiling, an exposed heating pipe ran from one end of the huge cabin to the other, and the wires and cables that controlled the transport were visible on the ceiling. There were no frills on this plane. The loading had almost been completed. Ramon Vuban looked at his watch again and cursed. The truck was late. The De Beers consignment had already been loaded into its pallet, and the canvas sides fastened down with a crisscross of ropes. Vuban had daubed the side of it with red paint so the woman would have no trouble identifying it. He watched now as a pallet moved along the tracks into the plane and was locked into place. There was room next to it for one more pallet before the plane took off. There were three more containers on the dock waiting to be loaded. Where in God's name was the woman? The loadmaster inside the plane called. Let's go, Ramon. What's holding us up? A minute, Vuban answered. He hurried toward the entrance to the loading area. No sign of the truck. Vuban? Vuban, what's the problem? He turned. A senior supervisor was approaching. Finish loading and get this cargo in the air. Yes, sir. I was just waiting for... At that moment, the truck from Bruxelles C raced into the warehouse and came to a screeching halt in front of Vuban. Here's the last of the cargo, Vuban announced. Well, get it aboard, the supervisor snapped. Vuban supervised the unloading of the container from the truck and set it onto the bridge leading to the plane. He waved to the loadmaster. It's all yours. Moments later, the cargo was aboard and the nose of the plane was lowered into place. Vuban watched as the jets were fired up and the giant plane started rolling toward the runway, and he thought, now it's up to the woman. There was a fierce storm. A giant wave had struck the ship, and it was sinking. I'm drowning, Tracy thought. I've got to get out of here. She flung out her arms and hit something. It was the side of a lifeboat, rocking and swaying. She tried to stand up and cracked her head on the leg of a table. In a moment of clarity, she remembered where she was. Her face and hair dripped with perspiration. She felt giddy, and her body was burning up. How long had she been unconscious? It was only an hour's flight. Was a plane about to land? No, she thought. It's all right. I'm having a nightmare. I'm in my bed in London, asleep. I'll call for a doctor. She could not breathe. She struggled upward to reach for a telephone, then immediately sank down, her body leaden. The plane hit a pocket of turbulence, and Tracy was thrown against the side of the box. She lay there, dazed, desperately trying to concentrate. How much time do I have? She wavered between a hellish dream and painful reality. The diamonds. Somehow she had to get the diamonds. But first, first she had to cut herself out of the pallet. She touched the knife in her coveralls and found that it was a terrible effort to lift it. Not enough air, Tracy thought. I must have air. She reached around the edge of the canvas, fumbled for one of the outside ropes, found it, and cut it. It seemed to take an eternity. The canvas opened wider. She cut another rope, and there was room enough to slip outside of the container, into the belly of the cargo plane. The air outside the box was cold. She was freezing. Her whole body began to shake, and the constant jolting of the plane increased her nausea. I've got to hold on, Tracy thought. She forced herself to concentrate. What am I doing here? Something important. Yes, diamonds. Tracy's vision was blurred, and everything was moving in and out of focus. I'm not going to make it. The plane dipped suddenly, and Tracy was hurled to the floor, scraping her hands on the sharp metal tracks. She held on while the plane bucked, and when it had settled down, she forced herself to her feet again. The roaring of the jet engines was mixed with the roaring in her head. The diamonds. I must find the diamonds. She stumbled among the containers, squinting at each one, looking for the red paint. Thank God, there it was, on the third container. She stood there, trying to remember what to do next. It was such an effort to concentrate. If I could just lie down and sleep for a few minutes, I'd be fine. All I need is some sleep. But there was no time. They could be landed in Amsterdam in any moment. Tracy took the knife and slashed at the ropes of the container. One good cut will do it, they had told her. She barely had the strength to hold the knife in her grasp. 
I can't fail now, Tracy thought. She began shivering again and shook so hard that she dropped the knife. It's not going to work. They're going to catch me and put me back in prison. She hesitated indecisively, clinging to the rope, wanting desperately to crawl back into her box where she could sleep, safely, hidden until it was all over. It would be so easy. Then slowly, moving carefully against the fierce pounding in her head, Tracy reached for the knife and picked it up. She began to slash at the heavy rope. It finally gave way. Tracy pulled back the canvas and stared into the gloomy interior of the container. She could see nothing. She pulled out the flashlight, and at that moment, she felt a sudden change of pressure in her ears. The plane was coming down for a landing. Tracy thought, I've got to hurry. But her body refused to respond. She stood there, dazed. Move, her mind said. She shone the flashlight into the interior of the box. It was crammed with packages and envelopes and small cases. And on top of a crate were two little blue boxes with red ribbons around them. Two of them? There was only supposed to be... She blinked, and the two boxes merged into one. Everything seemed to have a bright aura around it. She reached for the box and took the duplicate out of her pocket. Holding the two of them in her hand, an overwhelming nausea swept over her, racking her body. She squeezed her eyes together, fighting against it. She started to place the substitute box on top of the case, and suddenly realized that she was no longer sure which box was which. She stared at the two identical boxes. Was it the one in her left hand or her right hand? The plane began a steeper angle of descent. It would touch down at any moment. She had to make a decision. She set down one of the boxes, prayed that it was the right one, and moved away from the container. She fumbled an uncut coil of rope out of her coveralls. There's something I must do with the rope. The roaring in her head made it impossible to think. She remembered. After you cut the rope, put it in your pocket. Replace it with the new rope. Don't leave anything around that will make them suspicious. It had sounded so easy then, sitting in the warm sun on the deck of the Batu Mouche. Now it was impossible. She had no more strength left. The guards would find the cut rope, and the cargo would be searched, and she would be caught. Something deep inside her screamed, No, no, no! With a Herculean effort, Tracy began to wind the uncut rope around the container. She felt a jolt beneath her feet as the plane touched the ground, and then another, and she was slammed backwards as the jets were thrust into reverse. Her head smashed against the floor, and she blacked out. The 747 was picking up speed now, taxiing along the runway toward the terminal. Tracy lay crumpled on the floor of the plane, with her hair fanning over her white, white face. It was the silence of the engines that brought her back to consciousness. The plane had stopped. She propped herself up on an elbow and slowly forced herself to her knees. She stood up, reeling, hanging onto the container to keep from falling. The new rope was in place. She clasped the jewel box to her chest and began to weave her way back to her pallet. She pushed her body through the canvas opening and flopped down, panting, her body beaded with perspiration. I've done it. But there was something more she had to do, something important. What? Tape up the rope on your pallet. She reached into the pocket of her coveralls for the roll of masking tape. It was gone. Her breath was coming in shallow, ragged gasps, and the sound deafened her. She thought she heard voices and forced herself to stop breathing and listen. Yes, there they were again. Someone laughed. Any second now, the cargo door would open and the men would begin unloading. They would see the cut rope, look inside the pallet, and discover her. She had to find a way to hold the rope together. She got to her knees, and as she did, she felt the hard roll of masking tape which had fallen from her pocket sometime during the turbulence of the flight. She lifted the canvas and fumbled around to find the two ends of cut rope and held them together while she clumsily tried to wrap the tape around them. She could not see. The perspiration pouring down her face was blinding her. She pulled the scarf from her throat and wiped her face. Better. She finished taping the rope and dropped the canvas back in place. There was nothing to do now but wait. She felt her forehead again, and it seemed hotter than before. I must get out of the sun, Tracy thought. Tropical suns can be dangerous. She was on holiday somewhere in the Caribbean. Jeff had come here to bring her some diamonds, but he had jumped into the sea and disappeared. She reached out to save him, but he slipped from her grasp. The water was over her head. She was choking, drowning. She heard the sound of workmen entering the plane. Help, she screamed. Please help me. But her scream was a whisper, and no one heard. The giant containers began rolling out of the plane. 
Tracy was unconscious when they loaded her container onto a Brussels AC truck. Left behind on the floor of the cargo plane was a scarf Jeff had given her. Tracy was awakened by the slash of light hitting the inside of the truck as someone raised the canvas. Slowly, she opened her eyes. The truck was in a warehouse. Jeff was standing there grinning at her. You made it, he said. You're a marvel. Let's have the box. She watched dully as he picked up the box from her side. See you in Lisbon. He turned to leave and stopped and looked down at her. You look terrible, Tracy. You all right? She could hardly speak. Jeff, I... But he was gone. Tracy had only the haziest recollection of what happened next. There was a change of clothes for her in back of the warehouse, and some woman said, You look ill, mademoiselle. Do you wish me to call a doctor? No doctors, Tracy whispered. There will be a plane ticket for Geneva waiting for you at the Switzer counter. Get out of Amsterdam as fast as you can. As soon as the police learn of the robbery, they'll close up the city tight. Nothing will go wrong, but just in case, here is the address and the key to safe house in Amsterdam. It is unoccupied. The airport. She had to get to the airport. Taxi, she mumbled. Taxi. The woman hesitated a moment, then shrugged. All right, I will call one. Wait here. She was floating higher and higher now, even closer to the sun. Your taxi is here, a man was saying. She wished people would stop bothering her. She wanted only to sleep. The driver said, Where do you wish to go, mademoiselle? There will be a plane ticket for Geneva waiting for you at the Swiss Air counter. She was too ill to board a plane. They would stop her, summon a doctor. She would be questioned. All she needed was to sleep for a few minutes, then she would be fine. The voice was getting impatient. Where to, please? She had no place to go. She gave the taxi driver the address of the safe house. The police were cross-examining her about the diamonds, and when she refused to answer them, they became very angry and put her in a room by herself and turned up the heat until the room was boiling hot. When it became unbearable, they dropped the temperature down until icicles began to form on the walls. Tracy pushed her way up through the cold and opened her eyes. She was on a bed, shivering uncontrollably. There was a blanket beneath her, but she did not have the strength to get under it. Her dress was soaked through and her face and neck were wet. I'm going to die here. Where was here? The safe house. I'm in the safe house. And the phrase struck her as so funny that she started to laugh and the laughter turned into a paroxysm of coughing. It had all gone wrong. She had not gotten away after all. By now the police would be combing Amsterdam for her. Mademoiselle Whitney had a ticket on Swissair and did not use it. Then she still must be in Amsterdam. She wondered how long she had been in this bed. She lifted her wrist to look at her watch, but the numbers were blurred. She was seeing everything double. There were two beds in the small room and two dressers and four chairs. The shivering stopped and her body was burning up. She needed to open a window, but she was too weak to move. The room was freezing again. She was back on the airplane, locked in the crate, screaming for help. You've made it. You're a marvel. Let's have the box. Jeff had taken the diamonds, and he was probably on his way to Brazil with her share of the money. He would be enjoying himself with one of his women, laughing at her. He had beaten her once more. She hated him. No, she didn't. Yes, she did. She despised him. She was in and out of delirium. The hard pelota ball was hurtling towards her, and Jeff grabbed her in his arms and pushed her to the ground, and his lips were very close to hers, and then they were having dinner at Zalakan. Do you know how special you are, Tracy? I offer you a draw, Boris Melnikov said. Her body was trembling again, out of control, and she was on an express train whirling through a dark tunnel, and at the end of the tunnel she knew she was going to die. All the other passengers had gotten off, except Alberto Fornati. He was angry with her, shaking her and screaming at her. For Christ's sake, he yelled. Open your eyes! Look at me! With a superhuman effort, Tracy opened her eyes, and Jeff was standing over her. His face was white, and there was fury in his voice. Of course, it was all part of her dream. How long you been like this? You're in Brazil... Tracy mumbled. After that, she remembered nothing more. When Inspector Quignon was given the scarf with the initials T.W. on it, 
found on the floor of the Air France cargo plane. He stared at it for a long time. Then he said, Get me Daniel Cooper. Chapter 32 The picturesque village of Alkmaar, on the northwest coast of Holland, facing the North Sea, is a popular tourist attraction, but there is a quarter in the eastern section that tourists seldom visit. Jeff Stevens had vacation there several times with the stewardess from KLM, who had taught him the language. He remembered the area well, a place where the residents minded their own business and were not unduly curious about visitors. It was a perfect place to hide out. Jeff's first impulse had been to rush Tracy to a hospital, but that was too dangerous. It was also risky for her to remain in Amsterdam a minute longer. He had wrapped her in blankets and carried her out to the car, where she had remained unconscious during the drive to Akmar. Her pulse was erratic and her breathing shallow. In Akmar, Jeff checked into a small inn. The innkeeper watched curiously as Jeff carried Tracy upstairs to her room. We're honeymooners, Jeff explained. My wife became ill, a slight respiratory disturbance. She needs rest. Would you like a doctor? Jeff was not certain of the answer himself. I'll let you know. The first thing he had to do was try to bring down Tracy's fever. Jeff lowered her onto the large double bed in the room and began to strip off her clothes, sodden with perspiration. He held her up in a sitting position and lifted her dress over her head, shoes next, then pantyhose. Her body was hot to the touch. Jeff wet a towel with cool water and gently bathed her from head to foot. He covered her with a blanket and sat at the bedside listening to her uneven breathing. If she's not better by morning, Jeff decided, I'll have to bring in a doctor. In the morning, the bedclothes were soaked again. Tracy was still unconscious, but it seemed to Jeff that her breathing was a little easier. He was afraid to let the maid see Tracy. It would lead to many questions. Instead, he asked the housekeeper for a change of linens and took them inside the room. He washed Tracy's body with a moist towel, changed the sheets on the bed the way he had seen nurses do in hospitals, without disturbing the patient, and covered her up again. Jeff put a Do Not Disturb sign on the door and went looking for the nearest pharmacy. He bought aspirin, a thermometer, a sponge, and rubbing alcohol. When he returned to the room, Tracy was still not awake. Jeff took her temperature, 104 degrees. He sponged her body with the cool alcohol, and her fever dropped. An hour later, her temperature was up again. He was going to have to call a doctor. The problem was that the doctor would insist Tracy be taken to a hospital. Questions would be asked. Jeff had no idea whether the police were looking for them, but if they were, they would both be taken into custody. He had to do something. He mashed up four aspirins, placed the powder between Tracy's lips, and gently spooned water into her mouth until she finally swallowed. Once again, he bathed her body. After he had finished drying her, it seemed to him that her skin was not as hot as it had been. He checked her pulse once more. It seemed steadier. He put his head to her chest and listened. Was her breathing less congested? He could not be certain. He was sure of only one thing, and he repeated it over and over until it became a litany. You're going to get well. He kissed her gently on the forehead. Jeff had not slept in 48 hours, and he was exhausted and hollow-eyed. I'll sleep later, he promised himself. I'll close my eyes to rest them a moment, he slept. When Tracy opened her eyes and watched the ceiling slowly come into focus, she had no idea where she was. It took long minutes for awareness to seep into her consciousness. Her body felt battered and sore, and she had the feeling that she had returned from a long, wearing journey. Drowsily, she looked around the unfamiliar room, and her heart suddenly skipped a beat. Jeff was slumped in an armchair near the window, asleep. It was impossible. The last time she had seen him, he had taken the diamonds and left. What was he doing here? And with a sudden sinking sensation, Tracy knew the answer. She had given him the wrong box, the box with the fake diamonds, and Jeff thought she had cheated him. He must have picked her up at the safe house and taken her to wherever this place was. As she sat up, Jeff stirred and opened his eyes. When he saw Tracy looking at him, a slow, happy grin lit his face. Welcome back! There was a note of such intense relief in his voice that Tracy was confused. I'm sorry, Tracy said. Her voice was a hoarse whisper. I gave you the wrong box. What? I mixed up the boxes. He walked over to her and said gently, No, Tracy, you gave me the real diamonds. They're on their way to Gunther. 
She looked at him in bewilderment. Then why... Why are you here? He sat on the edge of the bed. When you handed me the diamonds, you looked like death. I decided I'd better wait at the airport to make sure you caught your flight. You didn't show up, and I knew you were in trouble. I went to the safe house and found you. I couldn't just let you die there, he said lightly. It would have been a clue for the police. She was watching him, puzzled. Tell me the real reason you came back for me. Time to take your temperature, he said briskly. Not bad, he told her a few minutes later. Little over a hundred. You're a wonderful patient. Jeff. Trust me, he said. Hungry? Tracy was suddenly ravenous. Starved. Good. I'll bring something in. He returned from shopping with a bag full of orange juice, milk, and fresh fruit, and large Dutch brooches, rolls filled with different kinds of cheese, meat, and fish. This seems to be the Dutch version of chicken soup, but it should do the trick. Now eat, slowly. He helped her sit up and fed her. He was careful and tender, and Tracy thought warily, he's after something. As they were eating, Jeff said, While I was out, I telephoned Gunther. He received the diamonds. He deposited your share of the money in your Swiss bank account. She could not keep herself from asking, Why didn't you keep it all? When Jeff answered, his tone was serious. Because it's time we stop playing games with each other, Tracy, okay? It was another one of his tricks, of course, but she was too tired to worry about it. Okay. If you'll tell me your sizes, Jeff said, I'll go out and buy some clothes for you. The Dutch are liberal, but I think if you walked around like that, they might be shocked. Tracy pulled the covers up closer around her, suddenly aware of her nakedness. She had a vague impression of Jeff's undressing her and bathing her. He had risked his own safety to nurse her. Why? She had believed she understood him. I don't understand him at all, Tracy thought. Not at all. She slept. In the afternoon, Jeff brought back two suitcases, filled with robes and nightgowns, underwear, dresses and shoes, and a makeup kit, and a comb and brush, and hair dryer, toothbrushes and toothpaste. He also had purchased several changes of clothes for himself, and brought back the International Herald Tribune. On the front page was a story about the diamond hijacking. The police had figured out how it had been committed, but according to the newspaper, the thieves had left no clues. Jeff said cheerfully, We're home free. Now all we have to do is get you well. It was Daniel Cooper who had suggested that the scarf with the initials T.W. be kept from the press. We know, he had told Inspector Trignon, who it belongs to, but it's not enough evidence for an indictment. Her lawyers would produce every woman in Europe with the same initials and make fools of you. In Cooper's opinion, the police had already made fools of themselves. God will give her to me. He sat in the darkness of the small church on a hard wooden bench, and he prayed, Oh, make her mine, Father. Give her to me to punish so that I may wash myself of my sins. The evil in her spirit shall be exercised, and her naked body shall be flagellated. And he thought about Tracy's naked body in his power and felt himself getting an erection. He hurried from the church in terror that God would see and inflict further punishment on him. When Tracy awoke, it was dark. She sat up and turned on the lamp on the bedside table. She was alone. He had gone. A feeling of panic washed over her. She had allowed herself to grow dependent on Jeff, and that had been a stupid mistake. It serves me right, Tracy thought bitterly. Trust me, Jeff had said, and she had. He had taken care of her only to protect himself, not for any other reason. She had come to believe that he felt something for her. She had wanted to trust him, wanted to feel that she meant something to him. She lay back on her pillow and closed her eyes, thinking, I'm going to miss him. Heaven help me, I'm going to miss him. God had played a cosmic joke on her. Why did it have to be him, she wondered but the reason did not matter. She would have to make plans to leave this place as soon as possible, find some place where she could get well, where she could feel safe. Oh, you bloody fool, she thought. You... There was the sound of the door opening, and Jeff's voice called out, Tracy, are you awake? I brought you some books and magazines. I thought you might... He stopped as he saw the expression on her face. Hey, is something wrong? Not now, Tracy whispered. Not now. The following morning, Tracy's fever was gone. 
I'd like to get out, she said. Do you think we could go for a walk, Jeff? They were a curiosity in the lobby. The couple who owned the hotel were delighted by Tracy's recovery. Your husband was so wonderful. He insisted on doing everything for you himself. He was so worried. A woman is lucky to have a man who loves her so much. Tracy looked at Jeff, and she could have sworn he was blushing. Outside, Tracy said, They're very sweet. Sentimentalist, Jeff retorted. Jeff had arranged for a cot to sleep on placed next to Tracy's bed. As Tracy lay in bed that night, she remembered again how Jeff had taken care of her, tended to her needs, and nursed her and bathed her naked body. She was powerfully aware of his presence. It made her feel protected. It made her feel nervous. Slowly, as Tracy grew stronger, she and Jeff spent more time exploring the quaint little town. They walked to Ak Maldemir, along winding cobblestone streets that dated from the Middle Ages, and spent hours at the tulip fields on the outskirts of the city. They visited the cheese market and the old weighing house, and went through the municipal museum. To Tracy's surprise, Jeff spoke to the townspeople in Dutch. Where did you learn that? Tracy asked. I used to know a Dutch girl. She was sorry she had asked. As the days passed, Tracy's healthy young body gradually healed itself. When Jeff felt that Tracy was strong enough, he rented bicycles, and they visited the windmills that dotted the countryside. Each day was a lovely holiday, and Tracy wanted it never to end. Jeff was a constant surprise. He treated Tracy with a concern and tenderness that melted her defenses against him, yet he made no sexual advances. He was an enigma to Tracy. She thought of the beautiful women with whom she had seen him, and she was sure he could have had any of them. Why was he staying by her side in this tiny backwater of the world? Tracy found herself talking about things she had thought she would never discuss with anyone. She told Jeff about Joe Romano and Tony Orsatti, and about Ernestine Littlechap and Big Bertha and little Amy Brannigan. Jeff was by turns outraged and distressed and sympathetic. Jeff told her about his stepmother and his Uncle Willie, and about his carnival days and his marriage to Louise. Tracy had never felt so close to anyone. Suddenly it was time to leave. One morning Jeff said, The police aren't looking for us, Tracy. I think we should be moving on. Tracy felt a stab of disappointment. All right. When? Tomorrow. She nodded. I'll pack in the morning. That night Tracy lay awake, unable to sleep. Jeff's presence seemed to fill the room as never before. This had been an unforgettable period in her life, and it was coming to an end. She looked over at the cot where Jeff lay. Are you asleep? Tracy whispered. No. What are you thinking about? Tomorrow. Leaving this place. I'll miss it. I'm going to miss you, Jeff. The words were out before she could stop herself. Jeff sat up slowly and looked at her. How much? He asked softly. Terribly. A moment later, he was at her bedside. Tracy, shh, don't talk. Just put your arms around me. Hold me. It started slowly, a velvet touching and stroking and feeling, a caressing and gentle exploring of the senses. And it began to build and swell in a frenzied, frantic rhythm until it became a bacno, an orgy of pleasure, wild and savage. His hard organ stroked her and pounded her and filled her until she wanted to scream with the unbearable joy. She was at the center of a rainbow. She felt herself being swept up in a tidal wave that lifted her higher and higher, and there was a sudden molten explosion within her, and her whole body began to shudder. Gradually, the tempest subsided. She closed her eyes. She felt Jeff's lift move down her body, down, down to the center of her being, and she was caught up in another fierce wave of blissful sensation. She pulled Jeff to her and held him close, feeling his heart beat against hers. She strained against him, but still she could not get close enough. She crept to the foot of the bed and touched her lips to his body with soft, tender kisses, moving upward until she felt his hard maleness in her hand. She stroked it softly and slid it into her mouth and listened to his moans of pleasure. Then Jeff rolled on top of her and was inside her, and it began again, more exciting than before, a fountain spilling over with unbearable pleasure, and Tracy thought, Now I know. For the first time, I know. But I must remember that this is just for tonight, a lovely farewell present. 
All through the night they had made love and talked about everything and nothing, and it was as though some long-locked floodgates had opened for both of them. At dawn, as the canals began to sparkle with the beginning day, Jeff said, "'Marry me, Tracy.' She was sure she had misunderstood him, but the words came again, and Tracy knew that it was crazy and impossible, and it could never work, and it was deliriously wonderful, and of course it would work, and she whispered, Yes, oh yes. She began to cry, gripped tightly in the safety of his arms. I'll never be lonely again, Tracy thought. We belong to each other. Jeff is part of all my tomorrows. Tomorrow had come. A long time later, Tracy asked, When did you know, Jeff? When I saw you in that house and I thought you were dying, I was half out of my mind. I thought you had ran away with the diamonds, Tracy confessed. He took her in his arms again. Tracy, what I did in Madrid wasn't for the money. It was for the game, the challenge. That's why we're both in the business we're in, isn't it? You're given a puzzle that can't possibly be solved, and then you begin to wonder if there isn't some way. Tracy nodded. I know. At first it was because I needed the money, and then it became something else. I've given away quite a bit of money. I love matching wits against people who are successful and bright and unscrupulous. I love living on the cutting edge of danger. After a long silence, Jeff said, Tracy, how would you feel about giving it up? She looked at him puzzled. Giving it up? Why? We were each on our own before. Now everything has changed. I couldn't bear it if anything happened. Why take any more risks? We have all the money we'll ever need. Why don't we consider ourselves retired? What would we do, Jeff? He grinned. We'll think of something. Seriously, darling, how would we spend our lives? Doing anything we like, my love. We'll travel, indulge ourselves in hobbies. I've always been fascinated by archaeology. I'd like to go on a dig in Tunisia. I made a promise once to an old friend. We can finance our own digs. We'll travel all over the world. It sounds exciting. Then what do you say? She looked at him for a long moment. If that's what you want, Tracy said softly. He hugged her and began laughing. I wonder if we should send a formal announcement to the police. Tracy joined in his laughter. The churches were older than any Cooper had ever known before. Some dated back to the pagan days, and at times he was not certain whether he was praying to the devil or to God. He sat with bowed head in the ancient Begunico church and St. Bavolkirk and Peterskirk and the Nebelkirk at Delft, and each time his prayer was the same. Let me make her suffer as I suffer. The telephone call from Gunther Hartog came the next day while Jeff was out. How are you feeling? Gunther asked. I feel wonderful, Tracy assured him. Gunther had telephoned every day after he had heard what had happened to her. Tracy decided not to tell him the news about Jeff and herself. Not yet. She wanted to hug it to herself for a while, take it out and examine it, cherish it. Are you and Jeff getting along all right together? She smiled. We're getting along splendidly. Would you consider working together again? Now she had to tell him. Gunther... We're quitting. There was a momentary silence. I don't understand. Jeff and I are, as they used to say in the old James Cagney movies, going straight. What? But why? It was Jeff's idea, and I agreed to it. No more risks. Supposing I told you that the job I have in mind is worth two million dollars to you, and there are no risks. I laugh a lot, Gunther. I'm serious, my dear. You've traveled to Amsterdam, which is only an hour from where you are now, and you'll have to find someone else. He sighed. Hmm. I'm afraid there is no one else who could handle this. Will you at least discuss the possibility with Jeff? All right, but it won't do any good. I will call back this evening. When Jeff returned, Tracy reported the conversation. Didn't you tell him we'd become law-abiding citizens? Of course, darling. I told him to find someone else. But he doesn't want to, Jeff guessed. 
He insisted he needed us. He said there's no risk and that we could pick up two million dollars for a little bit of effort. Which means that whatever he has in mind must be guarded like Fort Knox. Or the Prado, Tracy said mischievously. Jeff grinned. That was really a neat plan, sweetheart. You know, I think that's when I started to fall in love with you. I think when you stole my Goya is when I began to hate you. Be fair, Jeff admonished. You started to hate me before that. True. What do we tell Gunther? You already told him. We're not in that line of work anymore. Shouldn't we at least find out what he's thinking? Tracy, we agreed that we're going to Amsterdam anyway, aren't we? Yeah, but... Well, while we're there, darling, why don't we just listen to what he has to say? Jeff studied her suspiciously. You want to do it, don't you? Certainly not. But it can't hurt to hear what he has to say. They drove to Amsterdam the following day and checked into the Amstel Hotel. Gunther Hotchock flew in from London to meet them. They managed to sit together as casual tourists on a Place motor launch cruising the Amstel River. I'm delighted that you two are getting married, Gunther said. My warmest congratulations. Thank you, Gunther. Tracy knew that he was sincere. I respect your wishes about retiring, but I have come across a situation so unique that I felt I had to call it to your attention. It could be a very rewarding swan song. We're listening, Tracy said. Gunther leaned forward and began talking, his voice low. When he had finished, he said, Two million dollars if you can pull it off. It's impossible, Jeff declared flatly. Tracy! But Tracy was not listening. She was busily figuring out how it could be done. Amsterdam's police headquarters at the corner of Manikstraat and Allenschat is a gracious old five-story brown brick building with a long white stucco corridor on the ground floor and a marble staircase leading to the upper floors. In a meeting room upstairs, the Hermente Polizie were in conference. There were six Dutch detectives in the room. The lone foreigner was Daniel Cooper. Inspector Joop van Duren was a giant of a man, larger than life, with a beefy face adorned by a flowing mustache and a roaring basso voice. He was addressing Tone Willems, the neat, crisp, efficient chief commissioner, head of the city's police force. Tracy Whitney arrived in Amsterdam this morning, chief commissioner. Interpol is certain she was responsible for the De Beers hijacking. Mr. Cooper here feels she has come to Holland to commit another felony. Chief Commissioner Willems turned to Cooper. Do you have any proof of this, Mr. Cooper? Daniel Cooper did not need proof. He knew Tracy Whitney, body and soul. Of course, she was here to carry out a crime, something outrageous, something beyond the scope of their tiny imaginations. He forced himself to remain calm. No proof. That's why she must be caught red-handed. And... Just how do you propose that we do that? By not letting the woman out of our sight. The use of the pronoun our disturbed the chief commissioner. He has spoken with Inspector Trignon in Paris about Cooper. He's obnoxious, but he knows what he's about. If we had listened to him, we would have caught the Whitney woman red-handed. It was the same phrase Cooper had just used. Tom Willems made his decision and it was based partly on the well-publicized failure of the French police to apprehend the hijackers of the De Beers diamonds. Where the French police had failed, the Dutch police would succeed. Very well, the chief commissioner said. If the lady has come to Holland to test the efficiency of our police force, we shall accommodate her. He turned to Inspector Van Doren. Take whatever measures you think necessary. The city of Amsterdam is divided into six police districts, with each district responsible for its own territory. On orders from Inspector Joop van Doren, the boundaries were ignored, and detectives from different districts were assigned to surveillance teams. I want her watched 24 hours a day. Don't let her out of your sight. Inspector van Doren turned to Daniel Cooper. Well, Mr. Cooper, are you satisfied? Not until we have her. We will, the inspector assured him. 
You see, Mr. Cooper, we pride ourselves on having the best police force in the world. Amsterdam is a tourist paradise, a city of windmills and dams, and row upon row of gabled houses leaning crazily against one another along a network of tree-lined canals filled with houseboats decorated by boxes of geraniums and plants and laundry flying in the breeze. The Dutch were the friendliest people Tracy had ever met. They all seem so happy, Tracy said. Remember, they're the original flower people, tulips. Tracy laughed and took Jeff's arm. She felt such joy in being with him. He's so wonderful. And Jeff was looking at her and thinking, I'm the luckiest fellow in the world. Tracy and Jeff did all the usual sightseeing things tourists do. They strolled along Albert Kuypstraat, the open-air market, that stretches block after block, and it's filled with stands of antiques, fruits and vegetables, flowers and clothing, and wandered through Dom Square, where young people gathered to listen to itinerant singers and punk bands. They visited Volendam, the old picturesque fishing village on the Zander Zee, and Madoradam, Holland in miniature. As they drove past the bustling Hepul Airport, Jeff said, Not long ago, all that land the airport stands on was the North Sea. Hepul means cemetery of ships. Tracy nestled closer to him. I'm impressed. It's nice to be in love with such a smart fellow. You ain't heard nothing yet. Twenty-five percent of the Netherlands is reclaimed land. The whole country is sixteen feet below sea level. Sounds scary. Not to worry. We're perfectly safe as long as that little kid keeps his finger in the dike. Everywhere Tracy and Jeff went, they were followed by the Gemente Polizzi, and each evening Daniel Cooper studied the written reports submitted to Inspector Van Doren. There was nothing unusual in them, but Cooper's suspicions were not allayed. She's up to something, he told himself. Something big. I wonder if she knows she's being followed. I wonder if she knows I'm going to destroy her. As far as the detectives could see, Tracy Whitney and Jeff Stevens were merely tourists. Inspector Von Duren said to Cooper, Isn't it possible you're wrong? They could be in Holland just to have a good time. No, Cooper said stubbornly. I'm not wrong. Stay with her. He had an ominous feeling that time was running out, that if Tracy Whitney did not make a move soon, the police surveillance would be called off again. That could not be allowed to happen. He joined the detectives who were keeping Tracy under observation. Tracy and Jeff had connecting rooms at the Amstel. For the sake of respectability, Jeff had told Tracy, but I won't let you get far from me. Promise? Each night Jeff stayed with her until early dawn, and they made love far into the night. He was a protean lover, by turns tender and considerate, wild and feral. It's the first time, Tracy whispered, that I've really known what my body was for. Thank you, my love. The pleasure's all mine. Only half. They roamed the city in an apparently aimless manner. They had lunch at the Excelsior in the Hotel de l'Europe, and dinner at the Bowerdry, and ate all twenty-two courses served at the Indonesian Bali. They had Eltensop, Holland's famous pea soup, sampled hutzpat, potatoes, carrots, and onions, and beurre and cool metwurst, made from thirteen vegetables and smoked sausage. They walked through the Walliches, the red-light district of Amsterdam, where fat kimono-clad whores sat on the street windows, displaying their ample wares. Each evening the written report submitted to Inspector Joop van Doren ended with the same note. Nothing suspicious. Patience, Daniel Cooper told himself. Patience. At the urging of Cooper, Inspector van Doren went to Chief Commissioner Willems to ask permission to place electronic eavesdropping devices in the hotel rooms of the two suspects, Permission was denied. When you have more substantial grounds for your suspicions, the chief commissioner said, come back to me. Until then, I cannot permit you to eavesdrop on people who are so far guilty only of touring Holland. That conversation had taken place on Friday. On Monday morning, Tracy and Jeff went to Polis Potterstraat in Koister, the diamond center of Amsterdam, to visit the Netherlands Diamond Cutting Factory. Daniel Cooper was a part of the surveillance team. The factory was crowded with tourists. An English-speaking guy conducted them around the factory, explaining each operation in the cutting process, and at the end of the tour, led the group to a large display room 
where showcases filled with a variety of diamonds for sale lined the walls. This, of course, was the ultimate reason visitors were given a tour of the factory. In the center of the room stood a glass case dramatically mounted on a tall black pedestal, and inside the case was the most exquisite diamond Tracy had ever seen. The guide announced proudly, And here, ladies and gentlemen, is a famous Lucullen diamond you have all read about. It was once purchased by a stage actor for his movie star wife and is valued at ten million dollars. It is a perfect stone, one of the finest diamonds in the world. That must be quite a target for jewel thieves, Jeff said aloud. Daniel Cooper moved forward so he could hear better. The guide smiled indulgently. Neh, Minir. He nodded toward the armed guard standing near the exhibit. This stone is more closely guarded than the jewels in the Tower of London. There is no danger. If anyone touches that glass case, an alarm rings. And on Middelik, and every window and door in this room is instantly sealed off. At night, electronic beams are on. And if someone enters the room, an alarm sounds at police headquarters. Jeff looked at Tracy and said, I guess no one's ever going to steal that diamond. Cooper exchanged a look with one of the detectives. That afternoon, Inspector Von Doren was given a report of the conversation. The following day, Tracy and Jeff visited the Rex Museum. At the entrance, Jeff purchased a directory plan of the museum, and he and Tracy passed through the main hall to the Gallery of Honor, filled with Fra Angelicos, Murios, Rubenses, Van Dykes, and T. Polos. They moved slowly, pausing in front of each painting, and then walked into the night watch room, where Rembrandt's most famous painting hung. There they stayed, and the attractive constable First Class Fien Hauer, who was following them, thought to herself, Oh, my God. The official title of the painting is the company of Captain Franz Bannenkoch and Lieutenant Willem van Rotenburg, and it portrays, with extraordinary clarity and composition, a group of soldiers preparing to go on their watch under the command of their colorfully uniformed captain. The area around the portrait was roped off with velvet cords, and a guard stood nearby. It's hard to believe, Jeff told Tracy, but Rembrandt caught hell for this painting. But why? It's fantastic. His patron, the captain in the painting, didn't like the attention Rembrandt paid to the other figures. Jeff turned to the guard. I hope this is well protected. Jamanir, anyone who tries to steal anything from this museum would have to get by electronic beams, security cameras, and, at night, two guards with patrol dogs. Jeff smiled easily. I guess this painting is going to stay here forever. Late that afternoon, the exchange was reported to Van Duren. The night watch, he exclaimed. Astublich, impossible. Daniel Cooper merely blinked at him with his wild, myopic eyes. At the Amsterdam Convention Center, there was a meeting of philatelists, and Tracy and Jeff were among the first to arrive. The hall was heavily guarded, for many of the stamps were priceless. Cooper and a Dutch detective watched as the two visitors wandered through the rare stamp collection. Tracy and Jeff paused in front of the British Guiana, an unattractive magenta, six-sided stamp. What an ugly stamp, Tracy observed. Don't knock it, darling. It's the only stamp of its kind in the world. What's it worth? One million dollars. The attendant nodded. That is correct, sir. Most people would have no idea just looking at it. But I see that you, sir, love these stamps as I do. The history of the world is in them. Tracy and Jeff moved on to the next case and looked at an inverted Jenny stamp that portrayed an airplane flying upside down. That's an interesting one, Tracy said. The attendant guard in the stamp case said, It's worth $75,000, Jeff remarked. Yes, sir, exactly. They moved on to a Hawaii missionary to St. Lou. That's worth a quarter of a million dollars, Jeff told Tracy. Cooper was following closely behind them now, mingling with the crowd. Jeff pointed to another stamp. Here's a rare one, the one pence Mauritius post office. Instead of post paid, some daydreaming engraver painted post office. It's worth a lot of pence today. They all seem so small and vulnerable, Tracy said, and so easy to walk away with. The guard at the counter smiled. A thief wouldn't get very far, miss. 
The cases are all electronically wired, and armed guards patrol the convention center day and night. That's a great relief, Jeff said earnestly. One can't be too careful these days, can one? That afternoon, Daniel Cooper and Inspector Joop van Duren called on Chief Commissioner Willems together. Van Duren placed the surveillance reports on the commissioner's desk and waited. There's nothing definite here, the chief commissioner finally said. But I'll admit that your suspects seem to be sniffing around some very lucrative targets. All right, Inspector, go ahead. You have official permission to place listening devices in their hotel rooms. Daniel Cooper was elated. There would be no more privacy for Tracy Whitney. From this point on, he would know everything she was thinking, saying, and doing. He thought about Tracy and Jeff together in bed, and remembered the feel of Tracy's underwear against his cheek. So soft, so sweet-smelling. That afternoon, he went to church. When Tracy and Jeff left the hotel for dinner that evening, a team of police technicians went to work, planting tiny wireless transmitters in Tracy's and Jeff's suites, concealing them behind pictures and lamps and under bedside tables. Inspector Yelp Von Duren had commandeered the suite on the floor directly above, and there a technician installed a radio receiver with an antenna and plugged in a recorder. It's voice activated, the technician explained. No one has to be here to monitor it. When someone speaks, it will automatically begin to record. But Daniel Cooper wanted to be there. He had to be there. It was God's will. Chapter 33 Early the following morning, Daniel Cooper, Inspector Jop van Doren, and his young assistant, Detective Constable Whitcamp, were in the upstairs suite listening to the conversation below. More coffee? Jeff's voice. No, thank you, darling. Tracy's voice. Try the cheese the room service sent up. It's really wonderful. A short silence. Mmm, delicious. What would you like to do today, Tracy? We could take a drive to Rotterdam. Why don't we just stay in and relax? Sounds good. Daniel Cooper knew what they meant by relax, and his mouth tightened. The Queen is dedicating a new home for orphans. Nice. I think the Dutch are the most hospitable, generous people in the world. They're iconoclasts. They hate rules and regulations. A laugh. <laughs> of course. That's why we both like them so much. Ordinary morning conversation between lovers. They're so free and easy with each other, Cooper thought. But how she would pay. Speaking of generous, Jeff's voice, guess who's staying at this hotel? The elusive Maximilian Pierpont. I missed him on the QE2. And I missed him on the Orient Express. He's probably here to rape another company. Now that we found him again, Tracy, we really should do something about him. I mean, as long as he's in the neighborhood... Tracy's laughter. I, I couldn't agree more, darling. I understand our friend is in the habit of carrying priceless artifacts with him. I have an idea that... Another voice, female. Dog Meneer, Dog Mavrao, would you care for your room to be made up now? Van Duren turned to Detective Constable Wickham. I want a surveillance team on Maximilian Pierpont. The moment Whitney or Stevens makes any kind of contact with him, I want to know it. Inspector Van Duren was reporting to Chief Commissioner Tom Willems. They could be after any number of targets, Chief Commissioner. They're showing a great deal of interest in a wealthy American here named Maximilian Pierpont. They attended the Philatelist Convention. They visited the Lucullen Diamond at the Netherlands Diamond Cutting Factory and spent two hours at the night watch. On die still van du not walk? Nay, impossible. The chief commissioner sat back in his chair and wondered whether he was recklessly wasting valuable time and manpower. There was too much speculation and not enough facts. So, at the moment, you have no idea what their target is. No, chief commissioner. I'm not certain they themselves have decided. But the moment they do, they will inform us. Willems frowned. Inform you? The bugs, Van Duren explained. They have no idea they are being bugged. 
The breakthrough for the police came at 9 a.m. the following morning. Tracy and Jeff were finishing breakfast in Tracy's suite. At the listening post upstairs were Daniel Cooper, Inspector Joop van Doren, and Detective Constable Wickcamp. They heard the sound of coffee being poured. Here's an interesting item, Tracy. Our friend was right. Listen to this. Amro Bank is shipping five million dollars in gold bullion to the Dutch West Indies. In the suite on the floor above, Detective Constable Wickcamp said, "There's no way." Shh. They listened. I wonder how much five million dollars in gold would weigh. Tracy's voice. I can tell you exactly, my darling. One thousand six hundred seventy-two pounds, about sixty-seven gold bars. The wonderful thing about gold is that it's so beautifully anonymous. You melt it down, and it could belong to anybody. Of course, it wouldn't be easy to get those bars out of Holland. Even if we could, how would we get hold of them in the first place? Just walk into the bank and pick them up? Something like that. You're joking. I never joke about that kind of money. Why don't we just stroll by the Amro Bank, Tracy, and have a little look? What do you have in mind? I'll tell you all about it on the way. There was a sound of a door closing, and the voices ended. Inspector Van Doren was fiercely twisting his mustache. Nay, there is no way they could get their hands on that gold. I myself approve those security arrangements. Daniel Cooper announced flatly. If there's a flaw in the bank's security system, Tracy Whitney will find it. It was all Inspector Van Doren could do to control his hair-triggered temper. The odd-looking American had been an abomination ever since his arrival. It was the God-given sense of superiority that was so difficult to tolerate. But Inspector Van Doren was a policeman first and last, and he had been ordered to cooperate with the weird little man. The inspector turned to Whitcamp. I want you to increase the surveillance unit immediately. I want every contact photographed and questioned. Clear? Yes, Inspector. And very discreetly, mind you, they must not know they are being watched. Yes, Inspector. Van Duren looked at Cooper. There. Does that make you feel better? Cooper did not bother to reply. During the next five days, Tracy and Jeff kept Inspector Van Doren's men busy, and Daniel Cooper carefully examined all the daily reports. At night, when the other detectives left the listening post, Cooper lingered. He listened for the sounds of love making that he knew was going on below. He could hear nothing, but in his mind, Tracy was moaning, "Oh yes, darling, yes, yes. Oh God, I can't stand it. It's so wonderful. Now, oh now." Then the long, shuddering sigh and the soft, velvety silence, and it was all for him. Soon you'll belong to me, Cooper thought. No one else will have you. During the day, Tracy and Jeff went their separate ways, and wherever they went, they were followed. Jeff visited a printing shop near Ladsplein, and two detectives watched from the street as he held an earnest conversation with the printer. When Jeff left, one of the detectives followed him. The other went into the shop and showed the printer his plastic-coated police identity card with the official stamp, photograph, and the diagonal red, white, and blue stripes. The man who just left here. What did he want? He's run out of business cards. He wants me to print some more for him. Let me see. The printer showed him a handwritten form. Amsterdam Security Services, Cornelius Wilson, Chief Investigator. The following day, Constable First Class Feenhauer waited outside a pet shop on Leidseplein as Tracy went in. When she emerged fifteen minutes later, Feenhauer entered the shop and showed her identification. The lady who just left. What did she want? She purchased a bowl of goldfish, two lovebirds, a canary, and a pigeon. A strange combination. A pigeon, you said? You mean an ordinary pigeon? Yes, but no pet store stocks them. I told her we would have to locate one for her. Where are you sending these pets? To her hotel, the Amstel. On the other side of town, Jeff was speaking to the vice president of the Amro Bank. They were closeted together for thirty minutes, and when Jeff left the bank, a detective went into the manager's office. The man who just walked out. 
Please tell me why he was here. Mr. Wilson, he's chief investigator for the security company our bank uses. They're revising the security system. Did he ask you to discuss the present security arrangements with him? Why, yes, as a matter of fact, he did. And you told him? Of course. But naturally, I first took the precaution of telephoning to make sure his credentials were in order. Whom did you telephone? The security service. The number was printed on his identification card. At three o'clock that afternoon, an armored card pulled up outside the Armoral Bank. From across the street, Jeff snapped the picture of the truck. While in a doorway a few yards away, a detective photographed Jeff. At police headquarters in Adensfrat, Inspector Van Duren was spreading out the rapidly accumulating evidence on the desk of Chief Commissioner Tone Willems. What does all this signify? the Chief Commissioner asked in his dry, thin voice. Daniel Cooper spoke. I'll tell you what she's planning. His voice was heavy with conviction. She's planning to hijack the gold shipment. They were all staring at him. Commissioner Willem said, And I suppose you know how she intends to accomplish this miracle. Yes. He knew something they did not know. He knew Tracy Whitney's heart and soul and mind. He had put himself inside her so that he could think like her, plan like her, and anticipate her every move. By using a fake security truck and getting to the bank before the real truck and driving off with the bullion. That sounds rather far-fetched, Mr. Cooper. Inspector Von Duren broke in. I don't know what their scheme is, but they are planning something, Chief Commissioner. We have their voices on tape. Daniel Cooper remembered the other sounds he had imagined, the night whispers, the cries and moans. She was behaving like a bitch in heat. Well, where he would put her, no man would ever touch her again. The inspector was saying, They learn the security routine of the bank. They know what time the armored truck makes its pickup, and the chief commissioner was studying the report in front of him. Lovebirds, a pigeon, goldfish, a canary. Do you think any of this nonsense has something to do with the robbery? No. Van Doren said. Yes, Cooper said. Constable First Class Fienhauer, dressed in an aqua polyester slack suit, trailed Tracy Whitney down Prinzenfracht, across the Mejia Brugge, and when Tracy reached the other side of the canal, Fienhauer looked on in frustration as Tracy stepped into a public telephone booth and spoke into the phone for five minutes. The constable would have been just as unenlightened if she could have heard the conversation. Gunther Hartog in London was saying, We can depend on Margot, but she'll need time, at least two more weeks. He listened a moment. I understand. When everything is ready, I will get in touch with you. Be careful. And give my regards to Jeff. Tracy replaced the receiver and stepped out of the booth. She gave a friendly nod to the woman in the aqua pantsuit who stood waiting to use the telephone. At 11 o'clock the following morning, a detective reported to Inspector Van Doren. I'm at the Walters Truck Rental Company, Inspector. Jeff Stevens has just rented a truck from them. What kind of truck? A service truck, Inspector. Get the dimensions. I'll hold on. A few minutes later, the detective was back on the phone. I have them. The truck is, Inspector Van Doren said, a step van. Twenty feet long, seven feet wide, six feet high, dual axles. There was an astonished pause. Yes, Inspector, how did you know? Never mind. What color is it? Blue. Who's following Stevens? Jacobs. Good. Report back here. Yope Van Doren replaced the receiver. He looked up at Daniel Cooper. You were right except that the van is blue. He'll take it to an auto paint shop. The paint shop was located in a garage on the Dom Rock. Two men sprayed the truck a gunmetal gray while Jeff stood by. On the roof of the garage, a detective shot photographs through the skylight. The pictures were on Inspector Von Doren's desk one hour later. He shoved them toward Daniel Cooper. 
It's being painted the identical color of the real security truck. We could pick them up now, you know. On what charges? Having some false business cards printed and painting a truck? The only way to make the charges stick is to catch them when they pick up the bullion. The little prick acts like he's running the department. What do you think he'll do next? Cooper was carefully studying the photograph. This truck won't take the weight of the gold. They'll have to reinforce the floorboards. It was a small, out-of-the-way garage on Mudistrat. Good morning, Menir. How may I serve you? I'm going to be carrying some scrap iron in this truck, Jeff explained. And I'm not sure the floorboards are strong enough to take the weight. I like them reinforced with metal braces. Can you do that? The mechanic walked over to the truck and examined it. Ja, no problem. Good. I can have it ready... Vredag, Friday. I was hoping to have it tomorrow. Morgen? Nay, ich. I'll pay you double. Donder dog, Thursday. Tomorrow, I'll pay you triple. The mechanic scratched his chin thoughtfully. What time tomorrow? Noon. Ja, okay. Dank Joel. Tunt und Dienst. Moments after Jeff left the garage, a detective was interrogating the mechanic. On the same morning, the team of surveillance experts assigned to Tracy followed her to the Uda Hanskanel, where she spent half an hour in conversation with the owner of a barge. When Tracy left, one of the detectives stepped aboard the barge. He identified himself to the owner, who was sipping a large Bison Jefiva, the potent red currant gin. What did the young lady want? She and her husband are going to take a tour of the canals. She rented my barge for a week. Beginning when? Friday. It's a beautiful vacation, Mihir. If you and your wife would be interested in... The detective was gone. The pigeon Tracy had ordered from the pet shop was delivered to her hotel in a birdcage. Daniel Cooper returned to the pet shop and questioned the owner. What kind of pigeon did you send her? Oh, you know, an ordinary pigeon. Are you sure it's not a homing pigeon? No, the man giggled. The reason I know it's not a homing pigeon is because I caught it last night in Vondelpark. A thousand pounds of gold in an ordinary pigeon. Why? Daniel Cooper wondered. Five days before the transfer of bullion from the Amro Bank was to take place, a large pile of photographs had accumulated on Inspector Job van Doren's desk. Each picture is a link in the chain that is going to trap her, Daniel Cooper thought. The Amsterdam police had no imagination, but Cooper had to give them credit for being thorough. Every step leading to the forthcoming crime was photographed and documented. There was no way Tracy Whitney could escape justice. Her punishment will be my redemption. On the day Jeff picked up the newly painted truck, he drove it to a small garage he had rented near the Uda Zedskuk, the oldest part of Amsterdam. Six empty wooden boxes stamped machinery were also delivered to the garage. A photograph of the boxes lay on Inspector Van Doren's desk as he listened to the latest tape. Jeff's voice. When you drive the truck from the bank to the barge, stay within the speed limit. I want to know exactly how long the trip takes. Here's a stopwatch. Aren't you coming with me, darling? No, I'm going to be busy. What about Monty? He'll arrive Thursday night. Who is this Monty? Inspector Van Doren asked. He's probably the man who's going to pose as a second security guard, Cooper said. They're going to need uniforms. The costume store was on Peter Komeli's Hofstadt in a shopping center. I need two uniforms for a costume party, Jeff explained to the clerk, similar to the one you have in the window. One hour later, Inspector Van Doren was looking at a photograph of a guard's uniform. He ordered two of these. He told the clerk he would pick them up Thursday. The size of the second uniform indicated that it was for a man much larger than Jeff Stevens. The inspector said, Our friend Monty would be about 6'3 and weigh around 220 pounds. We'll have Interpol put that through their computers. 
he assured Daniel Cooper, and we'll get an identification on him. In the private garage Jeff had rented, he was perched on top of the truck, and Tracy was in the driver's seat. Are you ready? Jeff called. Now! Tracy pressed a button on the dashboard, a large piece of canvas rolled down each side of the truck, spelling out Heineken Holland Beer. It works, Jeff cheered. Heineken Beer? Ach du blieft. Inspector Van Dorn looked around at the detectives gathered in his office. A series of blown-up photographs and memos were tacked all around the walls. Daniel Cooper sat in the back of the room, silent. As far as Cooper was concerned, this meeting was a waste of time. He had long since anticipated every move Tracy Whitney and her lover would make. They had walked into a trap, and the trap was closing in on them. While the detectives in the office were filled with a growing excitement, Cooper felt an odd sense of anticlimax. All the pieces have fallen into place, Inspector Van Doren was saying. The suspects know what time the real armor truck is due at the bank. They plan to arrive about half an hour earlier, posing as security guards. By the time the real truck arrives, they'll be gone. Van Doren pointed to the photograph of an armored car. They will drive away from the bank looking like this. But a block away on some side street, he indicated the Heineken beer truck photograph, the truck will suddenly look like this. A detective from the back of the room spoke up. Do you know how they plan to get the gold out of the country, Inspector? Van Duren pointed to a picture of Tracy stepping onto the barge. First by barge. Holland is so crisscross with canals and waterways that they could lose themselves indefinitely. He indicated an aerial photograph of the truck speeding along the edge of the canal. They've timed the run to see how long it takes to get from the bank to their barge. Plenty of time to load the gold onto the barge and be on their way before anyone suspects anything is wrong. Van Duren walked over to the last photograph on the wall and a large picture of a freighter. Two days ago, Jeff Stevens reserved cargo space on the Oresta, sailing from Rotterdam next week. The cargo was listed as machinery, destination Hong Kong. He turned to face the men in the room. Well, gentlemen, we're making a slight change in their plans. We're going to let them remove the gold bullion from the bank and load it onto the truck. He looked at Daniel Cooper and smiled. Red-handed. We're going to catch these clever people red-handed. A detective followed Tracy into the American Express office, where she picked up a medium-sized package. She returned immediately to her hotel. No way of knowing what was in the package, Inspector Von Doren told Cooper. We searched both their suites when they left, and there was nothing new in either of them. Interpol's computers were unable to furnish any information on the 220-pound Monty. At the Amstel late Thursday evening, Daniel Cooper, Inspector Von Doren, and Detective Constable Wickcamp were in the room above Tracy's, listening to the voices from below. Jeff's voice. If we get to the bank exactly 30 minutes before the gods are due, that will give us plenty of time to load the gold and move out. By the time the real truck arrives, we'll be stowing the gold onto the barge. Tracy's voice. I've had the mechanic check the truck and fill it with gas. It's ready. Detective Constable Wickcamp said, One must almost admire them. They don't leave a thing to chance. They all slip up sooner or later. Inspector Von Doren said curtly. Daniel Cooper was silent, listening. Tracy, when this is over, how would you like to go on that dig we talked about? Tunisia? It sounds like heaven, darling. Good. I'll arrange it. From now on, we'll do nothing but relax and enjoy life. Inspector Von Doren murmured. I'd say their next twenty years are pretty well taken care of. He rose and stretched. Well... I think we can go to bed. Everything is set for tomorrow morning, and we can all use a good night's sleep. Daniel Cooper was unable to sleep. He visualized Tracy being grabbed and manhandled by the police, and he could see the terror on her face. It excited him. He went into the bathroom and ran a very hot bath. He removed his glasses, took off his pajamas, and lay back in the steaming water. It was almost over, and she would pay.
as he had made other whores pay. By this time tomorrow, he would be on his way home. No, not home, Daniel Cooper corrected himself. To my apartment. Home was a warm, safe place where his mother loved him more than she loved anyone else in the world. You're my little man, she said. I don't know what I would do without you. Daniel's father disappeared when Danny was four years old, and at first he blamed himself, but his mother explained that it was because of another woman. He hated that other woman because she made his mother cry. He had never seen her, but he knew she was a whore because he had heard his mother call her that. Later, he was happy that the woman had taken his father away, for now he had his mother all to himself. The Minnesota winters were cold, and Daniel's mother allowed him to crawl into bed with her and snuggle under the warm blankets. I'm going to marry you one day, Daniel promised, and his mother laughed and stroked his hair. Daniel was always at the head of his class in school. He wanted his mother to be proud of him. What a brilliant little boy you have, Mrs. Cooper. I know. No one is as clever as my little man. When Daniel was seven years old, his mother started inviting their neighbor, a huge hairy man, over to their house for dinner, and Daniel became ill. He was in bed for a week with a dangerously high fever, and his mother promised she would never do that again. I don't need anyone in the world but you, Daniel. No one could have been as happy as Daniel. His mother was the most beautiful woman in the world. When she was out of the house, Daniel would go into her bedroom and open the drawers of her dresser. He would take out her lingerie and rub the soft material against his cheek. They smelled oh so wonderful. He lay back in the warm tub in the Amsterdam hotel, his eyes closed, remembering the terrible day of his mother's murder. It was on his twelfth birthday. He was sent home from school early because he had an earache. He pretended it was worse than it was because he wanted to be home where his mother could soothe him and put him into her bed and fuss over him. Daniel walked into the house and went to his mother's bedroom, and she was lying naked in their bed, but she was not alone. She was doing unspeakable things to the man who lived next door. Daniel watched as she began to kiss the matted chest and the bloated stomach, and her kisses trailed downward toward the huge red weapon between the man's legs. Before she took it into her mouth, Daniel heard his mother moan, Oh, I love you. And that was the most unspeakable thing of all. Daniel ran to his bathroom and vomited all over himself. He carefully undressed and cleaned himself up because his mother had taught him to be neat. His earache was really bad now. He heard voices from the hallway and listened. His mother was saying, You better go now, darling. I got to bathe and get dressed. Daniel will be home from school soon. I'm giving him a birthday party. I'll see you tomorrow, sweetheart. There was the noise of the front door closing, and then the sound of running water from his mother's bathroom. Except that she was no longer his mother. She was a whore, who did dirty things in bed with men, things she had never done with him. He walked into her bathroom, naked, and she was in the tub, her whore's face smiling. She turned her head and saw him, and said, Daniel, darling, what are you... He carried a pair of heavy dressmaker's shears in his hand. Daniel! Her mouth was opened into a pink-lined O, but there was no sound until he made the first stab into the breast of the stranger in the tub. He accompanied her screams with his own. Whore! 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 They sang a deadly duet together, until finally there was his voice alone. Whore! Whore! He was spattered all over with her blood. He stepped into her shower and scrubbed himself, until his skin felt raw. The man next door had killed his mother, and that man would have to pay. After that, everything seemed to happen with a supernal clarity, in a curious kind of slow motion. Daniel wiped the fingerprints off the shears with a washcloth and threw them into the bathtub. They clanked dully against the enamel. He dressed and telephoned the police. Two police cars arrived, with sirens screaming, and then another car filled with detectives, and they asked Daniel questions, and he told them how he had been sent home from school early and about seeing their next-door neighbor, Fred Zimmer, leaving through the side door. When they questioned the man, he admitted being the lover of Daniel's mother, but denied killing her. It was Daniel's testimony in court that convicted Zimmer. 
When you arrived home from school, you saw your neighbor, Fred Zimmer, running out the side door? Yes, sir. Could you see him clearly? Yes, sir. There was blood all over his hands. What did you do then, Daniel? I... I was so scared. I knew something awful had happened to my mother. Then did you go into the house? Yes, sir. And what happened? I called out, Mother! And she didn't answer. So I went into her bathroom and... At this point, the young boy broke into hysterical sobs and had to be led from the stand. Fred Zimmer was executed 13 months later. In the meantime, young Daniel had been sent to live with a distant relative in Texas, Aunt Maddie, whom he had never met. She was a stern woman, a hard-shelled Baptist, filled with a vehement righteousness and the conviction that hell's fire awaited all sinners. It was a house without love or joy or pity, and Daniel grew up in the atmosphere, terrified by the secret knowledge of his guilt and the damnation that awaited him. Shortly after his mother's murder, Daniel began to have trouble with his vision. The doctors called the problem psychosomatic. He's blocking out something he doesn't want to see, the doctors said. The lenses on his glasses grew thicker. At seventeen, Daniel ran away from Aunt Maddie and Texas forever. He hitchhiked to New York, where he was hired as a messenger boy by the International Insurance Protection Association. Within three years, he was promoted to an investigator. He became the best they had. He never demanded a raise in salary or better working conditions. He was oblivious to those things. He was the Lord's right arm, his scourge, punishing the wicked. Daniel Cooper rose from his bath and prepared for bed. Tomorrow, he thought. Tomorrow will be the whore's day of retribution. He wished his mother could be there to see it. Chapter 34 Amsterdam Friday, August 22nd, 8 a.m. Daniel Cooper and the two detectives, assigned to the listening post, heard Tracy and Jeff at breakfast. Sweet roll, Jeff? Coffee? No, thanks. Daniel Cooper thought, it's the last breakfast they'll ever have together. Do you know what I'm excited about? Our barge trip. This is the big day, and you're excited about a trip on a barge? Why? Because it will be just the two of us. Do you think I'm crazy? Absolutely. But you're my crazy. Kiss? The sound of a kiss. She should be more nervous, Cooper thought. I want her to be nervous. In a way, I'll be sorry to leave here, Jeff. Look at it this way, darling. We won't be any the poorer for the experience. Tracy's laughter. <laughs> You're right. At 9 a.m., the conversation was still going on, and Cooper thought, They should be getting ready. They should be making their last-minute plans. What about Monty? Where are they meeting him? Jeff was saying, Darling, would you take care of the concierge before you check us out? I'm going to be rather busy. Of course. He's been wonderful. Why don't they have concierges in the States? I guess it's just a European custom. Do you know how it started? No. In France, in 1627, King Hugh built a prison in Paris and put a nobleman in charge of it. He gave him the title of Comte de Cierge, or Concierge, meaning Count of the Candles. His pay was two pounds and the ashes from the king's fireplace. Later, anyone in charge of a prison or a castle became known as a concierge. And finally, this included those working in hotels. What the hell are they talking about, Cooper wondered. It's 9.30. Time for them to be leaving. Tracy's voice. Don't tell me where you learned that. You used to go with a beautiful concierge. A strange female voice. Good morning, Mavro Menere. Jeff's voice. There are no beautiful concierges. The female voice puzzled. Eek, big grape, het neat? Tracy's voice. I bet if there were, you'd find them. What the hell is going on down there? Cooper demanded. The detectives looked baffled. I don't know. The maid's on the phone calling the housekeeper. She came in to clean, but she says she doesn't understand. 
She hears voices, but she doesn't see anybody. What? Cooper was on his feet, racing toward the door, flying down the stairs. Moments later, he and the other detectives burst into Tracy's suite. Except for the confused maid, it was empty. On a coffee table in front of a couch, a tape recorder was playing. Jeff's voice. I think I'll change my mind about the coffee. Is it still hot? Tracy's voice. Uh-huh. Cooper and the detectives were staring in disbelief. I... I don't understand, one of the detectives stammered. Cooper snapped. What's the police emergency number? Twenty-two, twenty-two, twenty-two. Cooper hurried over to the phone and dialed. Jeff's voice on the tape recorder was saying, You know, I really think their coffee's better than ours. I wonder how they do it. Cooper screamed into the phone. This is Daniel Cooper. Get hold of Inspector Van Duren. Tell him Whitney and Stevens have disappeared. Have him check the garage and see if their truck is gone. I'm on my way to the bank. He slammed down the receiver. Tracy's voice was saying, Have you ever had coffee brewed with eggshells in it? It's really quite... Cooper was out the door. Inspector Van Duren said, It's all right. The truck has left their garage. They're on their way here. Van Duren, Cooper, and two detectives were at a police command post on the roof of a building across from the Amro Bank. The inspector said, They probably decided to move up their plans when they learned they were being bugged. But relax, my friend. Look. He pushed Cooper toward the wide-angle telescope on the roof. On the street below, a man dressed in janitor's clothes was meticulously polishing the brass nameplate of the bank. A street cleaner was sweeping the streets. A newspaper vendor stood on a corner. Three repairmen were at work. All were equipped with miniature walkie-talkies. Van Duren spoke into his walkie-talkie. Point A? The janitor said, I read you, Inspector. Point B? You're coming in, sir. This from the street cleaner. Point C. The news vendor looked up and nodded. Point D. The repairmen stopped their work, and one of them spoke into the walkie-talkie. Everything's ready here, sir. The inspector turned to Cooper. Don't worry. The gold is still safely in the bank. The only way they can get their hands on it is to come for it. The moment they enter the bank, both ends of the street will be barricaded. There's no way they can escape. He consulted his watch. The truck should be in sight any moment now. Inside the bank, the tension was growing. The employees had been briefed, and the guards ordered to help load the gold into the armored truck when it arrived. Everyone was to cooperate fully. The disguised detectives outside the bank kept working, surreptitiously watching the street for a sign of the truck. On the roof, Inspector Van Duren asked for the tenth time, Any sign of the damn truck yet? Nay. Detective Constable Whitcamp looked at his watch. They're thirteen goddamn minutes overdue. If they... The walkie-talkie crackled into life. Inspector, the truck just came into sight. It's crossing Rots and Grats, heading for the bank. You should be able to see it from the roof in a minute. The air was suddenly charged with electricity. Inspector Van Duren spoke rapidly into the walkie-talkie. Attention, all units. The fish are in the net. Let them swim in. A gray armored truck moved into the entrance of the bank and stopped. As Cooper and Van Duren watched, two men wearing the uniforms of security guards got out of the truck and walked into the bank. Where is she? Where's Tracy Whitney? Daniel Cooper spoke aloud. It doesn't matter, Inspector Van Duren assured him. She won't be far from the gold. And even if she is, Daniel Cooper thought, it's not important. The tapes are going to convict her. Nervous employees helped the two uniformed men load the gold bullion from the vault onto dollies and wheel them out to the armored truck. Cooper and Van Duren watched the distant figures from the roof across the street. The loading took eight minutes, when the back of the truck was locked, and the two men started to climb into the front seat. Inspector Van Duren yelled into his walkie-talkie, Flug! Pass up! All units close in! Close in! Pandemonium erupted. The janitor, the news vendor, the workers in overalls, and a swarm of other detectives raced to the armored truck and surrounded it, guns drawn. The street was cordoned off from all traffic in either direction. Inspector Von Duren turned to Daniel Cooper and grinned. 
Is this red-handed enough for you? Let's wrap it up. It's over, at last, Cooper thought. They hurried down to the street. The two uniformed men were facing the wall, hands raised, surrounded by a circle of armed detectives. Daniel Cooper and Inspector Van Duren pushed their way through. Van Duren said, You can turn around now. You're under arrest. The two men, ashen-faced, turned to face the group. Daniel Cooper and Inspector Van Duren stared at them in shock. They were total strangers. Who, who are you? Inspector Van Duren demanded. We were the guards for the, the security company. One of them stammered. Don't shoot, please don't shoot. Inspector Van Duren turned to Cooper. Their plan went wrong. His voice held a note of hysteria. They called it off. There was a green bile in the pit of Daniel Cooper's stomach, and it slowly began to rise up into his chest and throat, so that when he could finally speak, his voice was choked. No. Nothing went wrong. What are you talking about? They were never after the gold. This whole setup was a decoy. That's impossible. I mean the truck, the barge, the uniforms. We have photographs. Don't you understand? They knew it. They knew we were on to them all the time. Inspector Van Duren's face went white. Oh, my God. Zanzi, where are they? On Polis Paterstraat in Costa, Tracy and Jeff were approaching the Netherlands diamond cutting factory. Jeff wore a beard and mustache and had altered the shape of his cheeks and nose with foam sponges. He was dressed in a sport outfit and carried a rucksack. Tracy wore a black wig, a maternity dress and padding, heavy makeup, and dark sunglasses. She carried a large briefcase and a round package wrapped in brown paper. The two of them entered the reception room and joined a busload of tourists listening to a guide. And now, if you will follow me, ladies and gentlemen, you will see our diamond cutters at work and have an opportunity to purchase some of our fine diamonds. With the guide leading the way, the crowd entered the doors that led inside the factory. Tracy moved along with them, while Jeff lingered behind. When the others had gone, Jeff turned and hurried down a flight of stairs that led to a basement. He opened his rucksack and took out a pair of oil-stained coveralls and a small box of tools. He donned the coveralls, walked over to the fuse box, and looked at his watch. Upstairs, Tracy stayed with the group as it moved from room to room, while the guide showed them the various processes that went into making polished gems out of raw diamonds. From time to time, Tracy glanced at her watch. The tour was five minutes behind schedule. She wished the guide would move faster. At last, as the tour ended, they reached the display room. The guide walked over to the roped-off pedestal. In this glass case, he announced proudly, is a local and diamond, one of the most valuable diamonds in the world. It was once purchased by a famous stage actor for his movie star wife. It is valued at ten million dollars and is protected by the most modern... The lights went out. Instantly, an alarm sounded, and steel shutters slammed down in front of the windows and doors, sealing all the exits. Some of the tourists began to scream. Please, the guide shouted above the noise. There is no need for concern. It is a simple electrical failure. In a moment, the emergency generator will... The lights came on again. You see? The guide reassured them. There is nothing to worry about. A German tourist in Lederhosen pointed to the steel shutters. What are those? A safety precaution, the guide explained. He took out an odd-shaped key, inserted it in a slot in the wall, and turned it. The steel shutters over the doors and windows retracted. The telephone on the desk rang, and the guide picked it up. Hendrik here. Thank you, Captain. No, everything is fine. It was a false alarm. Probably an electrical short. I will have it checked out at once. Yes, sir. He replaced the receiver and turned to the group. My apologies, ladies and gentlemen. With something as valuable as a stone, one can't be too careful. Now, for those of you who would like to purchase some of our very fine diamonds, the lights went out again. The alarm bell rang, and the steel shutter slammed down once more. A woman in the crowd cried, Let's get out of here, Harry. Will you just shut up, Diane? 
her husband growled. In the basement downstairs, Jeff stood in front of the fuse box, listening to the cries of the tourists upstairs. He waited a few moments, then reconnected the switch. The lights upstairs flickered on. Ladies and gentlemen, the guide yelled over the uproar, it is just a technical difficulty. He took out the key again and inserted it into the wall slot. The steel shutters rose. The telephone rang. The guide hurried over and picked it up. Hendrick here. No, Captain. Yes, we will have it fixed as quickly as possible. Thank you. A door to the room opened and Jeff came in, carrying the tool case, his worker's cap pushed back on his head. He singled out the guide. What's the problem? Someone reported trouble with the electrical circuits. The lights keep flashing off and on, the guide explained. See if you can fix it quickly, please. He turned to the tourist, a forced smile on his lips. Why don't we step over here, where you can select some fine diamonds at very reasonable prices? The group of tourists began to move toward the showcases. Jeff, unobserved in the press of the crowd, slipped a small cylindrical object from his overalls, pulled the pin, and tossed the device behind the pedestal that held the Lucullan diamond. The contrivance began to emit smoke and sparks. Jeff called out to the guide. Hey, there's your problem. There's a short in the wire under the floor. A woman tourist screamed. Fire! Please, everybody, the guide yelled. No need to panic. Just stay calm. He turned to Jeff and hissed. Fix it. Fix it. No problem, Jeff said easily. He moved toward the velvet ropes around the pedestal. Nay, the guard called. You can't go near that. Jeff shrugged. Fine with me. You fix it. He turned to leave. Smoke was pouring out faster now. The people were beginning to panic again. Wait, the guide pleaded. Just a minute. He hurried over to the telephone and dialed a number. Captain, Hendrick here. I'll have to ask you to shut off all the alarms. We're having a little problem. Yes, sir. He looked over at Jeff. How long will you need them off? Five minutes, Jeff said. Five minutes, the guy repeated into the phone. Don't you well. He replaced the receiver. The alarms will be off in ten seconds. For God's sake, hurry. We never shut off the alarm. I've only got two hands, friend. Jeff waited ten seconds, then moved inside the ropes and walked up to the pedestal. Hendricks signaled to the armed guard, and the guard nodded and fixed his eyes on Jeff. Jeff was working in back of the pedestal. The frustrated guide turned to the group. Now, ladies and gentlemen, as I was saying, over here, we have a selection of fine diamonds at bargain prices. We accept credit cards, traveler checks, he gave a little chuckle, <laughs> and even cash. Tracy was standing in front of the counter. Do you buy diamonds? she asked in a loud voice. The guide stared at her. What? My husband is a prospector. He just returned from South Africa, and he wants me to sell these. As she spoke, she opened the briefcase she carried, but she was holding it upside down, and a torrent of flashing diamonds cascaded down and danced all over the floor. My diamonds, Tracy cried. Help me! There was one frozen moment of silence, and then all hell broke loose. The polite crowd began a mob. They scrambled for the diamonds on their hands and knees, knocking one another out of the way. I've got some. Grab a handful, John. Let go of that. It's mine. The guide and the guard were beyond speech. They were hurled aside in a sea of scrambling, greedy human beings, filling their pockets and purses with the diamonds. The guard screamed, Stand back! Stop that! and was knocked to the floor. A busload of Italian tourists entered, and when they saw what was happening, they joined in the frantic scramble. The guard tried to get to his feet to sound the alarm, but the human tide made it impossible. They were trampling over him. The world had suddenly gone mad. It was a nightmare that seemed to have no end. When the day's guard finally managed to stagger to his feet, he pushed his way through the bedlam, reached the pedestal, and stood there, staring in disbelief. The Lucullan diamond had disappeared. So had the pregnant lady and the electrician. Tracy removed her disguise in a stall in the public washroom in Osterpark, blocks away from the factory. 
Carrying the package wrapped in brown paper, she headed for a park bench. Everything was moving perfectly. She thought about the mob of people, scrambling for the worthless zircons, and laughed aloud. She saw Jeff approaching, wearing a dark gray suit. The beard and mustache had vanished. Tracy leapt to her feet. Jeff walked up to her and grinned. I love you, he said. He slipped the Lucullan diamond out of his jacket pocket and handed it to Tracy. Feed this to your friend, darling. See you later. Tracy watched him as he strolled away. Her eyes were shining. They belonged to each other. They would take separate planes and meet in Brazil, and after that, they would be together for the rest of their lives. Tracy looked around to make sure no one was observing, and she unwrapped the package she held. Inside was a small cage, holding a slate gray pigeon. When it had arrived at the American Express office three days earlier, Tracy had taken it to her suite and released the other pigeon out the window and watched it clumsily flutter away. Now, Tracy took a small chamois sack from her purse and placed a diamond in it. She removed the pigeon from its cage and held it while she carefully tied the sack to the bird's leg. Good girl, Margot. Take it home. A uniformed policeman appeared from nowhere. Hold it! What do you think you're doing? Tracy's heart skipped a beat. What's. what's the trouble, officer? His eyes were on the cage and he was angry. You know what the trouble is. It's one thing to feed these pigeons, but it's against the law to trap them and put them in cages. Now you just let it go before I place you under arrest. Tracy swallowed and took a deep breath. If you say so, officer. She lifted her arms and tossed the pigeon into the air. A lovely smile lit her face as she watched the pigeon soar higher and higher. It circled once, then headed in the direction of London, 230 miles to the west. A homing pigeon averaged 40 miles an hour. Gunther had told her, so Margo would reach him within six hours. Don't ever try that again, the officer warned Tracy. I won't. Tracy promised solemnly, never again. Late that afternoon, Tracy was at Hippol Airport, moving toward the gate from which she would board a plane bound for Brazil. Daniel Cooper stood off in a corner, watching her, his eyes bitter. Tracy Whitney had stolen the Lucullan diamond. Cooper had known it the moment he heard the report. It was her style, daring and imaginative. Yet there was nothing that could be done about it. Inspector Von Duren had shown photographs of Tracy and Jeff to the museum guard. Nay, never seen either of them. The thief had a beard and a mustache, and his cheeks and nose were much fatter, and the lady with the diamonds was dark-haired and pregnant. Nor was there any trace of the diamond. Jeff and Tracy's persons and baggage had been thoroughly searched. The diamond is still in Amsterdam, Inspector Van Duren swore to Cooper. We'll find it. No, you won't, Cooper thought angrily. She had switched the pigeons. The diamond had been carried out of the country by a homing pigeon. Cooper watched helplessly as Tracy Whitney made her way across the concourse. She was the first person who had ever defeated him. He would go to hell because of her. As Tracy reached the boarding gate, she hesitated a moment, then turned and looked straight into Cooper's eyes. She had been aware that he had been following her, all over Europe, like some kind of nemesis. There was something bizarre about him, frightening, and at the same time pathetic. Inexplicably, Tracy felt sorry for him. She gave him a small farewell wave, then turned and boarded her plane. Daniel Cooper touched the letter of resignation in his pocket. It was a luxurious Pan American 747, and Tracy was seated in seat 4B, on the aisle in first class. She was excited. In a few hours, she would be with Jeff. They would be married in Brazil. No more capers, Tracy thought. But I won't miss them. I know I won't. Life will be thrilling enough just being Mrs. Jeff Stevens. Excuse me. Tracy looked up. A puffy, dissipated-looking middle-aged man was standing over her. He indicated the window seat. That's my seat, honey. Tracy twisted aside so he could get past her. As her skirt slid up, he eyed her legs appreciatively. Great day for a flight, huh? 
There was a leer in his voice. Tracy turned away. She had no interest in getting into a conversation with a fellow passenger. She had too much to think about. A whole new life. They would settle down somewhere and be model citizens. The ultra-respectable Mr. and Mrs. Jeff Stevens. Her companion nudged her. Since we're gonna be seatmates on this flight, little lady, why don't you and I get acquainted? My name is Maximilian Pierpont. The End Copyright Phoenix Audio, 2005 Directed by Henrietta Tiefenthaler Produced by Michael Wiener